probably. Yeah, you should get used to it. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's the future. Yeah, right? that's yeah. Relax. Relax. Good morning and welcome, everybody, to AGI 21. Woo-hoo! Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, Ben Gertzel. It's my uh, pleasure and honor to welcome you to AGI 21, which is a mixed virtual face-to-face -face, uh, format. L last year, we did only virtual format due to the, the pandemic. It was face-to-face -face from 2006 through 19. Now this, the, this year, it's a interesting experiment in a, in a mixed format. So we've got a sort of a AGI 21 base camp here in, the, in Silicon Valley in, the, in Palo Alto and then, and then tomorrow in, the, in, in Mountain View, but the majority of speakers and participants are still uh, virtual in in various places. And we we actually didn't know until the last minute how the travel rules were going to unfold and who who was going to be able to to come. It, it, it turns out like the large Russian contingent wasn't able to get visas to to come here, so they're they're participating from from Russia. And uh, even the Canadians we thought were going to be able to come, but uh, Canada borders are only half open, so the internet is internet is great is great, and we're gonna we're gonna keep it going uh, by by any means necessary. Anyhow, I'm here in the, in Palo Alto, and today we're having three parallel workshops, where the following three days of the conference are are single stream, right? So today we have the the workshop on. Uh, Scalable architectures for neural symbolic AGI, then a workshop on the NARS non axiomatic reasoning system, and a, and a workshop on uh, interpretable natural language processing. So if you're if you're looking for one of the latter two workshops I mentioned, uh, you are watching the wrong place right 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 now because uh, <laughs> now I'm going to shift gears from introducing the AGI conference in in, in general to introducing the uh, workshop on scalable architectures for neural symbolic uh, AGI. And uh, I want to start by by saying that I think there's three, there are three key things we need to do to, to build AGI on, 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 on the technical level. I mean, there's, there's theory, there's scientific experimentation, and then there's the, the engineering the uh, the system building and in this in this workshop we have uh, i think all but one of the presenters are involved with the opencog agi project which I, which I've, I've been co-leading since 2008 eight or so and in particular Many of the talks are focused on on work we're doing toward the new version of OpenCog, OpenCog Hyperon. So after after a long time of doing experimentation and of various sorts and some practical utilization in, in various domains, with the OpenCog system we started building in two thousand eight, a number of us decided it was time just to sort of rethink and re-architect from the ground up based on some new mathematical theory we'd done and also based on leveraging new software and en engineering tools and systems and frameworks that are around now. So there's there is a theme of of building OpenCog Hyperon as a as a system in many of the talks of the, of this workshop. But I I also would like to have people thinking about the other two aspects, sort of what's the underlying math and cognitive theory behind behind what we're doing and you know what experiments are we or should we be running to understand our our agi ideas i mean of course in the end we need an actual software system to run our our agi programs and to and to 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 do things but the the particular software system probably isn't the key thing, right? I mean, the, the, re the really key thing is getting the theoretical ideas down right, and then the 
experimental learning that you've that you've done by playing with instantiations of, of your theoretical ideas. And if if you have the experiment in theory right, then uh, of course software engineering is is hard too. And I, I, I don't want to I don't want to discount it. But the the world is now good at doing doing software engineering, right? So we can. We can get the systems if we understand the the theory and have the experimental results. And and so what what we're gonna do in the workshop today on scalable architectures for neural symbolic AGI systems. I mean, we'll talk a bunch about stuff being done in an open cog context or in terms of building open cog hyperon, which is which is important to me. I mean, I would I would like to see open cog hyperon, you know, leveraging singularity net platform. I would I would I would I would like to see this be the way that we actually get to to AGI, just for for speed and, and simplicity's sake, if nothing else. But still, I, I think the most important thing is really the ideas that are being fleshed out and the you know experimental res results that, that that are being obtained. I mean, in, in the end, that's more important than the than the particular system. So that's. Uh, a bit of framing. Now, what what we're going to hear about today, we'll have Neil Geisweiler, who's been working with me in OpenCog for a long time, talking about some work on temporal reasoning in OpenCog, which borrows a lot of ideas from temporal reasoning stuff that Pei Wang has done with his group and group in the in the NARS system, but with a different uncertain uncertain logic and. Uh, yeah, no, no, we'll talk about that, which relates to some work he's doing with OpenCog, learning to control agents in the, in the Mi Minecraft world, actually. And then we'll have uh, Adam, Adam Vandervoort, who is not, not part of our OpenCog team, but has been doing closely allied AG, AGI work on his own. And he, he'll talk a bit about some uses he's found for Galois connections in, in deriving algorithms for reasoning and, and learning. And this uh, this is interesting to me for a bunch of reasons. And uh, one, one of which is I've been using some of the same math in the, in the OpenCog Hyperon context. And uh, after lunch, we'll have Alexei Potapov, who is leading the OpenCog Hyperon initiative. He will be talking about a new language called Meta, Meta Type Talk, which is a sort of gra gradual, Dependently typed language for uh, for scripting uh, structures in the OpenCog Hyperon atom space. So it's basically an AGI programming language intended for use by human programmers and 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 for use by AGI AGI programmers. And yeah, the the name Meta was reverse engineered as usual. Meta means loving kindness in, in Pali. There's, I mean, there's Meta Meta meditation, which many of us have been involved with. So we, we had M E T T A. Then the, since it was gradually typed, we figured Meta Meta type talk. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm uh, sitting in a room here with many people who have been been victim to my reverse engineered acronym, <laughs> acronyms before. <laughs> uh, we have. Uh, yeah, Moses meta optimizing semantic evolutionary search, which is OpenCog's pro programming language, which is an OpenCog's automated programming learning system. Um, the, the, the other option that you suggested was probabilistic object oriented programming, then. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that's right. So we are, um, we've got to. Uh, M M Moshe here, who was the, the namesake of the Moses meta optimistic semantic evolutionary search back in 1883 or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so then uh, after that, we'll have Matt Eclay and Andres Senna talking about how to use existing no SQL database technology to make a uh, large scale distributed atom space, which again, that's a specific system building thing, but there's more fundamental questions under underlying there. So you have a knowledge hypergraph or a knowledge knowledge metagraph, which is which is the case in Hyperon. And we don't have any existing tools that are specifically designed to allow you to create, maintain, and evolve a, a 
large scale distributed knowledge metagraph, let alone manage it in a decentralized way like we'd like in the singularity net context. So what we're looking at in this talk is like, how do you piece together usage of existing working large scale tools so as to do what we need in, in, in terms of uh, large scale knowledge metagraph usage so as to avoid having to build everything from scratch. And this is a hyperon thing, but the strategies are, are most likely useful beyond that context also. Then in the, in the final talk of the day, I'll talk a bit about what I've been referring to as the general theory of, of general intelligence and sort of how do we, how do we use some math related to Galois connections and various kinds of morphisms on, on metagraphs to boil down a variety of AGI algorithms into, into a common, uh, common core of mathematical operations, which hopefully then one can implement in, in an efficient way. And so this, this leads us to the core of the open cog hyperon design. If we, if we can take a variety of cognitive operations, so reason, reasoning operations, automatic programming learning operations, uh, some neural net related learning operations, if we can take these and we can represent them using a common set of of mathematical tools, which is what I'll talk about with Galois connections and, and chronomorphisms and so forth. If we can then make these abstract mathematical tools efficiently executable in, in our language, which such as the meta language Alexei will talk about, and, and if, if we can make them efficiently interoperate with a distributed metagraph knowledge store like Matt and uh, Andre will talk about, right? Then, then, then then we may have a route to actually actually get to to AGI, and this is a it's a different route than the route using uh, you know extensions of current deep neural net frameworks, which is is currently more more popular. It, but I think uh, my own view is is it's a more promising route. So what what I hope folks who survive the whole day of this workshop will. Uh, will get out of it is an understanding of why some of us think that a neural symbolic approach involving multiple different cognitive algorithms working together on a shared knowledge metagraph, why some of us think that sort of approach to AGI is promising and can actually lead to AGI, and then what are some of the theoretical, you know, experimental and, and engineering directions, some of us are, are embar embarking on now to, mo to move in that direction. And that's uh, obviously, this is very deep stuff. And one day we're just gonna be dipping into a, to a whole bunch of, of inter interconnected uh, areas, but uh, there's, Every every talk is basically grounded in a bunch of other online materials that that folks can look into. And I'm, I'm also hoping we can get some interesting conversations going on in in, in between the talks, which is uh, going to be largely via online participants, since there's many more than we, we have. Maybe a dozen people sitting in this room with me here in in in, in Palo Alto. So. Yeah, with that, with that uh, overly lengthy and rambling introduction, let me uh, turn it over to Dr. Neil Geisweiler to talk about uh, temporal reasoning. Hello, everybody. Um, so, <clears throat> hello, everybody. Uh, let, let me share my screen here. Um, Turn this microphone on. So ju just to check, it, um, do you hear me? Yes, you guys we hear, hear me? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Right, so yeah, I'm gonna, uh, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about temporal and procedural reasoning. Um, so I have a I have a small presentation. 
-hmm. And uh, after that, uh, myself and uh, uh, Hedra, uh, we, we will uh, demo uh, some of the things that I have uh, presented. So, <clears throat> okay, so, Okay, so why do we need temporal reasoning? Well, we all know that we live in a temporal universe and uh, there are typically lags between cause and effect. And when we want to operate in the world, we, we need to, to understand these lags. We need to understand this temporal aspect of causality. And uh, it's also true when we, <clears throat> when, he, when we need to think about uh, our own thinking. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, we, we can't afford to get trapped in, a, in an infinite uh, thinking loop. Uh, at some point, we have to, to realize, uh, well, wait, I, I have to stop thinking now. I have to, to act. And I'm, 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 hearing some, I'm hearing some background noise. I, 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 guess it's, uh, I guess it's normal. OK, it has gone away. Um, <clears throat> Well, yeah, so, <clears throat> so it's all too easy to get trapped in a thinking loop. And um, at some point, you need to say, wait, I, I have to stop thinking now. I, I can't think forever. I have to act. Um, but in order to think that you don't have time to think anymore, well, you need to be able to think about time. So another reason why temporal reasoning is so important. All right. So... <clears throat> Uh, I'm, I'm going to get to the heart of it. So let me first give a, uh, a short recall of what is a PLN, which stands for Probabilistic Logic Network. So at the, really the, the, the primitive object we have are uh, predicates. Um, they are kind of the regular predicates that you have in predicate logic. They can possibly be fuzzy, but for now, just for simplicity, I'm going to assume that they are uh, Boolean. And with that, we have a construct such as uh, and uh, PQ that uh, is going to correspond to essentially the probability of the intersection of P and Q, where the probability is represented by the truth value. Um, <clears throat> The truth value is essentially a second order probability, but we don't need to get into that uh, uh, for this presentation. So let's just assume that it's, it's, it's an approximation of a probability. Um, okay, we have the, the other usual uh, connector. So we have a not P, which is gonna be correspond to the, the probability of the complement of P. And we have the implication of P and Q, which is gonna be, which is going to correspond to the conditional probability of Q knowing P. And we have others, but these are the most important. Um, so with that, we have uh, inference rules. We have two types of inference rules uh, in PLN, and that's very important. There is the direct type that allows to uh, basically build relationships given observations. So here the observations are, for instance, the premises, these evaluations, multiple evaluations over P and Q. And given that, given these observations, we have a rule, which is here is called implication direct introduction, that is going to allow us to introduce this implication. So this, uh, as I said, conditional probability and and the formula for such a for such a rule is well is pretty trivial i mean this is the the usual one we know um, and so that's for the direct inference rules but we also have we also have indirect inference rules so this indirect inference rule allow to infer new relationships given other relationships that probably have been previously inferred via observation. 
or maybe they, they're just there because we assume them. So here's, for instance, an example, the deduction rule where uh, given that P implies Q and Q implies R to some degrees, we can infer that P implies R. Um, and the formula is also, I mean, it's, it's basically probability theory, uh, uh, no, no, nothing strange there. Because okay, so there are a bunch more rules, but really, well, these two are probably the most important one. Um, and it's enough for what I'm gonna present uh, uh, after that. So I'm gonna move on to temporal reasoning. So, okay, so we say that um, we have predicates. So to do temporal reasoning, we need temporal predicates. So what are temporal predicates? They are just predicates, but with an extra argument, which is gonna be time. So here's, for instance, a representation of, say, two predicates, P and Q, and whether they are true or false over time. And once we have that, we can introduce uh, some additional connectors to manipulate, to transform these predicates. So an important one is gonna be uh, a lag, a lag operator that's gonna take a temporal predicate and, and it's gonna shift it. So for instance, the lag connector is basically shifting the past to the present. So it brings the past into the present. And we have the reverse, which is the lead connector, which brings the future into the present. So for example, if P here in red is represented by uh, this stepwise function, applying the lag operator over P is gonna shift it, is gonna uh, move it from the left to the right, that is from the past into the present. So here the lag would be of a temporal unit of one. And for the lead connector, well, this is the other way around. It shifts from the right to the left. That is, it brings the future into the present. All right, so given that we can define <clears throat> some temporalized connectors, so for instance, we have the sequential end. Well, actually we can define two versions. It would be uh, the back sequential end where we, we basically take P, and shift it, shift its path to its to the present, or uh, pretty much equivalently, uh, the four sequential end, where instead of shifting P, we shift Q. Um, that is, we move its future into the present. And and the, what it's going to do is that what this is going to say basically, um, well. If this is true, to the extent that this is true, if an event uh, that, well, basically um, makes P true at a certain point, then with a certain, uh, after T uh, time units, then Q is gonna be true. I mean, well, both are gonna be uh, the event that makes PQ uh, is gonna precede an event that makes Q true. So this, this is not an implication, but this is a conjunction, but a temporal conjunction. Well, the, the two are equivalent, but, but 
whether we are using a back sequential end or a four sequential end is basically the same in terms of, of reasoning. Well, it's, a, it's not absolutely the same and that's why we make a difference. It's just to, to not be too confused in terms of uh, how we have to define the rules, et cetera, but, but essentially it's just a sequential end. Okay, we have, we can do the same for implication. So instead of having a, a, just a regular implication, we have a predictive implication. And here again, we, um, we have two versions, the back predictive implication or the four predictive implication. And it's the same idea, we just, uh, we, sh we temporally shift one or the other in order to uh, create this uh, temporal causality or temporal implication. So meaning that what this one is gonna say, what the predictive indication between P and Q is gonna say is that if P is true at some time, then at this time plus T, then Q is likely to be true. All right, and uh, well, we, we, we can, well, it's, it's just, to, this slide is just showing that this is in fact, the four predictive implication is equivalent to the implication of P and the sequential end of PQ. All right. Okay. So for example, if we have the implication between P and Q, where P and Q are temporal predicates uh, with this behavior, which uh, is shown uh, in red and blue. Well, <clears throat> if we just consider a mere implication, they are not gonna be, uh, well, the truth value is gonna be rather low because if we look at the instances, which is gonna be here entirely time, it's a, it's a temporal predicate, which is exclusively temporal. Well, here P is Q, but uh, uh, P is true, but uh, Q is not true. Uh, here P is true um, and well, Q happens to be true. Now, if we look at the next time where P is Q, P, P, P is true. Uh, well, Q is not true, et cetera. And we're, we're gonna have a fairly small truth value, a fairly small probability of P in place Q. But if we shift Q, if we bring the future of Q into the present, then the probability is gonna go up. So it goes from 0 0.25 to 0 0.75. And this is in fact the predictive implication between P and Q, well here with a uh, time unit of one. Okay. All right, so, so now the question is, well, <clears throat> we know how to do a temporal deduction. So the question is, how can we do now temporal deduction? Well, for that, uh, let me just introduce a few notations. So, um, okay, as we already know, we have the implication. So the implication of P and Q is gonna be P uh, right arrow Q. We're gonna note the predictive implication as P, which is this uh, uh, zigzagging arrow, um, which is called leads to in, in LaTeX, that's why I, I chose it, with a, a little superscript T for the lag. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna represent the operation of the lag over a predicate P by this um, 
over right arrow because while it, it moves, as I say, the past into the present, which is typically, well, the left to the right. And we have the other notation where the lead of PT, which brings the future into the present is represented by the over left arrow with TS superscript. All right, so, so as I said, we already know how to do a regular deduction, but how do we do temporal deduction? Well, given these notations and associated inference rules, um, we can actually map temporal deduction into regular deduction. So that's the complete inference tree that represents that mapping. Um, so before I decide whether I want to go into depth into that, let, let, let me have a look at the time just to make a decision. Okay, we, we have time. All right. So let me, let me just detail some of it. All right, so we start here. So, so basically, let, let, let me start by um, emphasizing what are the premises and what is the conclusion? So the conclusion is that P predictively implies R with some lag, which is T1 plus T2. And the premises are, well, uh, we just need to look at the leaves of the inference tree. So we have one here, which is that P predictively implies Q with some lag T1 and Q predictively implies R with some lag T2. And then, well, because we are dealing with probabilities, we actually do need to have the probabilities of P, Q, and R. All right, so that's for the premises. So how do, con how do we connect these premises to the conclusion? Well, we can see that in the middle of the inference tree, we have the deduction rule. So we are really using regular deduction, but to do that, we have to first infer backward, transform backward from the predictive implication to the corresponding implication which is gonna be P implies, well, the lead of R with the temporal uh, uh, lag of T1 plus T2. All right, so now we have an implication, so we can deal with this implication with regular deduction, and that's what we do. And in order, in order to do that, well, we, we just need to have a P implies, well, this, this Q, which has been temporally shifted, and uh, then this temporally shifted Q implies this temporally shifted R. And then once we have done that, well, we, we, we just uh, translate back into predictive implications, um, temporally shifting if we have to, et cetera. So it's, it's actually fairly simple. All right, so, so once we have that, once we are able to do, so why, why, well, why do we want to do temporal deduction? So actually there's, there's something very useful that it brings because when we are doing procedural reasoning, that is, we are trying to put together a program or a plan or behavior tree to, um, control some behavior to reach some goal or sub some goal or sub some sub goal. Um, <clears throat> temporal deduction is gonna allow us to basically take two action plans and stick them together. And stick them together in a way that could be fairly original because basically 
by the power of deduction, we don't even need to have ever observed these, uh, this action plan, this new action plan. It could be a sequence of actions that we have never observed, but it's okay because thanks to deduction, thanks to temporal deduction, we're gonna be able to just put them together and calculate an estimate of the probability of success of such a plan. So it's absolutely crucial uh, in terms of procedural reasoning. So to go from temporal deduction to procedural reasoning, we do need to introduce a couple more notations. So, well, we have the sequential n, which I already mentioned, but it's gonna be easier to represent that in a more compact form. So this means P precedes Q with some like T. And uh, <clears throat> we given an action A, we want to turn this action A into a predicate that is gonna tell whether at some point in time, we execute such action, or we have executed, or we will execute such action, all right? So given that, well, then we can build plans. So here we have a mono action plan, so that tells in context C, if I execute A, then after T, I'll reach goal G with some probability that is unspecified. We can have B action plan, so action plans with two actions. Oh, because, whoop, 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 whoop. Okay, here we are. <clears throat> Which says, well, if I start with context C and I execute action A1, and after some time I execute action A2, then after some more time, I'll reach the goal with some probability. And of course, we can have plans with any number of actions, such as, for instance, well, if I'm inside and I want to go outside, I have to walk to the door. And after some time, once I'll be at the door, I can open the door and step out and I'll be outside. All right, and so, <clears throat> how are we gonna do procedural reasoning? How are we gonna use temporal deduction or procedural reasoning? So here's an example. Okay, let's, let's start with the conclusions and the premises. So the conclusion is, in some context P, if I do A, and after a little bit I do B, then I should reach R, okay? And the premises are, well, I know that if I'm in context P and I do A, after a little bit I'll reach Q. And I also know that if I'm in Q and I do action B, after a little while, I'll reach R. And so, well, intuitively, it, it feels right that we can put all that together and we can, and we can prove that this B action plan is gonna be correct with some probability that this inference tree is gonna help us to estimate, right? So this is, I'm probably not gonna detail that one. It's, as you can feel, it's, whoa. As you can feel, it's fairly, uh, it, it looks fairly close to, to this one. Well, the only difference is that we have to introduce these actions and uh, well, it, uh, it does require some more 
inferences, um, but it's, it is not conceptually very different. Okay, so we have it. Um, so with that, for instance, we can, we can do these sort of inferences. So given the two action plans that if we're inside and we walk to the door and we open the door, we're gonna be on the doorstep in a door which is open. And with the second action plan that if we're on a doorstep with an open door and we step out when we're gonna find ourselves outside and we can bring these two action plans together, we can plug these, these action sequences together and we, we get a third plan, a more complex plan. And again, we get an estimate of the probability of success of such a plan without ever having needed to observe these sequence of three actions here. So that's very powerful. All right, so, so we, we're, we're coming to the end of, of my little presentation. So um, what, what do we have left uh, in terms of temporal reasoning to work on? Well, of course we need more rules. I mean, uh, such as temporal abduction, temporal induction. We have many more, uh, but they are not very much more difficult than temporal deduction. Um, that's not really where the difficulty lies. Um, the next thing that is, um, that's gonna be harder and that's extremely important is to be able to deal with distributional time. Um, so we're gonna start with uh, temporal intervals. So for instance, well, we want to, to be able to reason about the fact that some action is going to lead to some to some consequence given some time interval that we were not certain about, and uh, and certainly what we'll want to do is to to move the temporal aspect directly to the truth value, and that way we can express uh, things in a more uh, well where the temporal aspect has been abstracted away. It, it's been moved to the, to the truth value, but what it allows is, is really to, to just um, put as much temporal knowledge as we want in, the, in this truth value, in this temporal truth value, we, without uh, uh, making the um, declarative representation completely bloated due to the temporal aspect. And, and in fact, I mean, the thing is, you often don't need to 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 have a um, a precise um, description of the temporal aspect for a given predictive implication because um, uh, you usually care about the the, the entire uh, temporal distribution of of response of, of such a of such a causality relationship. So. Um, and, and you can just reintroduce the temporal aspect when you have hard deadlines. So, well, okay, I need to be outside within the next 10 seconds. Okay, then if you need that, then you can, you can really put these 10 seconds into the, uh, the declarative representation of say your, your query or perhaps your backward, your, your backward channel query or something like that. Um, so, there is this and there is another important aspect that we need to work on is to replace or to expand uh, action plan, sequence of action plans um, into uh, more complex action plans, which uh, well, uh, such as a behavior tree. So the reason it's so important to do that is because when an agent is making decisions, in order to trigger the beginning of the plan, it needs to know that the plan is gonna work. And so in order to know that the plan is gonna work, you need to cover as, as much ground as possible. 
to know that well okay i can i can start doing my action because i i, I know i have a in case something goes wrong i have a backup plan so so that's behavior trees and well anything that uh, uh can uh, can represent conditionals etc well this is very convenient for that reason because so here's an example so we're inside we we walk to the door but what if the door is locked? Well, okay, we can smash the door. We have a way out. So this little conditional might be uh, allowing us to have here in the predictive implication a much higher probability than in this plan, for instance. And so in this case, it means that the agent is going to say, if it only has this plan, it's going to say, oh, but Okay, I can start walking to the door, but then um, I'm actually not very likely to succeed. But with this plan, well, we're confident we're going to succeed, and so we're going to we're going to take the first step, the first action of walking to the door, because we know we're going to succeed. All right, and and, and there is one last point, um, which uh, actually I added that because because of the title of this workshop. Uh, having to do with uh, uh, neurosymbolic and so on. Something that we probably need to think about is how to deal with um, truth value which depend on other parameters. And I think that would be very convenient to uh, have predictive implications that are dealing with, for instance, continuous values such as, okay, well, what if we're trying to learn the laws of gravity? Okay, but uh, I'm not gonna give much detail about this because it hasn't been, uh, it, 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 we're, we're, we're just at the, at the stage of thinking about it, but not really much more than that. So, all right, so um, I am done with my presentation. Uh, I hope I can take some questions. I, I don't know how feasible that's going to be, um, but um, yeah, if, if anybody has any question, um, uh, that would be that would be possible right now. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll see if it's possible right now. So uh, we're, we're trying to solve some echo problems here in the in the room in Palo Alto. Do you want me to move on to the various uh, demonstrations? Yeah, I'll just move on to the demonstration. We can do questions after, that's fine. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna let uh, Hedra um, uh, Take it from there. Um, so uh, um, let me stop sharing my screen. Sure. Um, all right. Hi, everyone. I would be demonstrating. Hey, good uh, morning. Good morning, Hedra. <laughs> good morning, everyone. <laughs> it's afternoon here, <laughs> almost. So I would be demonstrating what um, we have, uh, I mean, as a role to, the, to discuss a few um, roles that we have to demonstrate the temporal deduction. So I hope you guys see my screen. Okay, so 
We have the, a couple. The, the fonts look very small. Oh, okay. I can hear you. Um, we can. Is it very small still? I don't know where to add. Okay. Neil, do you happen to know how to add the fonts on? Uh, no, I, I do not know. <laughs> okay. If you try control plus, perhaps. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it, it works. <laughs> I thought it won't. So it will be much bigger now. So, okay. Um, we have a couple of uh, rules regards to temporal reasoning, and I will be demonstrating a few of them. And the first one, maybe I, I can go over the rule first. Um, the, as, my, as Neil describes every rule, I mean, we start with um, the temporal deduction, which is uh, specifically specialized for the cog scheme or for the cognitive schema, which we have, uh, I mean, right now we are using it for the ROCA or it's an open cog agent example that we have. So for that, we have a special tool. And uh, maybe to demonstrate a few of them, um, the, the temporal deduction or the path predictive implication scope link deduction rule will, will have um, uh, the following that you see here. So let's say we have two predictive implication scope links with um, the predictive, uh, I mean, the temporal predicate as well as an action here. Uh, we can have um, a, a deduction role which can give us uh, a mono action plan which can be deducted from two um, consecutive action, I mean, uh, predictive implication scope links. And I mean, similar to this one, we do have a couple more, like for example, in order to apply a regular deduction rule, we first um, change uh, the back predictive implication scope link into implication, I mean, predictive implication link. If you see, uh, I'm using the look variant, the look back variant, which is uh, one of um, the type of predictive implication scope link that we have, which the back and the four that uh, Neil describes. So we do have uh, a rule to convert the back predictive implication scope link into um, predictive implication link as well. And we also have um, a rule which converts the uh, predictive implication link into implication. So I will demonstrate a few of them here. Um, let's, let me open the scheme guide, which we are using um, for atom space and open code related stuff. So um, maybe, for example, I can test a few more rules here. Um, let's say, for example, we can load the modules required first. And we do have open code, the rule engine, which is a URE and the PLN module, which ha has the rules, and the space time, which is for the temporal um, knowledge or to represent the time. So once we load our uh, modules, then 
we can have a few more, I mean, background knowledge or knowledge base, as we say. So let's, let, let me load this. Let's say we have a predictive implication scope link with a scope X, variable X, and there is two temporal predicates here, which are the contexts in the Nils presentation. So we have also another um, temporal predicate here, Q, uh, combined with an action A, then which gives R, R which is, um, then once we have this two, uh, based on the temporal deduction rule that we see, we need to have, we need to come up with um, a deduction result, which results uh, this temporal predicate to be um, conjuncted to conjunction with uh, the action given to give us R. So I, I can demonstrate that first. So once I load this um, uh, knowledge base to the atom space, I can load uh, the rule which uh, does the temporal uh, the temporal deduction. So the back predictive implication scope deduction rule will be loaded uh, using PL and load rule. We can load um, rules either, I mean, in, in many ways. PL and load rule will just add the preloaded rules into the atom space, or we can even load the rule file by the name, by the direct path it has to the atom space. Both ways will be fine. So once I load, um, the rule, which is a bug predictive implication scope rule, I will define my target because I'm running the backward chainer here. So my target will be um, give me anything which will lead to R or which is my goal right now. So right now I only have Q, Q and A, which implies R, right? But after the deduction, I would see that P and A are, are also um, implying R. So my target will be defined here. And when I run the backward chainer with a target, my maximum iteration number and any other uh, parameters, then I will get the result. So when I see the result, I can see that um, Q and A implies R which is the initial um, knowledge that I have. And due to the back predictive implication scope deduction rule, I can see that P con in conjunction with uh, A can also give me R. So this is the result of the uh, deduction rule that I, I just applied. Um, in uh, another way, let's say for example, we can, have, we can also have um, temporal reduction without action, which is uh, by using the converter rule, which converts the back predictive implication scope link into back predictive implication link, and then from back predictive implication link into implication link. And then once we have the implication link, we can we can we can apply the deduction rule or the regular deduction rule. What's different here is actually um, when we change the back predictive implication link into implication. We have implication links, but the implication link either have a lag or a lead to the predictive, I mean, to the temporal predicate. So we, we were required to add a, a few more extra rules. The first one is a shift introduction rule, which, which does um, a lag temporal predicate shift introduction or a, a lead temporal predicate shift introduction rule, which does, I mean, whenever there is a predicate, predicate node or a lambda link and a lag, then we can create a lag link for this um, or, we, or we can introduce a lag or we can introduce a lead for any predicate so that we can know that the, we can drag the, the bug or the past of the predicate either or we can, uh, drag the future to the present. So we can have this. Once we introduce this, we can involute um, the implication links. 
when with the involution rule, what we what we meant is actually if we say p implies q here, and we can say that the lead of lag of p with the same l, which is a lag, will give me will give us the same thing. But when we do this, we can also we are also telling the uh, backward channel or the backward channel can have uh, an inference capability to say that p implies q and this thing here implies q. So this thing and p are actually similar. It's like my negative negative of negative would give us the original something like that. So once we have this involution, we will be able to apply um, uh, the regular deduction rule over the implication links that we generated through um, this couple of rules that I just showed you. So we are we have actually a couple more examples I can show if the time permits. So I, I can show just one. I can load um, the back predictive implication scope link to a predictive implication converter rule and I can I can run a forward channel where where I, I don't define a target in forward channel. I just give this an empty set link and it will run available rules and come up with an answer for my request. So the result for this will be um, a back predictive implication scope link, which will be just I what I applied is actually um, a converter or just which translates a back predictive implication scope link into predictive implication link. So for each of the back predictive implication scope link that I have in, a, in my atom space, I will get their corresponding uh, back predictive implication links uh, along with their uh, truth value, which is similar to what uh, I have under the back predictive implication scope link. So with that, I mean, we can do all of the uh, rules we can apply there. We can apply them here, but that's the introduction. And if the time permits, maybe we can demonstrate that um, with the demo we have inside the rock. Neil, I can, I mean, we can continue with the demo. Oh, yeah, 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 thank you, Hedra. Um, yeah, so um, I guess I should ask if there are any questions so far before moving on. All right, so, so I see the, um, you have the ability to do rule, to, to apply rules, and you have your uh, uh, links that the rules are applied to. But what is the mechanism that actually uh, decides to select one rule or the other? Um, do you have any kind of overarching architecture or agent that allows that to happen? Okay, so that's an excellent question. Um, whoop, there's a lot of echo. Okay, it looks like it's gone. Right, so so basically, so we we have a uh, an engine that is called the uh, universal rule engine, and while well, it's just a rewriting system, and you 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 give it rules and. Uh, given a, an atom space, a, a graph knowledge space, it, it can uh, generate new knowledge and so on. Um, so we, we have basically two, two modes, <clears throat> two operating modes. There is a, the forward chaining mo operating mode where uh, you take some premises and you're going to generate conclusions. And we have the backward chaining operating mode where we take conclusions and we go backward to try to connect 
the dots between the conclusion and the premises that are in the atom space. And if we have to generate intermediary premises, we do so. So the, the, the engine itself is, 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 is not, it's nothing special. I mean, it, it, it's based on, uh, it uses uh, unification um, at, its, uh, at its core. And, but so to, to, to address the question you were asking, how do we select the rules? So rules can be uh, initially weighted so that's one way to, to tell the engine how to select. But beyond that, we actually have a, a, a system that can learn control rules, inference control rules, that can select rules, not just based on their weight, but on the current context. So these rules might say, okay, well, Say the current conclusion has a certain property, then select this rule, select this inference rule with a higher probability than you would have taken by default. Now, as the inference tree is progressing, you're going to change the context. And so there is a dynamic aspect to it. So if you if you then stumble on on some premises that is that has some property that is inside an inference tree that has some other properties that you can specify all these in these control rules. So that is in principle extremely powerful. In practice it has some limitations and we're basically uh we, 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 we are, well, we are doing research. We, we, are, uh, we, are, we are learning, we are experimenting about this. So, so it has limitations, but, but that is the idea. The idea of course is that uh, we can then apply the entire system, including reasoning itself to generate this inference rule. So these inference rules, they are, uh, they are knowledge. So they are knowledge about about inferences, about how the system reasons, but they are just knowledge like anything else. And so we can we can learn these rules by uh, pattern mining, for instance. We can learn them by more sophisticated form of reasoning, etc. I mean, anything that the system can do, it can do to the benefits of learning these control rules. Any other question? Yeah, so just to elaborate on your, on your previous yes, answer, uh, do you use temporal logic representations to learn the new rules? Like saying, you know, if I you know, kind of use this rule and maybe, you know, this rule will be useful in the future and so forth. In other words, does that question make sense to you? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, because the... Uh, uh, it's a little bit saturated, and it was difficult for me to to understand. I think I think he's he's basically asking uh, about using temporal reasoning for adaptive inference control. Like, can you use temporal reasoning to do reasoning about? So, using this sort of logical rule on this sort of premise in this context followed by using this sort of logical rule with this premise in this context will imply a high odds of being able to achieve this conclusion and so forth. Absolutely. So, so, so the, the, the answer is absolutely yes. That's not what we're doing at the moment. We have a more atemporal form of reasoning about inference control rules, but in the future, when we want to take into account uh, the, the resources, and more uh, finally, that's definitely something that we want to do. Yeah, I mean, the, <laughs> this uh, is something Neil and I had worked on, mostly Neil, but we, we Neil and I had talked about it, and, and, and Neil had worked on sort of immediately before he plunged into this work on. Temporal reasoning that we're doing uh, 
PLN reasoning experiments in OpenCog and then saving the PLN inference histories. And in that context, she was doing fairly simple forms of hypergraph pattern mining to find which which patterns in an inference history, where the inference history is stored as knowledge in OpenCog Adam space, which patterns in the inference history are useful for, for achieving conclusions in, in which context. So Neil was looking at simple examples of doing that using pattern mining on the saved inference histories. And that, that, that uh, gives you something. But when you do pattern mining on inference histories, you come up with a lot of spurious stuff as well as as well as useful stuff. And you're not you're not telling correlation from causation very effectively when you're doing that pattern mining. So pattern mining, I think, will continue to be useful. But the the patterns found by doing pattern mining over saved inference histories will then need to be fed into some temporal and causal reasoning that, that, that figures out which combinations of choices of inference rules and premises actually are, are causal for getting good conclusions in, in what context. I think part of what motivated this work is, well, that clearly needs to be done, but it's very complicated. So let, let's try to get temporal reasoning to work at doing much simpler stuff, right? So let, let's get temporal reasoning to work for moving moving little dudes around to, to grab objects in, in a world and not get clobbered. And if, if we can get temporal reasoning to do those things, like without cheating, j just based on, on the you know, re reward and, and, and experiential learning, then, then certainly there are more interesting things to do than controlling little guys in, in Minecraft for, for temporal reasoning and temporal reasoning for inference meta learning is, is certainly one of them. Right? I mean, we, I mean, we have the infrastructure set up for that, but there's just basically, if you store all these inference histories and try to do temporal reasoning on that, using the current open cog system, it will take forever. And uh, it just, uh, it's, it's operationally not viable. So that's that's part of what is leading us to build OpenCog Hyperon, which is a new and presumably far more scalable implementation of, of the OpenCog concepts, right? So part of what we need to do to make temporal reasoning for adaptive inference control learning work is just have a more efficient infrastructure, right? But then of course, refining the temporal reasoning itself on simpler examples that are feasible with the current with the current infrastructure is also a also a useful thing to do so at, at the moment Neil and Hedra have been working on temporal reasoning on simpler stuff which can actually be run in the current OpenCog system whereas other members of, of our team like uh, Alexei Potapov who we'll, we'll hear from later today is working on sort of re redesigning the whole system for among other things for massively greater scale, which will be needed to apply temporal reasoning for adaptive inference control. I mean, does that agree with your thinking, Neil? Yeah, <clears throat> well, there, there's one aspect which um, we haven't mentioned at all, which is attention allocation, <clears throat> which is, which can be seen as, um, perhaps uh, an intermediary between uh, full-on inference control and, uh, and nothing at all. Because, well, I mean, I, I, I actually feel that attention allocation um, in a way is more fundamental than that. It, it's still, it's, it's always useful everywhere. Um, and at, at every uh, stage of the, processing uh, of the cognitive system. Um, <clears throat> but, but the thing that uh, we haven't uh, introduced yet in our experimental temporal reasoning is, is uh, like I said, attention allocation, which, which would already be a way to, um, for instance, uh, discard, uh, for instance, many temporal rules which are 
potentially uh, not useful, um, uh, that is not even load them into memory, not even uh, try to combine them to produce, for instance, uh, uh, new plans or, or things like that. So, so uh, or for instance, well, okay, if, if I'm in a room, maybe I don't need to uh, bring all my knowledge about, uh, uh, I don't know, nature and mountains and uh, I'm in the room and I, I can focus on the knowledge that I know about things in the room. Uh, so all this can be achieved with attention allocation. And, and I think we can, we can go a very long way with this component um, before we, we need to, to go uh, um, into a full-on meta-reasoning and so on. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, the other, either, the other thing yeah, yeah, that please. may be worth touching on while we're talking about interoperation of temporal reasoning with other aspects of an open cog type AI design is how, how temporal reasoning intersects and synergizes with other types of temporal procedure learning. So, I mean, you can do you can do deep reinforcement learning, which can learn some procedures based on reward. We, we can also do procedure learning using evolutionary program learning. And Neil, you've been involved with the Adam Space Moses, which take, takes our uh, sort of evolutionary probabilistic programming learning framework, Moses, and sort of ports it from its, its earlier standalone implementation in, into a, into an implementation where all the representation is in, inside Adam space. Now, one of the things the Adam space Moses can be used for is learning procedures to, uh, to achieve goals. And I know uh, some members of uh, Alexei Polipov's OpenCog team in St. Petersburg are now working in some deep reinforcement learning for learning procedures in, in Minecraft. So it, it's worth it's worth noting how these different methods of procedure learning can sort of interoperate with each other. I, I think. Right. Right. Yeah. So 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 depending on on the uh, basically on the assumptions on the constraints of uh, the thing you're trying to uh, um, the solution you're trying to find and and say for instance the uh, the kind of feedback you can get, then, then obviously some more evolutionary learning can be can be more more efficient than than say some deeper, um, uh, more abstract sort of thinking where well you you just take a bunch of plans and you you just try them in your simulator. So that again, these assumptions need to be there. You need to have some simulator that is going to be able to tell you rapidly whether your plan will fail or not, or give you a good estimate of that. And then indeed you can, you can use MOSES or other form of evolutionary programming. Uh, and uh, in fact, well, perhaps uh, um, find solutions more efficiently. So that, that, that ties back to the notion of uh, cognitive synergy that, uh, well, then you have uh, introduced a long time ago. Yeah, I think yeah. I think it ties in with the notion of uh, interpretability of learned procedures, also, right? Because if if Moses or some automatic program learning method learns a program for achieving some some goal in some context depending on the representation language <clears throat> used <clears throat> within that program, it may be more or less tractable sort of for uh, temporal reasoning to understand why that program was good at, at doing what it did and then generalize it or adapt it to different contexts. And so in like right, right now, if you're going to, let, let's say you, uh, you're training an AI agent to play Minecraft and use a deep neural net 
to tell an agent how to build a bridge or something like that. Right now, the neural nets that can learn how to build a bridge do not have a very interpretable internal structure. So you could use you could use a neural module for building a bridge as a sort of canned module or procedure in 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 inside inside something temporal reasoning or, or Moses is, is is doing, but it's it's just a, an opaque module, right? Whereas if right now if Adam space Moses by programming learning, program learning learned how to build a bridge from one point to another. If the internal language is not too perverse, then the reasoning engine can understand what was going on in, inside that program and could then could then generalize it and adapt it. Right. And of course, in principle, you could make your neural net interpretable so that it was possible for a reasoning engine to understand why it was doing what it was doing and to to use that interpretation to help see new neural nets to learn other other related things. And I mean you could also make your program learned by Moses non-interpretable by by using very low level level primitives and just having a very tangled up, up program that, that you couldn't couldn't reason about. But yeah I, I think one one of the one of the design motivations for the meta language that Alexei will talk about this this afternoon is to give a framework in which this sort of interoperation is natural and tractable, right? So if you're doing Moses type programming learning on meta programs, then we would like it to be tractable to then do reasoning about why these Moses programs were able to do what they're able to do so that you could then generalize to other other contexts and potentially if you're using an external neural net library to do some temporal learning but the problems are posed to the external neural net library by say a reasoning or evolutionary learning engine in a way that it understands the semantics of what the neural net library is doing, that then possibly there's some synergy that can occur there also, even though you know the intricate details of the neural weights and connections may still be opaque, opaque to the to the reasoning engine. So yeah, I think I think that the goal in my mind is not to do all the temporal reasoning we need to do using a probabilistic logic engine, but some of it, and it is an interesting open question, which aspects of like real world temporal reasoning end up done by the temporal logic component versus done by a programming learning or, or, or neural net component, right? Like, I mean, we're, we're building a framework where you can brew all these together and they can try to solve problems collaboratively and which which aspects of which problems, which technique is better at? I guess we could speculate and know something about, but don't have an incredibly clear sense of it. Or maybe maybe Nil does. Right? Well, yeah, actually, uh, my Minecraft uh, example is uh, very interesting uh, for this, and uh, <laughs> we have an uh, interesting uh, uh, concrete express. Uh, experience uh, with uh, what you are talking uh, now but uh, we are not ready uh, to show it yet uh, so uh, it's uh, the work in progress uh, and we will not talk about it uh, today but uh, yeah it's uh, really an interesting question to on what uh, level of granularity we need uh, to use uh, neural networks and uh, on what level we start to reason uh, symbolically but yeah hopefully we will uh, have uh, some interesting results to show in a few months or half a year yeah so this this talk is a sort of a snapshot of some work in progress and within our singularity net open cog agi research group we have a couple different thrusts working on pure sort of experience and reinforcement based learning in, in Minecraft, 
world and we we didn't get it together fast enough to have WYSI Minecraft demos to show at this conference, which would, would, have been, would have been cool, but we're not too far off from it. So Neil and Hedra are working on symbolic probabilistic temporal reasoning for making agents learn to do stuff in, in Minecraft. Alexa and, and some folks on his team in St. Petersburg have been experimenting both with deep reinforcement learning for learning to do things in Minecraft and, and then looking at how how do you put the deep reinforcement learning together with some simple symbolic symbolic reasoning there. And so we're we're using that as a playground for a bunch of things. But but yeah, one of them is just understanding, you know, which which subtasks of learning to do useful things in in, in Minecraft, well in, in whatever sense you can do useful things in Minecraft. Which which subtasks are effectively done by deep reinforcement learning which ones is deep reinforcement learning terrible at and symbolic reasoning is is, is good at, which which there's, pl there's plenty of. I mean, and how do you put them together? I mean, to oversimplify greatly, one thing we realized a long time ago is if, if you have a sort of multi-step plan where the reward, like the goal, is kind of far off from the first action, it's a challenge to get deep reinforcement learning to sort of propagate all all the way back to learn this this overall plan. I mean, there are cases in which you could, but as a broad overgeneralization, that's often problematic. Whereas temporal reasoning is it's differentially relatively good at doing kinds of learning where you have you, your ultimate goal is far off and you have multiple steps to multiple steps to to get there. I mean, the reinforcement learning is quite good at parameter tuning though. Like if you're doing something where the end goal is fairly near, but there's a lot of different possible actions to to to, to sort through, it's it's relatively good at good at that. So then one simple thing you could do is say, well, when we have a fairly near-term goal, then and we know what it is, let's try to do deep reinforcement and you do that and use that give a, a use a, a neural module that's learned by deep reinforcement learning, just have it used as an atomic module that temporal reasoning pieces together to achieve a longer term goal. And you can do that, but that but that's not the whole story, right? And when 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 that modularization isn't good enough is where things get interesting, which is some of the some of the things we are we're using the Minecraft world to experiment with and as Alexei said there on the time scale of some small integer number of months we should have some pretty interesting interesting uh, conclusions there now the experimentation is fairly preliminary right? yeah good summarization but uh, maybe we should uh, move forward with uh, uh, Nielsen and uh, Hedra's uh, uh, talk perhaps yeah, yeah. So in terms of timing, um, I think we are almost to the end, am I right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, I mean, I, I, I could demo something, but it's, uh, it's very preliminary. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not gonna blow your mind. Uh, well, it's doing some, interesting things, but they are not visually uh, impressive. So, so I, I, I feel I can skip that Might part. Well give it a shot. Um, it can, it can uh, our minds are blown up. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so I, am I correct that we are one minute away from the official end of uh, this section of the workshop? Well, we started uh, a little bit uh, later, so yeah, maybe five to ten yeah, we, minutes. We, ago. we start. We started a little late, and there, there's lunch after Adam's talk, so we're not in a huge time. Crisis. All right. So what I could do is, uh, um, I kind of wonder. I mean, we have we have one. We have two demos. One with a two D environment one with a 3D environment with Minecraft. None of these two demos are, well, even though the system is doing impressive stuff, 
they don't look impressive because uh, uh well things well first they they it, it's not noticeable as you see the demo that the agent is actually learning something but it's only visible when you look at the log and you realize, well, it's able to collect more diamonds and things like that. But um, I wonder, given uh, the few minutes, uh, um, <clears throat> Hedra, do you want to show the, the Minecraft uh, a demo, even if uh, it's probably not going to uh, lead to... So so the, the problem we're having with the Minecraft demo at the moment is that there is a uh, the agent has a, a limited number of of life and, of, or energy, and it, it tends to die even before uh, any learning is taking place. But um, well, at least so we can show. Okay. Some. Um, so you I'm can see me, right? You... Um, yes. Okay. I can, I can look and maybe we can go over the look as well. Yeah, so basically, there's a there are uh, diamonds lined up, and the agent uh, has to collect as many diamonds as possible. And and basically, the the only thing that the agent can learn at this stage is just to to uh, um, to to move left or right before uh, before the diamond appears to well collect the diamond rather than missing the diamond, and and that. That can be learned, and uh, and if the agent uh, well survives for long enough, it's gonna it's gonna be able to learn it. Um, the the way learning is taking place at the moment is purely using pattern miner. Um, well, we have a pattern miner that is just a mining um, a, a subgraphs. In the in the knowledge base, and uh, uh, by mining that, it's going to notice that there are some relationship between um, the, the the presence of the agent and um, <clears throat> where the the diamond could be. And so, uh, first, it's going to learn that well, when it's uh, in front of a diamond, it's going to uh, make the necessary actions to uh, to collect the diamond. That's the first thing, and and then the second action is it, going to learn to to move to get in front of the diamond uh, while it can. Um, and actually, even though my talk was about uh, temporal deduction, there's no temporal deduction taking place. Everything is done with pattern mining. And what we're trying to do is to uh, apply temporal deduction so that the agent doesn't have to learn um, a doesn't have to observe a sequence of action that leads to a goal in order to build a plan that do uh, that does lead to a goal. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's that's where we're at. So right now the agent is not moving probably because it's thinking, uh, and uh, guys, it's probably going to think for for a long while especially in the mm -hmm. Minecraft environment because uh, it's overloaded with, uh, uh, with observations more, more so than in the 2D environment. So I don't think the agent is going to be able to uh, move again uh, from that point on. 
but um, uh, well, it will, but uh, n not not within the time limitation of of, uh, of this presentation. Um, and uh, if we were to examine the the log file, we would say that uh, the agent is uh, actually able to learn cognitive schematics, meaning uh, a predictive implication uh, from uh, linking context, action, and goal, or sub-goal, um, via pattern mining. Um, yeah. Um, And yeah, I, I think that's about all what we can show for for today. Uh, maybe we have a couple more minutes for questions. And um, and otherwise, we're done. There was a question from chat asking if there's a, a paper to refer to on temporal reasoning. Not yet. Uh, this is fairly new work, um, but yeah, coming soon. Yeah, I, I'd say at, at a higher level, if you're not familiar with the whole approach that we're taking to temporal reasoning here, apart from the details of what Neil is doing, we had a book like 10 years ago called Real World Reasoning, which goes over how to do temporal causal reasoning and the various other things in the, in using probabilistic logic networks and open cause existed back then. That was like 2011 book or something. Now there, there's been certainly many improvements and, and uh, learnings since, since that point in time, but as a, as a starting point for what sort of temporal reasoning we're, we're trying to do, that that's probably useful. That, that, that wasn't Minecraft stuff, but that, that, the examples there are sort of classic uh, common sense reasoning of temporal reasoning in human everyday life and, and, and so forth. And the names of the link types have evolved since since then, but there, there's still a lot of commonality. But I don't know if we've published any papers on it since that point, we've been too busy doing actual work. Thank you. I had one question. Is it possible to ask? Yep. Okay, so um, from what I understand, the temporal uh, reasoning system generates, it generates rules or it generates inferences at this point, or both? It inferences. generates inferences. Okay. The rules, so, the, the, so, yeah, so please go on, yeah. Uh, so if it generates inferences, um, is it possible to have the, have uh, some other contextual or activation rule created at the same time so that we know that this body of, of um, knowledge leads to this inference and the inference is newly created, but when you're running the system, can you have some sort of activation rule where if this body of knowledge is active, then the inference is also active. And that way you don't have to re-infer anything at the time, but you can just simply treat the new knowledge as activated and in, in right. context now. Right, so, so I mean, the, unless the knowledge that has been inferred is forgotten, it can be reused. Uh, it's it's going to be stored in the graph knowledge base, and it can be re-accessed uh, fairly easily, fairly rapidly. However, the problem is still uh, dealing with the abundance of information that has been accumulated. And so, for that, I mean, you you, you I, I think you are somewhat referring to actually a form of attention allocation where while well, this thing is 
active in the sense that we know we have to get so it's going to be useful in the immediate future. And so we we don't we don't have that yet. We do have code ready to go in uh, open cog repository implementation, but but it it hasn't been integrated yet. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Maybe we should uh, move to Adam's uh, talk because uh, it's kind of 10 minutes uh, delay was and uh, it's time. Yep, Any sounds good. All right. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Adam, are you ready? Uh, we cannot hear you, although I see your mic is uh, on. Still can't hear you. So yeah, our next uh, next speaker in the workshop is uh, Adam Vandervorst, who has uh, been a, an active participant in the AGI discussion forums that we've been having every couple weeks. And if if uh, folks are interested in that, you can look in the OpenCog hyper on the wiki page. In OpenCog wiki, there, there's there's a link regarding these every. Every two or three weeks, we've been doing a, a video chat a, AGI discussion forum with some some OpenCog Singularity Net stuff and other other related stuff from the community. Adam gave a presentation there on uh, some stuff related to using graphs and hypergraphs uh, and uh, folding operations on them and so forth for AGI. And the, this uh, this presentation today is sort of a a follow-on looking at, at ways to use Galois connections to to do what Adam calls information programming, which is a quite interesting sort of building bridges between some of the math used in functional programming world and and AGI AGI learning and, and reasoning. And I will I will touch on uh, different but related uses of Galois connections in in uh, in my talk at the at the end of the day so yeah hopefully hopefully adam has uh sorted out his microphone no adam can you say something yeah hi can you hear me all right awesome um so i will be talking about uh information programming and uh like ben mentions this is um closely related uh to to the work that has been happening in um, the functional programming world. It is uh, a new paradigm and it aims to be a solid basis to build um, strong AI systems on. Um, this is done by, by focusing really on uh, robustness and combining uh, different sources of information, um, different uh, ways of processing, right? I will share my screen. And that should be up now. Yes. All right. Um, so uh, if you want to uh, follow along with the deck, you can go to Adam V dot be slash ip in all capital letters uh, and uh, the deck will be under as well as uh, the article all right um so um what, what, what can it do for us? Um, it can 
uh, natively solve uh, different problems like recognition um, from some pattern, um, recognizing what, what it is, abstracting it uh, to a higher level. Um, it can do uh, completion, which means that if you have a whole bunch of data and you're searching for um, a, a missing piece of knowledge, for example, this could be a deduction on a knowledge graph, um, then it can do that. It can check if something holds, if you have a whole bunch of rules and some data that should conform to those rules, you can uh, use information programming to check that. And it can do calculation, which means uh, in this context that it can uh, calculate, for example, the digits of pi or improve a bunch of feature vectors or something that's uh, not changing form. Um, yeah, so um, we will go to, through a few of these examples. Um, and um, the first one uh, of recognition at the, at the top, you see uh, something that uh, represents the time series. Uh, where the gray lines or the brown lines between them can be uh, partial differences. And then um, that's translated to uh, a more abstract layer. And then you can do something like uh, setwise uh, reasoning, like it, it, uh, let's say there are certain items are mutual, mutually exclusive, then that, that can be encoded in a higher layer. layer. Uh, the completion um, means that uh, if you have some missing items, that you can fill those in. The checking takes the data and um, sees if the if this conforms to uh, the rules. Um, and you can do a calculation, which means that the the um, the value will increase along some axis. And this is the general theme in information programming. Increasing information, that's what all uh, these four uh, techniques have in common. Um, and that's what uh, I will uh, try to um, explain today. So um, it has a bunch of pretty um, peculiar or special characteristics. Um, one, it comes with a lot more guarantees than you may uh, have come accustomed to. Um, for being a programming paradigm, it, it is very strict, like um, like functional programming, that it can have no side effects or something, but in a in a completely different way. Uh, and it will also allow you to say something about runtimes, about convergence, etc. Uh, all built in in the basic uh, fabric of uh, the technique. And it is um, multimodal by nature. Um, one of the connections, the orange connections on screen, those uh, translate between different uh, types of data. And it is versatile with the um, with, with the view that uh, a lot of different programming languages could could host uh, information programming, um, you could combine different techniques, and uh, ideally, this would uh, at some at some point uh, be a a core component in multiple uh, programs communicating with each other, and uh, the information programming paradigm being able to merge uh, these, these different sources of information. Uh, and it is scalable. Um, the guarantees will, uh, will allow some, um, some a good amount of parallelization and some uh, permutation invariance that's uh, missing from uh, a lot of the systems today. Uh, Adam, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. could you please uh, slightly, slightly reduce your mi microphone sensitivity in 
zoom because it's a little bit uh, off scale. All right. Is this better? Uh, yes, great, thanks. All right. Um, so this reduces down to that um, the, the, the features are made possible by the law abiding uh, nature of the framework. Um, what, what, what will the laws be? Um, these come in different forms, uh, be information algebras, lattices, and Galois connections. Um, the first one I will not talk about today, although very interesting. Um, and we will focus on, on understanding the role of uh, the second two concepts. So how does it work? There are uh, four different components um, indicated in, in those colors for the rest of the presentation. Uh, types, cells, deductions, exchanges. And uh, the first two can be interpreted as normal types and values. And the second two can be interpreted as um, functions and uh, conversions respectively, but over a lot of richer types um, and with, with more specific, uh, with specific properties and uh, functions. In the example on the right, um, this is actually one of the functioning examples. Um, we have a string, uh, what is the force? given in newtons, given that the mass is so many kilograms and the deceleration uh, is this amount of uh, meters per second squared. Um, and we will ignore uh, the, the parsing phase at the moment as it, that would uh, be a little more complex. Um, although it, it, it is implemented in IP, it's uh, not well suited for the example. Um, and we get back uh, a bunch of parse results. And these parse results can be, um, for this example, probability distributions that um, certain concepts, unit pairs appear, appear in uh, the parse. And then these uh, probabilities get uh, disambiguated by the orange lines um, into actual masses, decelerations, forces. The, uh, your standard law like opposite deceleration is the opposite of acceleration. And the second law uh, allows you to calculate the force given the mass and the acceleration will uh, allow you to, to actually calculate with these uh, abiding to a, a, a different um, type here with, with different values. And then finally, it's this type uh, can be interpreted into the results. Note that I've only drawn the, uh, the deductions and exchanges used here. There are, are a lot more um, in, the, in the actual uh, example. So the execution goes um, a bit like a, um, a, a model you're building, like an execution graph. Uh, you first uh, specify what, what the different variables and functions between them are. But then quite uniquely, you can choose your uh, execution policy. And uh, then you can read out and, uh, or interact with it and uh, measure um, things about your uh, results, about your progress, like convergence, etc. cetera. Um, we'll also talk about a couple of extensions to this. Um, later in the talk. And then uh, finally, we will try and uh, discuss what it means to translate uh, a problem into information program. Um, let's first uh, dive into an example. Um, when I uh, started on information programming, I was learning uh, category theory uh, with a book of uh, Brandon Fung and David Spivak, if I recall correctly, uh, seven sketches in composability. And they talk about all the um, practical applications of uh, category theory, or at least uh, seven of them. And 
I, I thought, well, I, I can apply some of these concepts because I've, I've been uh, doing freelance programming for quite some years. And um, th th this made me feel that there is a missing gap between the practical applications and, and the theory. Um, and so I took some of the concepts and I uh, tried to uh, make a framework for it that, that would provide some more guarantees. So we will dive into the, the original codes uh, that, I, that I first wrote. Uh, it's not pretty, it's not, um, it's not using the, the current state of the framework, but it does illustrate the basic principles in its uh, naive um, way of doing things. Uh, so if I share my screen. All right, um, so um, we can see here Sudoku solver. Um, this takes a problem, namely the Sudoku grid, which maybe has uh, digits filled in and a uh, propagation network or an uh, information propagation network would, is what it would be called now. Um, it defines what it means to have options in uh, a Sudoku. So uh, this is something that um, people that solve Sudokus will do. They will write down uh, what, what different uh, digits are possible there. Then over this um, type of options, we will define um, what it means, well, in, in what way it is information, um, meaning uh, what, what is the uh, no information case and how do we combine observations. Um, then we will make cells for uh, like information cells for every cell in the Sudoku grid. Um, and then to solve it, we simply constrain the problem, um, applying deductions for um, every, for every row, column, block and for every cell in that. Um, namely, we say that uh, if your um, if there is only one option left, that means that the set of other possibilities uh, cannot include uh, that one item, right? Because that would be conflicting. And then we say that the propagation network uh, needs to calculate a fixed point. Um, so keep applying these deductions until there is uh, no work left. And um, so let's load in Sudoku. Um, it's doing the nine by nine at the moment. So let's do that again. And we can uh, print the original problem. This is maybe a bit wieldy. So let's um, do the small one instead. Yeah, that's a lot better. So this is a four by four Sudoku in which we uh, define uh, four numbers. Then we are translating that into cells uh, of our information type, namely the set of options. And then we are calculating a fixed point on that, uh, which results in the Sudoku being uh, completely solved. Um, this uh, is a good point for the discussion, but um, uh, more difficult Sudokus could be solved by a different policy here, uh, because uh, for the 16 by 16 example, um, you, you will need uh, backtracking because it has uh, naked singles, etc. Right. Let's return back to the presentation. Um, so the first thing we talked about is the is a type, right? Um, the, this was the options. And in contrast to your normal types, uh, these have to fulfill a whole bunch of um, things to, to be valid in information programming. Um, they need to uh, adhere to a partial order, um, to a bounded semi-lattice, and optionally, 
to a, a few other um, parameters. Let's do that uh, with an example. So here you have the, um, the semi lattice on the right, um, in which you can see that if, you, if you're making observations, um, an apple is uh, seeing an apple is uh, a subset of seeing everything. It is um, something you already know. Uh, in a partial order, the partial stands for not every two items being comparable. And um, in, in this lattice, if you have an observation of an apple or an observation of an orange, well, you can't compare apples and oranges. You can't um, compare these uh, levels of uh, information. Uh, they are, in this case, uh, worth the, the same of amount of information, but you observe different things. Um, it's also a binded semi lattice, which means that it has a bottom element, which corresponds to no information, and a join operation. And a join operation combines information, an observation of an apple with an observation of an orange in this universe or over this type uh, that would correspond to uh, knowing everything. Uh, optionally, you can also specify what it means to be uh, over complete or uh, at the top type um, and what uh, the atoms are. And atoms are uh, like your singleton sets or they are one layer below your uh, top type. And they can be useful to define uh, things like in the Sudoku example, your singleton sets would, would uh, be the digits you actually show at the end to the user. And uh, there is a relation between that partial order and binded semi lattice, namely that if you have um, two elements with the x uh, le uh, less containing less information than y, then the join would um, have at least as much information as uh, the y. Right. So um, cells are, uh, as I mentioned, like your um, your, your variables. Um, they only have one specific type and the, this cannot change over the course of the, of the run. And um, it acts like a container in the sense that you can't mutate this variable directly. You have to use its updates um, function. And these uh, cells, when you, when you build them, like I showed in the code example, you do this together. You um, you map your whole problem, or you create a whole array of these cells, and you are responsible for the labeling or the grouping uh, in the host programming language. And then at runtime, all these cells start out at the bottom type, and they get updated with the with the join. Um, so even if you have known values, then you for they first start out as um, bottom, and then you update the known values with join, and then you calculate the rest. Um, it also uh, allows for the specification of metrics and properties, which, which you can extend cells like, is this an atom? Or uh, if you have defined a custom metric, like what is dot 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 metric uh, for this cell? Um, and the cells are the core components for setting up uh, transformations. Here you see an observation and a conclusion. The observation like uh, in the real world is uh, very complex and the conclusion very simple. Um, th this is the four lattice. Um, here, is a, here is a better visualization of it. Um, you can see that uh, it starts out with, with seeing no dots, and then uh, there are a few uh, val possible values with one dot. If you join these together, then you have different observations with two dots, join these together again, join these together again. I will use this notation to indicate runtime um, in the sense that the, the blue is used for the type and the green is used for the specific value in the type. Um, 
and here is a, a particular example uh, with, with these two dots being joined together into a new observation. Uh, there is also a constructive uh, type Boolean here, um, which means that uh, if you've seen a proof, you can be convinced otherwise. Um, so the bottom type there is false, top type true. And um, they are joined with uh, regular or. So for uh, the connections between these different cells, we have deductions, which are partial functions um, defined in the host language. Uh, and these have to expose um, how to compute an element and if it can compute at that certain element of the lattice. For example, uh, in um, the uh, cell example of Sudokus, um, we were we could only do computing with on the atoms on the um, on, on like one row of the data type, and on the rest of the data types we were not doing any deductions. Uh, so that's what it means to be defined at, um, and they can be many to many. Um, so you could take into account multiple cells uh, and produce or update multiple other cells, uh, as long as they have the same type, more on that later. Um, and this adheres to this uh, increasing information uh, paradigm. So you can either discard options, uh, add features to something, or improve the results. Uh, here is the example for long division. I will give you a few seconds to look at uh, the graph. So here at the bottom, you can see uh, four different values with the same uh, lattice. Namely, you have a uh, no information or unspecified elements. You have a value and you have a conflict. Um, and these are connected with uh, a long division, uh, which takes into uh, values and produces the quotient and the remainder. In the case shown here, um, only the remainder is unknown. Um, so say that Q is indeed uh, the quotient and the, yeah, is indeed the quotient of the, of the division, uh, that won't affect anything, that won't be changed to a conflict. Um, but the bottom type, of remainder will be um, increased to the actual value of the remainder shown in uh, red here. Exchanges are the second way of connecting things. They are very much like deductions, but um, they are between different types and they um, are one-to-one. -one. Uh, or in other words, they, they don't have to be defined as one-on-one, -on -one, but uh, they need to be able to be factored out into one-to-one -one, uh, conversions. These have to adhere to um, some extra things, namely a bidirectionality requirement and a monotonicity requirement. Um, this is where um, some of the um, mentions of Galois connections came from. Uh, in other words, an exchange would be an antitone uh, Galwa connection between like two different lattices. Um, so take a uh, one lattice and be another lattice, then you need to define a back and a forth conversion, a left and a right. Um, and this has to admit to uh, the fact that if you have something of uh, type A, if you go back and forth, uh, to the other type and back, then that has to be greater than what you started with, greater or equal to. And the same goes for B. A practical example is at the bottom where you have a um, simple lettuce, for example, uh, the apples and uh, oranges lettuce, and a second lettuce, which um, is very similar to the um, 
true and false lattice, namely non-empty and empty. And if we have a value that's uh, in a non-empty subset, or, or if we have a value that is a non-empty subset, we want to update the lattice on the right, um, or the value of the lattice on the right to say non-empty. Um, conversely, if we have um, if we have empty on the right, then we will um, need to say that it is also empty on the left. Um, do you see that this this mapping isn't complete? Uh, this is something it inherits from deductions. This makes it a lot easier to specify in programming. But if you if you're interested, yes, this is not this is not fully faithful, right? This is um, there is no if you want to convey all different all the information that's possible, then you need to pre-image something that returns multiple elements here. Um, but that's outside of the scope of uh, this this talk. So on the uh, left hand side, you see a green dot um, that's uh, being converted to another lattice, another infinite lattice. Um, which is able to perform a few deductions before being converted uh, back to this uh, lattice and um, increased in information yet again. I think these exchanges uh, typically helps you to um, get out of local minima because you can use other information sources to, uh, to disambiguate or uh, to, to get beyond that. Um, what well, this requirement um, corresponds to that these arrows should never cross, right? They should always go go up. If you have this arrow, uh, if you have the top arrow, which points to the um, bottom right, for example, then you would get into a loop. You would not be able to uh, calculate the fixed points because uh, you are going to the bottom going up again and going back to the bottom and going up again. So what does the full flow look like? You create uh, type instances like we did in the codes, the cell structure, the connections. You select the policy you want to run with. You run that policy and optionally you read out that information. I say optionally because you can also in interactive systems have this um, this uh, callback where you are allowing for user interaction. You are using cameras uh, to to film the environment and uh, to do reasoning on that um, and all these things. So on the right, I've reworked the Sudoku example a little bit to be interactive. Um, so. At the top, you can see the, the lattice we used for the four by four Sudoku with the join operation still corresponding to set intersection. The structure of uh, two by two blocks and uh, the rows in which you can see the, the brown um, edges or the deductions that say, oh, well, if you have this, um, this value and it is an atom, it is a singleton set, then the rest of the items on this row, block, or uh, column should not contain uh, the same things, right? That's what it means to, to be a Sudoku. Um, and that's uh, translated with an exchange to the dots on the bottom, which have a different lattice. Um, the bottom element here is a question mark indicating um, it is it is blank. You can manually fill in one, two, three, or four, and it shows back a um, an exclamation mark if there is conflicting information. So setting this up would look like you entering uh, a number in a system, and you see all the um, all the cells that get into conflict or that are unknown, still unknown or that gets promoted to a value. Um, 
And one policy you could use for this is input propagation, where you register that a cell has been changed by the user or by the system, and then you propagate all the information via all the deductions and the changes that uh, result from that. This is the uh, one of the last slides. It's uh, one of the more technical slides. So uh, we'll try to go uh, through it like on, a, on quite a high level. Um, you have different policies available for solving your problem. Like I mentioned, this is quite unique. Normally you, um, th this is baked in very deeply into your framework. So you have uh, a budget, uh, policy which allows you to cap on the amount of executions or the running time. Um, you have a fixed point operator, like you could uh, run deductions and exchanges until nothing changes anymore. And less obviously, you could also um, do search on this space. You could say there is a metric uh, which is used to prioritize the different deductions run. So you can, um, th this is very useful on problems where you have a lot of deductions at any given time and you want to efficiently uh, do those that have the most results, for example. Or you could uh, backtrack, uh, which is used in the Sudoku case uh, to get behind uh, or to get beyond uh, some locks you get in at certain points of the solving process for more difficult Sudokus. But that's not like the, the impressive part of information programming, because that would be that this is uh, composable. Um, these different policies can be mixed and matched and combined and user specified to, um, to be well suited for the problem. This means that you can start off with a very naive policy and improve performance just by by tuning uh, this. Um, or it could mean that uh, you have a hybrid policy that solves a very complex problem by employing different sub policies at different points uh, in time or in the program. An example uh, inheritance diagram would look like this, where a policy needs a way to disambiguate which could be the identity, a way to propagate information and a stopping criterion. Examples of stopping criteriums would be, uh, or criteria would be uh, a condition. Uh, has this lattice reached the top elements? Uh, is it an atom? Um, some custom condition. Um, it, this stopping criterion could be a metric, let's say, we reached a certain amount of information in the system. Examples of propagation logics would be uh, globally uh, updating something like a fixed points or locally updating something like the input propagation we did earlier with the interactive Sudoku example. This ambiguation would be uh, like, a, um, like a heuristic in the search where you uh, use uh, random sampling or you use the most effective, uh, the most information increasing updates, or you do you even do a look ahead. Um, so uh, that's that's the real uh, the real power of specifying everything in such a constrained environment. Then you can uh, be really flexible with um, how you execute it. So uh, my message uh, to you is um, test it out, see if uh, this paradigm uh, fits for you. Um, you can uh, contact me at my website. Um, you can uh, think about this yourself, how these ideas would uh, be of use to, to your problems. Um, this is very novel and, or, well, at least very recent um, and, a, and a young project. So uh, I'm looking forward to, to what uh, this can become. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Again, you can um, 
go to my website, adamv.b slash ip to take a look at the article, which goes in a bit more detail in some areas, a bit less detail in others. Um, and it also uh, contains the slide deck and an overview of the slide deck. All right, um, I love discussion. So uh, let's get on with that part. Yes, thanks Adam. Uh, it's uh, intriguing and uh, the Sudoku example uh, is uh, uh, impressive in, in its uh, consensus and uh, performance. Uh, uh, but, uh, well, uh, personally, I, I didn't uh, get uh, if uh, uh, this approach is a sort of uh, uh, formalism, so is a, is a mathematical model behind it. Uh, if yes, how it differs from uh, other, I, I don't uh, know, similar or not uh, stuff like uh, constraint lo logic programming or answer set programming or yeah, whatever. Yeah, exactly. So the, the Sudoku example uh, looks a lot like what you would write in Prolog, for example. Um, but the Sudoku example is actually one extreme um, of information programming in the sense that it is a very logical driven um, thing and the functions can be arbitrarily complex uh, behind those joins, behind those deductions. Um, and th th that's where it uh, differs quite heavily from uh, those answer set programming and constraint satisfaction things. So um, as to the second part of your question, or actually the first part of your question, uh, how does it compare? Well, if you um, take the atom space that's um, got a quite quite a broad um, profile in terms of what it handles. Uh, it can handle uh, symbolic data very well. It can also handle sub-symbolic data up until like some, some limits of, of scale. Um, its uh, runtime is um, almost exclusively uh, symbolic. Its specification is symbolic. Um, it is trying to be like a, a meta um, learning system where you can specify how programs are specified, how to evolve programs, uh, how to interpret the programs in your um, life system. Um, and if we go over to um, what's, uh, and there is actually a mistake in here, the meta part of information programming is wrong, but um, if we scroll over to information program, we see that it is a lot more specific in some areas and more general in others. Um, in the sense that this uh, acts more like a solver than the atom space does or Keras would do. Um, so in that regard, it is uh, more similar to answer set programming and it is less agentistic. It's less, um, it's more myopic um, in, in its working. But I believe that can still work for live systems as long as you, you handle your input and output and you have a nice model and you do allow to reset certain pieces of the information programming um, network uh, to allow for, uh, let's say, um, different time scales uh, for extracting useful things from an image on on a short time scale and on a long time scale you would train a neural network and these uh, different parts of the information programming system uh, have different lifetimes so it is in your observation is absolutely correct that it is more constraints in some ways um, and yet um, quite flexible in other ways Uh, so is uh, something like uh, uh, information uh, increase uh, 
uh, is it a, a sort of a heuristic or it uh, provides uh, some uh, guarantees to certain tasks? Uh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the information increase is really um, vital to to how it works in that uh, it is also used uh, to decide what um, what what functions to run. Um, and it is uh, used to be able to give some uh, some guarantees as to, for example, will your fixed point operator, uh, will you have a fixed point? Um, well, in this system, um, you, you, you can tell something about that. If your um, lattices are bounded, then yes, there will be a fixed point here uh, because it is guaranteed to only increase in information. Um, yeah. Well, it uh, looks uh, like uh, knowledge-based reasoning. So uh, is it uh, some uh, compact uh, uh, concept or approach? I mean, uh, uh, information programming. So is uh, one idea behind it or is it uh, more like, a, I don't know, cognitive architecture with uh, mm -hmm. uh, different components uh, interacting with each other and so on? Uh, yeah, it's um, it's definitely not a cognitive ar architecture in the sense that it's, um, its primary purpose is not uh, to be that, but you could implement uh, in your uh, deductions, in your exchanges, these could run arbitrary complex logic or even consult other approaches um, as long as they abide to certain rules. Um, so it's a paradigm, a paradigm with a focus on um, scalable and multimodal um, computation. Um, with, with some guarantees, it's not trying to be, um, like I mentioned, uh, an agent uh, trying to perform actions in the environment, although that running the system with live callbacks uh, could potentially act in that way. Uh, thanks, uh, it's really intriguing. Uh, I'm still like an, uh, uh, some possibility to put it uh, uh, into my uh, knowledge system, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I guess uh, uh, it uh, requires uh, some uh, more digging uh, deeper and uh, details and so on. Uh, maybe others have some questions. Yeah, I see one question here, which asks, uh, could you avoid crossing the lines uh, during deduction between types? By encoding a monotonic system uh, in the in the time dimension, um, and yeah, this um, at the moment or in this framework they are fused, right? Your um, your um, lattice order or your the order behind your lattice is uh, necessarily. Um, linear in time. So you can jump back uh, on your lattice. Um, so that's, that's one constraint and that's also where it gets its, uh, its power from. So getting around this by using um, a time dimension could be used, for example, in some policies you have all you also have a backtracking policy which does like this uh, you, you could almost look like it uh, at it like a look ahead um, before updating uh, so that that's definitely possible because then you are uh, cheating a bit you are um, you are using some disambiguation technique to to get beyond the local maximum but still this is uh, meant to be quite constrained on purpose
Any other questions? Okay, well, uh, we still have some time. Uh, do you have uh, some uh, other examples uh, besides uh, Sudoku? Yeah, sure, sure. I think um, uh, one uh, example that's, um, that's useful to look at in, a, uh, in this kind of system is this one here where you um, where you are actually computing values and or, or checking if certain things hold. Um, imagine you have a, a knowledge base or a bunch of equations uh, interlocking. Um, then information programming can be used to check the correctness uh, of these equations or of these rules in your system. Uh, could you please show some code if uh, it is possible because uh, it will be eliminated? Um, for for this, I I want to try and avoid to um, give code for the for the new um, framework, so to say, um, as this is still a work in progress and uh, changing, and that, that that's. I would be more comfortable uh, like releasing that uh, all in once, but um, one one possibly illuminating example would be uh, if you if you are doing um, if you have these numerical equations and you're putting numbers into that, like what 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 is uh, does this hold um, then your lattice can not only be uh, of this simple um, of the simple form where you have no information of value or a, or a conflict, but you could also have um, a a confidence interval, which is a an infinite lattice, and that confidence interval could get could give you the uh, accuracy as to what level your equations model each parameter. Um, so you, you would have um, a, a certainty and an error on, uh, on that, 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 are, that is propagated uh, with the different equations in your system. Another example that's, um, that's very related to uh, what is happening in um, some related systems is where you have some sets of um, knowledge and execution combined. Um, so here, the second law, for example, it scans both towards a, a knowledge item with, within the host language, uh, having uh, names and properties attached um, as it is a computational item within the information programming uh, network, it, is, uh, it can be looked at as a partial function, uh, which actually, actually uh, calculates stuff. So it can do the, um, you can uh, define the model or how it, how it interacts with each other. Um, and the information programming network in the background um, literally in Scalite, it is an implicit. It is something that is um, that it is not visible in in the codes uh, for construction. Um, it is only there to provide the computational backend to your problems. Okay, thanks. Uh, you mentioned. Uh... Neo4j and uh, atom space on your last slide. Uh, mm -hmm. could, could you please uh, elaborate on uh, how exactly this uh, uh, could be used uh, 
uh, uh, together with uh, query engines of uh, yeah, yeah, that's a that's a very good question. Um, so uh, one thing information programming definitely suffers from is a, a combinatoric explosion of deductions. Um, and I, I, I mentioned this in the uh, in the article um, too. You want to group your in information programming. You want to semantically group your deductions as being one function, as to not uh, clutter memory with uh, with a bunch of smaller functions. For example, um, you could uh, set out something like um, um, a transitive closure. Let's say you want to take a transitive closure of a graph. You could write that out as a deduction for every node of your graph, which just says, oh, well, take the in neighbor and take the out neighbor and connect them with each other, right? Um, but this may be more efficiently implemented as a many-to-many -many deduction, which takes the graph as a matrix representation and, um, and calculates powers of that matrix uh, to calculate the transitive closure instead of doing this on, on the node level. Um, so that, that, that's one part. The other part is that it doesn't support um, arbitrary, um, arbitrary placement of deductions in, in the atom space or in Neo4G, you can do queries. Um, the queries are your runtime, right? Um, but in information programming, you can do this after the fact you first built your, all your deductions and then you let the system run. Um, one way you, you can uh, get around this is by defining some interactive components like the uh, layer in the interactive Sudoku example uh, with which you can interact. Um, and that uh, triggers, conditionally triggers um, some deductions. Um, and as long as you, you have enough um, uh, structure build up, you can do uh, arbitrary size queries or put in another way for Every query size, you can make uh, intermediate values and you can make deductions that, um, that represent that. But you can do arbitrarily sized queries on a system after it has been uh, built. Tying into that, like a, as, a, as, a final, as a final point on that, um, you can define actually graph rewrites, um, which match your, um, the current value of your nodes. And they are just as deductions, they are um, updating the, the cell information. Um, but unlike the deduction, they can be applied at any parts of the, of the network. Um, so this is definitely a possibility but it is not uh, the primary focus as this trade is this trade some of the performance uh, to do this querying live. Um, but yeah, definitely a, a possible extension. Uh, uh, <laughs> this sounds uh, still a little bit uh, abstract to me. It would be very great uh, to see concrete examples uh, say with uh, uh, open cox uh, pattern matcher queries uh, uh, guided or executed uh, by uh, the information programming system or mm -hmm. i don't know maybe yeah. a nils unified tool engine uh, uh, adjusted uh, with, with this uh, uh, paradigm but yeah, uh, okay, it's a little bit uh, preliminary, but uh, uh, you heard something about uh, 
uh, Hyperon uh, design. So do you see, uh, is, is it possible to uh, built in your information programming uh, uh, in uh, this system uh, and on what level? Uh, should it be built uh, into the interpreter or can we program it? Uh, um, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, it, as a paradigm, I would say no, because it's, it has some, uh, some parts which is, in which it is very different. Uh, it is not trying to be as powerful as the atom space and making it as powerful would, would break some of its other uses, right? Um, but what, it's, what it can do or what what's, uh, could be added to the atom space and I believe to many other programming languages is the, um, the ability to have, um, have your computation happen on these lattices. So respecting the, the uh, increasing information rules this would some be something that uh, I think, uh, having read uh, the meta uh, language description at least, um, th this is something you could implement. Um, infinite lattices may be harder. I don't know how. Um, I, I didn't uh, directly see how uh, arbitrary integers, for example, could be. Uh, Operated with efficiently, um, but if that's if there is an escape hatch for that, then that same escape hatch may provide a good backbone for uh, these infinite lattices and um, and having a a robust way of dealing with um, with the information in the system and with the the conversions between many different types being images or text or um, they're all represented in a, in a lattice. Yeah, okay, maybe it's uh, not uh, precisely related uh, by my, uh, to my previous question, but uh, it is somehow related. Uh, uh, does it uh, make any sense uh, to do uh, information programming in a dependently typed language? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I, I haven't thought about that, so uh, I, I'm not going to directly give an answer to that, but um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, the language, well, it, it, doesn't, need, it doesn't need strong types. Um, yeah, but uh, uh, when uh, you are talking about uh, special orders, uh, let's and so on, it's uh, sort of types, no? Yeah, yeah. So these could be in these could indeed be encoded as type classes, right? And in Scala, I have encoded them uh, as uh, type classes, but this is in no way um, integral to to making this work. Uh, you could you could as well um, have this programmatically, um, like as you could define a build time. So to say, uh, this doesn't have to be at compile time. Okay, thanks. Uh, maybe yeah. others uh, have got some questions already. Thank you for your questions. Hmm. Well, not, we have a we have an early break, which is also yeah some uh, technical talks. So the break time uh, is not uh, far away, so maybe we can uh, go to break. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sounds good. Thanks all for listening. Thank you. All right, thank you. If you could please stop sharing your screen, then I'll start the break. Uh, yes. Thank you.
All right, uh, Alexei, are you ready? Yes, I'm uh, ready. Although All not right. uh, too much people here. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay, everyone. Uh, we are back uh, to our workshop on uh, scaling up uh, in neural symbolic systems. Uh, not uh, too many people here, but I guess uh, uh, we should uh, move on. Uh, if there are no other opinions. Okay, so uh, the next uh, uh, talk uh, will be mine. It's uh, uh, entitled uh, on uh, the announcement as uh, MetaType Talk, a new language for neural symbolic uh, distributed metagraph based AGI. Uh, although there will be not uh, too much on uh, uh, neural symbolic aspects and uh, uh, metagraph aspects, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, it's about uh, uh, meta, uh, which is a name we selected for um, uh, Atomy's uh, language for uh, Hyperon. Okay, and uh, let me start uh, sharing my screen. Okay, I hope uh, you can see my presentation now, right? Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, so uh, I will be talking about uh, meta language for uh, OpenCock Hyperon. And uh, since uh, our workshop uh, is uh, uh, mostly uh, devoted uh, to OpenCock in general, uh, I hope that uh, everyone is uh, familiar to a certain extent uh, to Hyperon, so I will be uh, referring uh, to it. Uh, so mm, let's uh, first uh, start uh, uh, with a uh, few notes. Uh, first of all, uh, OpenCock uh, Classic uh, uh, has a number of uh, components. Uh, the uh, most uh, uh, basic one is uh, atom space, uh, which is a, a metagraph uh, container for knowledge base. And uh, it uh, has a pattern matcher, which, uh, uh, which is a querying engine. Uh, and uh, in uh, atom space, uh, uh, we store uh, atoms, which uh, can be uh, links and nodes, uh, although uh, the distinction uh, between uh, them uh, is uh, a little bit uh, blurred. Uh, uh, but uh, if uh, we look at uh, atomies, uh, which is a language uh, uh, in which we uh, define uh, expressions for atom space, it will uh, uh, look uh, like an ordinary language. Uh, uh, it uh, can have uh, different uh, surface uh, syntax, uh, uh, but uh, the, the closest uh, one to the internal representation may be a, a scheme-like uh, syntax. And uh, uh, basically when 
uh, we are trying uh, to write programs uh, in Atomis. Uh, uh, we write these uh, expressions in the first place, and uh, uh, the source code in Atomis uh, looks like a list of such expressions, and uh, uh, only when uh, they are uh, loaded to, to the atom space, uh, then they, beca they become a metagraph. Uh, so basically, uh, it appears that uh, expressions uh, in metagraph play uh, the same role as uh, triples uh, play for ordinary graphs and uh, graphical databases. Uh, so uh, actually, these expressions are still uh, nested lists. Uh, and uh, uh, we, can, uh, we can store them in a different way. So uh, if uh, we uh, deduplicate uh, so all occurrences of identical sub-expressions. Uh, uh, if uh, we uh, glue these expressions uh, uh, into a, uh, uh, something uh, uh, united, then we got a metagraph. But uh, uh, actually, we can uh, represent uh, uh, programs in uh, Atomies as uh, pure text, uh, as uh, nested lists, uh, uh, and uh, so on. Uh, so, uh, first of all, in uh, uh, our uh, Hyperon uh, approach, uh, we uh, decide uh, that uh, we have we can have different atom spaces. Uh, so these atom spaces, as uh, I can mention, uh, mentioned, can be uh, textual, uh, can be just uh, a list of nested lists, uh, can be a metagraph uh, in a, a style of. Uh, open clock uh, classic uh, atom space uh, or can be a uh, distributed atom space with uh, uh, whatever backend uh, you would like uh, to use uh, for this. Uh, uh, it can be a, a graph database, uh, it can be a key value storage or whatever. So uh, it is actually uh, not, uh, it's, it's not, uh, uh, I couldn't say it's uh, not important, uh, uh, but uh, we kind of uh, abstract away this uh, implementation details uh, of uh, uh, atom spaces in our uh, uh, meta language design. Uh, so uh, if uh, we can represent uh, something as uh, uh, in textual form uh, in uh, code, which uh, we can uh, read, uh, as a text, and uh, if we can uh, map uh, this code uh, to a metagraph and can uh, map it uh, back from metagraph to uh, code, then uh, this atom space is just naturally isomorphic. And uh, uh, if uh, we preserve this isomorphism, then we uh, don't care too much uh, uh, what is uh, under the hood. So uh, we, I will not uh, talk about uh, metagraphs uh, uh, in my talk, and uh, it will be uh, Matt and uh, Andre in uh, the next talk, uh, uh, who will be talking about possible uh, distributed uh, metagraph atom space uh, uh, implementation. But in uh, the meta language, uh, uh, we kind of independent on the internal representation uh, of uh, atom spaces. Uh, then, uh, what uh, if we uh, abstract away this uh, uh, technical detail of uh, how atom space uh, uh, represents expressions uh, of atomies? Then uh, we can uh, see that uh, actually everything is uh, just a symbolic expression. So. Uh, there are types of nodes and links, and uh, I will be, uh, I will uh, talk about it a little bit later. Uh, if we just remove uh, uh, the types uh, and uh, uh, look at these expressions, then uh, we will not uh, uh, need uh, to indicate that something is a link or not. We uh, can uh, just uh, write down an ordinary expression. So uh, this is an expression uh, we can. Uh, uh, look at uh, evaluation link and the predicate node as uh, 
uh, ordinary symbols. Uh, so this is expression, this is expression, and this is expression. Uh, everything is uh, just expressions. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, in these expressions, uh, we uh, don't need uh, to follow uh, exactly this uh, uh, format of uh, representing these expressions. Uh, uh, every time indicating uh, the link or node type uh, uh, at the beginning of uh, referring to this link or not. Uh, so, uh, we can uh, uh, just deal with uh, arbitrary symbolic expressions. So uh, we can just say, uh, let's uh, have uh, uh, any symbols uh, uh, possible, which we can parse in our textual atom space, uh, and uh, let us uh, compose arbitrary symbolic expressions out of them. Uh, so uh, we don't uh, lose uh, almost nothing, uh, but uh, the only question, uh, uh, remains uh, what's about uh, the types. Uh, so in uh, the OpenCock uh, classic, uh, uh, types are quite important. Uh, they are used uh, uh, to uh, index and uh, pattern match uh, expressions, so subgraphs, sub, sub metagraphs. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Sometimes when you don't uh, indicate uh, the node or uh, link type, uh, the pattern matcher can refuse uh, can refuse uh, uh, to execute the query because uh, it uh, uh, it's not just not enough information uh, to to to, uh, to deal with. Uh, but uh, I will talk about uh, pattern matching a bit a, bit, a little bit uh, later. Uh, so. Mm, types uh, are important, but uh, they are uh, built in and uh, their behavior is uh, hard coded uh, uh, in the uh, reference language like uh, C in the first place. Uh, also, you can uh, use uh, other uh, languages uh, for this as well. Uh, there is a possibility to introduce. Uh, uh, custom types in uh, runtime, but uh, you still uh, will have to, uh, to specify the behavior in a, uh, a reference language, uh, not in Atomis itself. Uh, so, uh, and uh, this uh, uh, makes uh, this type system uh, not too flexible. Uh, you can uh, indicate uh, signatures uh, of uh, Atomese expressions uh, for pattern matching, uh, but uh, they're actually not uh, algebraic data types. So, so uh, there is uh, no typing rules. Uh, and uh, uh, taking into account uh, uh, some uh, uh, rigidity of uh, how we can introduce types, uh, uh, they use uh, in the OpenCock classic is. Uh, uh, a little bit uh, limited. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, we can uh, learn something from this. Uh, so we can uh, uh, ask ourselves, uh, for example, if uh, uh, everything uh, should be uh, described uh, using existing types like uh, predicate, node, uh, uh, inheritance, link, uh, or uh, we should uh, introduce uh, new types uh, uh, for example, we can have a color link uh, instead of indicating an evaluation link of a predicate not color. Or we have uh, we can have, um, uh, say, color node type, uh, uh, cu custom type, which we still need uh, to uh, code, uh, uh, mostly in a... Uh, in another language, not in Atomis uh, itself, but uh, uh, whatever. Uh, so we can uh, uh, just have an inheritance link uh, from color green uh, to color as concept node. So we can introduce a uh, uh, color node and just uh, have green. Uh, so we, uh, in our design, uh, uh, of uh, meta language uh, somewhat inspired by uh, dependent uh, type uh, languages, uh, uh, which uh, go further than uh, uh, just uh, 
uh, generalized algebraic uh, uh, types. Uh, mm. uh, and uh, in uh, uh, dependent type languages, uh, uh, there are different uh, interesting uh, properties. Uh, uh, we can uh, specify uh, types as uh, mappings uh, from one type to another type. So we can have uh, uh, parametric uh, types uh, dependent on other types and so on. And uh, this is a, a kind of uh, uh, interesting approach in terms of uh, knowledge representation because uh, uh, we can uh, represent uh, this way both uh, uh, ontological uh, knowledge uh, and uh, uh, propositions because uh, in uh, dependently typed languages uh, uh, types uh, become uh, uh, propositions so uh, we can um, we can encode uh, uh, propositions in types and uh, uh, prove uh, these propositions uh, by uh, providing uh, instances uh, of this type so showing that uh, these types are uh, inhabitant uh, so in um, uh, meta, we uh, have uh, types uh, which uh, uh, which uh, can be assigned to symbols uh, and expressions, uh, uh, and uh, uh, we, uh, in contrast to the open cock uh, classic, uh, uh, to atomies, we uh, decouple uh, symbols from uh, their types. Uh, uh, so. Uh, well, uh, as uh, I mentioned, there can be different atom spaces, uh, textual atom space, metagraph atom space, and so on. And actually, uh, textual atom spaces can be different. So uh, we can have uh, different uh, surface syntax uh, for meta, and uh, we don't uh, talk uh, about uh, uh, syntax of meta here. And uh, I will use uh, mostly uh, scheme like uh, syntax, uh, which uh, uh, is both close to atomies uh, from OpenCock Classic and uh, uh, to the possible uh, internal representation of uh, expressions. Uh, but uh, <laughs> the syntax uh, can be different, like uh, uh, Haskell, uh, like uh, uh, which is uh, slightly more uh, human friendly. Uh, but uh, here we, we will uh, keep uh, this notation. So uh, we can uh, introduce uh, 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 symbol types uh, uh, in uh, atomies uh, itself. Uh, so we don't uh, need uh, uh, to indicate uh, uh, atom types uh, like in uh, atomies uh, from the very beginning. We can uh, just uh, write down a symbol and uh, uh, we can, uh, as the earlier or later, uh, declare its uh, type uh, using a typing expression. Uh, and uh, well, uh, these are also expressions. So uh, the question arises, uh, what uh, are these types? So uh, how types are different uh, uh, from uh, other symbols and uh, uh, how typing expressions are uh, different uh, from uh, any other expression uh, which uh, uh, could be arbitrary. So uh, in contrast uh, to the dependently typed uh, languages, uh, uh, we don't have a very special uh, syntax uh, for defining types uh, uh, and so on. So we can use uh, the same uh, syntax uh, to say this or this. Uh, and uh, what's interesting, uh, we consider, uh, we found out that uh, it's uh, uh, in this uh, context, it's uh, good to consider uh, types as uh, restrictions on allowed uh, expressions. And uh, so as uh, I mentioned, uh, uh, we would uh, like uh, to consider arbitrary expressions uh, over arbitrary symbols uh, uh, at the very beginning. So we don't want uh, to have uh, uh, any restrictions on uh, what uh, expressions uh, uh, we use uh, 
uh, to compose our metagraph, uh, for example, uh, like uh, in uh, graph uh, databases, we uh, can uh, use uh, nearly any uh, object, uh, predicate and subject uh, to construct uh, uh, edges uh, and nodes of our graph. Uh, but uh, uh, types, uh, they actually impose uh, restrictions uh, on uh, what expressions are allowed and uh, these are custom restrictions uh, uh, introduced uh, by the uh, program itself. Uh, so for example, uh, here we have uh, uh, has color as an arrow type. Uh, I will uh, not uh, talk uh, much about it, but uh, we have actually uh, gradual types here. So uh, the type of a symbol can be undefined and uh, uh, there are uh, typing rules uh, typical for uh, gra gradual uh, type systems, but uh, it uh, doesn't matter uh, much uh, for this presentation. Uh, so we have uh, has color uh, as of uh, an arrow type and it just says uh, that uh, uh, it is allowed uh, to construct uh, an expression uh, which here is uh, has color symbol and uh, uh, which uh, first uh, say argument uh, or second uh, uh, symbol uh, in uh, this expression uh, or second sub expression of this expression because we can have uh, here not only a symbol but a sub expression. So uh, it uh, can have uh, arbitrary type and uh, uh, the third uh, sub expression or the second argument of has color, if you wish, uh, should have a color type. And um, uh, if uh, this holds, uh, then the whole uh, expression will have uh, type uh, TV. Uh, here it's uh, true value, uh, just, uh, uh, just uh, as an example. Uh, so uh, this one will be well typed because uh, uh, green has uh, type color. Uh, and uh, the uh, overall, uh, derived type uh, of uh, this expression will be TV. So uh, it uh, can be placed uh, as a sub expression uh, in any other expression uh, which uh, expects a TV type there. So uh, another example, uh, we can uh, impose uh, such uh, constraints uh, uh, not only on uh, uh, symbolic expressions uh, themselves, but on typing expressions, which are also uh, similar symbolic expressions. So for example, if uh, uh, we have uh, entity as a type, and uh, if we have human as a dependent type, uh, which actually uh, doesn't differ too much from uh, a function. So there is uh, no such a, a strict uh, separation between uh, types uh, and other symbols as in dependently typed languages. Uh, so if we have uh, human as uh, say dependent uh, uh, type, uh, uh, and uh, then if uh, we have uh, mm, uh, plat is human uh, as an instance of uh, human plata type, then uh, human plata uh, pl platus, uh, uh, will uh, have a type type because uh, uh, human expects uh, entity as a first argument and uh, overall uh, type uh, uh, will be type. So uh, it's uh, as simple as it seems. So uh, types uh, just uh, impose uh, restrictions on uh, uh, expressions uh, which we consider uh, well formed, uh, so with a proper structure. Uh, then in uh, uh, OpenCock uh, Classic, uh, we have a very important uh, tool, uh, which is a pattern matching. Uh, here I show just a Gatling uh, 
there are other uh, types of uh, pattern matching links like uh, bind link, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, other links, uh, but uh, um, maybe it uh, has already changed. Maybe there is a matching and so on, but uh, uh, for our purposes, uh, it's enough uh, to have uh, this type of link. Uh, so we specify a pattern here. Uh, an important uh, component here is uh, uh, variables, uh, because uh, variables uh, can be bound uh, to uh, different uh, sub-expressions or sub-graphs. Uh, uh, we can uh, have uh, just a, a plain uh, uh, pattern with one variable, and uh, it will be uh, matched uh, against uh, uh, a, a, an expression which is stored uh, in an atom space. Uh, uh, also, it can be seen that uh, in this case, uh, uh, we will have a variable X bound to a list link uh, uh, that is uh, to sub-expression. Uh, we can uh, have uh, uh, multiple variables, uh, on uh, different uh, levels and in different places of our pattern. Uh, we can have uh, typed variables, so we can indicate uh, uh, desirable uh, variable type. And as I mentioned, uh, it uh, can be very important uh, uh, for successful pattern matching. Also, uh, not uh, in this case, but uh, there are such uh, cases for sure. Uh, so uh, patterns uh, or queries uh, for pattern matching uh, ha have uh, variables, which is important. Uh, they can have uh, restrictions on types. Uh, and uh, actually more because uh, uh, pattern matching uh, allows for a sort of uh, logic uh, expressions or uh, analogs of uh, joins uh, like in uh, other databases uh, so we can uh, say that uh, we want uh, both this pattern and uh, this pattern uh, to be uh, matched uh, simultaneously with uh, shared uh, variables uh, and uh, it is a uh, very convenient uh, uh, for constructing uh, different interesting queries. Mm, but uh, besides this, uh, uh, OpenCox uh, pattern matching uh, does uh, recursive evaluation of uh, atoms. Uh, so uh, there are grounded atoms, which uh, I will uh, mention shortly. Uh, and uh, there are uh, atoms with uh, different sorts of uh, behavior when uh, I said that uh, uh, we need uh, uh, not only to say that uh, we want this type of atom, uh, we need to define its uh, behavior. And uh, many interesting atoms uh, have uh, some uh, specific uh, behavior, which is invoked uh, uh, in the course of uh, uh, recursive uh, evaluation of uh, atomic expressions. Basically, uh, pattern matcher is an atomist interpreter itself. Um, and uh, this uh, may be uh, good uh, for some uh, applications, but uh, uh, we uh, found out that uh, we would like to make uh, a somewhat different uh, uh, separation uh, between uh, pattern matching and uh, interpretation of uh, language. Uh, another uh, component of uh, the OpenCock uh, Classic is a unified troll engine, uh, which is uh, a very powerful uh, tool, which uh, can uh, turn into fuzzy logic, uh, probabilistic logic, or, or whatever, depending on uh, rules. Uh, you specify and uh, uh, while uh, mm, we have variables in queries uh, in the case of uh, pattern matching uh, also there was a dual link uh, which uh, 
uh, does the opposite, but uh, not uh, simultaneously. Uh, the unified rule engine supposes that uh, our knowledge base contains some rules which uh, uh, can have, or not just can have, which uh, uh, typically will have variables. And uh, uh, we actually can have uh, queries uh, with uh, variables as well. And uh, uh, we have uh, we can have variables on uh, both uh, sides. Uh, uh, and um, uh, the unified rule engine uh, uh, will uh, do pattern matching calls, will do uh, unification of uh, uh, expressions and uh, will do chaining of uh, uh, such uh, uh, calls. So uh, it will find an applicable rule uh, among its uh, uh, rule base. Uh, the one uh, thing that, uh, uh, yeah, it uh, doesn't use uh, ev everything uh, uh, as uh, possible rules, which is stored in our knowledge base, but uh, it uh, requires uh, to define the set of rules uh, on which uh, uh, it is working, uh, but it's a minor point. Uh, so um, we want uh, something like uh, the unified rule engine uh, in meta, but uh, we want uh, to uh, draw boundaries uh, between pattern matching, uh, atomies, uh, or meta uh, interpretation uh, and reasoning a, a little bit different. So uh, while uh, the pattern matching is uh, a sort of uh, interpreter, we want uh, to do a static uh, pattern matching or rather static uh, unification. Uh, that is, uh, we have uh, two expressions uh, and uh, both of them uh, can have uh, variables, and uh, we want uh, to understand if uh, uh, these uh, expressions uh, uh, can be made uh, identical by uh, uh, picking up uh, certain uh, uh, variable bindings. For example, if you have uh, Sam likes uh, blue X and uh, Sam likes uh, white uh, balloon, uh, then uh, these two expressions uh, can be uh, made uh, identical uh, by binding X to balloon and uh, binding Y to blue. Uh, and uh, we can uh, do this or we want uh, to do this uh, uh, without uh, referring to uh, any other expressions uh, uh, in uh, our program or in our uh, uh, knowledge base in our atom space. Uh, uh, so we just uh, want uh, to find uh, if uh, there is uh, an expression or multiple expressions uh, uh, in our uh, program, uh, which uh, can be unified uh, individually with uh, uh, the query. Uh, we don't want uh, uh, in this operation to do a recursive evaluation. Uh, so we want uh, to separate this uh, uh, small step, uh, which uh, I will have some uh, guarantees uh, on uh, execution type. At least uh, it will not uh, try, uh, try to solve uh, an NP-complete or even uh, undecidable uh, problem. So, uh, and uh, it, it can be done on the side of... Uh, uh, the uh, atom space uh, distribu distributed uh, knowledge base. We actually uh, may want uh, from uh, this uh, uh, pa uh, pattern, static pattern matching something more, but uh, that's uh, uh, another story. So it doesn't uh, perform, this one uh, separate step doesn't perform a recursive evaluation of expressions. Uh, it doesn't perform chaining. Uh, and uh, uh, in uh, contrast uh, to the unified rule engine, uh, this uh, is uh, more like uh, pattern matching uh, in respect with that uh, it uh, uh, can try to find uh, uh, 
uh, any expression in uh, the knowledge base which uh, can be matched uh, against the query. So we don't uh, uh, restrict our attention to the uh, selected um, uh, rule base. Uh, so it's uh, somewhat uh, in between uh, the pattern matcher and the unified rule engine. Okay, so uh, then uh, we can uh, have uh, types uh, in our uh, uh, queries and uh, in our expressions uh, uh, where uh, these uh, types uh, can be used. So, for example, uh, we can have uh, this uh, query uh, in uh, OpenCock Classic and uh, 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 it will uh, roughly correspond uh, uh, to uh, this uh, query in uh, meta. Uh, so we just uh, say that uh, our uh, variable x uh, is a predicate, uh, is of type predicate, and uh, we form uh, this expression, and uh, it uh, can be matched uh, against uh, uh, this expression in our knowledge base. Uh, so the role of uh, uh, types in uh, this uh, static uh, unification or pattern matching uh, is uh, nearly the same as uh, in uh, the OpenCock classic. Uh, we, uh, uh, although there are some uh, differences uh, uh, in terms of uh, that uh, any symbol uh, can be a type. Uh, so we can uh, introduce uh, these uh, symbols in our program uh, freely. And uh, we use uh, typing rules. Uh, so if we have an arrow type and uh, the symbol of uh, an arrow type is applied to some arguments, uh, uh, the resulting expression uh, will have not uh, just a signature corresponding uh, to the whole uh, subgraph or sub-expression, but uh, uh, it will have a derived type in according to typing rules. Uh, in uh, pattern matching, however, uh, typing expressions are treated a little bit different uh, in terms that uh, uh, we can uh, uh, indicate uh, desirable uh, types uh, in place. So uh, this uh, expression uh, is matchable uh, against uh, uh, has color. So uh, if uh, we would like uh, to match these expressions exactly, uh, we uh, should need to have uh, uh, this uh, typing information right uh, uh, in place uh, in the very same uh, expression, but uh, uh, we allow this uh, uh, two expressions. One of them is typing expression, and uh, another one is uh, type, just a symbol uh, to be matchable. Uh, how it is done? Uh, uh, it's uh, the question to atom space and uh, pattern matcher. Uh, there are different approaches uh, to this. We can uh, uh, also use uh, types as uh, very specific uh, um, slots uh, in uh, the underlying structure of our atoms or so symbols, uh, uh, or we can uh, uh, use uh, this as a syntactic uh, sugar and uh, uh, just unwrap uh, this uh, as uh, uh, separate expressions as, or uh, vice versa. We can put uh, all typing information uh, inside the expression. So, for example, if uh, uh, you take uh, Idris, uh, uh, it uh, has a very uh, verbose internal representation of expressions uh, uh, with all the information attached. Uh, uh, but uh, whether it is good or not, it's uh, um, a question for two different applications because uh, maybe in, in, in some cases uh, uh, it uh, will uh, make our atom space, our database too large. Uh, if we don't do this, it may make it um, 
uh, too slow to respond to queries and so on. Uh, so we can uh, uh, store this information as ordinary expressions. So uh, some uh, somehow specifically attach uh, them uh, this type of information as uh, enriched expressions and actually. Uh, uh, it is uh, one of uh, the possible forms of uh, enrichments, uh, uh, of possible enrichments of expressions, but uh, uh, it's also a topic for another discussion. Uh, so as uh, far as we assume that uh, there can be different atom spaces, uh, they uh, can uh, implement uh, different strategies uh, for representing storing uh, indexing, querying, and so on of uh, type information. Uh, what uh, we are interested uh, in uh, a meta is uh, that uh, uh, such uh, expression uh, can be matched against uh, this one and uh, X uh, will be bound to has color, that's all. Uh, so this is a, uh, a remark regarding that uh, typing expressions are somewhat special. Uh, okay, so uh, let's go further. Uh, we can uh, have uh, variables. So uh, I didn't articulate it well, I guess, uh, uh, but uh, variables uh, uh, is a special type of uh, atoms or symbols. So uh, we have ordinary symbols uh, and uh, we have uh, variables. So they are treated uh, uh, specially, uh, although as uh, this uh, difference uh, appears uh, mostly on the level of uh, pattern matching uh, and uh, unification. Mm. Yeah, in any case, uh, we can have uh, uh, variables in our type uh, definitions. Uh, these are just uh, expressions. So uh, we can have uh, this type in expression as a uh, subgraph of our uh, metagraph and so on. Uh, we can have uh, variables here. And uh, uh, if we look uh, at this, uh, there will be uh, quite uh, uh, simple uh, typing rules, which uh, allow us uh, checking that uh, uh, this expression uh, uh, is a well-formed expression with uh, an overall type uh, list int uh, because uh, uh, int uh, uh, will be matched uh, against uh, type of uh, 10 and type of 5, uh, uh, while uh, this uh, expression uh, is not a well-formed expression. And uh, similarly, we can um, uh, construct uh, uh, more interesting uh, types like uh, the simplest uh, example of uh, uh, dependent type is uh, vect. Uh, so uh, it uh, it is a dependent uh, type which uh, takes uh, net and uh, some other type as uh, inputs and uh, kind of produce uh, some type as uh, output. Uh, once again, uh, it's really simple. So. Uh, there is uh, no uh, no magic uh, behind it. Uh, it's uh, uh, just a restriction uh, on uh, what uh, expressions uh, can be formed based on vector. So vector can take uh, an uh, a symbol or a, an expression of type net. So that uh, it's not written here. Uh, but uh, that uh, of type NAT. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, it can uh, take uh, a variable because it doesn't matter uh, what, uh, what uh, type uh, is here because nil doesn't uh, uh, take, uh, doesn't store a value of uh, any type. And uh, uh, cons uh, operation, uh, uh, we'll also have a certain uh, type signature. So uh, here we'll, we have uh, a variable, we have uh, vector key a, and as uh, an output, uh, they will be vector as key a. So it's a, a traditional uh, definition of uh, uh, the vector type, but uh, I would like to 
uh, underline once again, uh, there is no magic behind it. Uh, uh, it's uh, just a restriction of uh, uh, expressions we can construct. So then if uh, we take uh, uh, this expression, uh, we can uh, match uh, uh, types uh, of uh, its components. Uh, uh, five uh, will have uh, type A. Uh, a. A will be int. Uh, and uh, uh, then the overall, uh, uh, we will start uh, from nil. So uh, nil uh, will have type vector that A, where A is a, a free variable, not bound. Uh, then uh, uh, we consider this uh, uh, expression and uh, uh, its uh, first uh, argument uh, uh, has uh, type int, so a will be bound to int and uh, vector uh, k a will be bound to k will be bound to z. And uh, since a here and here are the same, then a here will also be int. And uh, the output uh, type of this expression will be just vector uh, as z uh, int. And uh, then uh, we can similarly uh, uh, understand what uh, type will be of uh, this expression and uh, it will be just uh, what, uh, what is specified. Uh, so, uh, the, an interesting thing that uh, uh, if we just uh, consider this uh, on uh, uh, as a pattern matching of uh, expressions, then type checking is just a chain pattern matching on the level of types of these expressions. And uh, actually, uh, we were considering the possibility uh, to implement types uh, just uh, uh, as uh, ordinary expressions and uh, just to use the very same uh, pattern matching over these expressions. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, but uh, it has some uh, non-convenient uh, sides, uh, like uh, uh, we, we need uh, to treat uh, types uh, specially uh, because we want them to be restrictions on expressions. Uh, uh, we want uh, them to be applied on uh, compile time or on time of adding expressions uh, to atom space uh, and so on. Uh, so uh, we consider this as a separate, uh, uh, a little bit separate uh, mechanism. Uh, okay, so we can have uh, queries uh, uh, that use types. We can. Uh, uh, say, uh, uh, have uh, some uh, expression and uh, we can uh, form a query uh, which will have a variable uh, in type because uh, these are just uh, expressions with uh, uh, sub-expressions and uh, uh, variables. So we can uh, apply the same mechanics here and uh, 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 it will work. Actually, uh, to uh, see that uh, it's uh, just a pattern mining, it's better to use a, a little bit uh, different uh, disugared uh, representation of an arrow type. And uh, basically, uh, this expression is uh, better to represent as this one. So uh, instead of uh, saying that uh, 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 con cons uh, operation has this uh, arrow type. Uh, it's uh, better uh, to say that uh, this expression uh, over this uh, cons uh, uh, operation, uh, the overall expression uh, will have this type. So uh, a bad thing that we need to, to explicitly indicate uh, uh, arguments here instead of uh, just specifying the types. Uh, so uh, it's uh, indeed a uh, syntactic sugar, uh, but uh, if we consider uh, this uh, desugared expression, then uh, it will be obvious uh, that uh, uh, this uh, 
expressions or graphs or how you call it uh, uh, can be matched. Uh, so uh, it will match, it will match, uh, five will be matched uh, with this expression. So uh, five itself will be matched with uh, arg1 and uh, uh, its type uh, hidden uh, inside uh, our uh, atom space will be matched. Uh, uh, int will be matched uh, with uh, a uh, arc uh, uh, yeah uh, nil uh, i will actually uh, because uh, yeah uh, Yeah, maybe it will uh, require some chaining uh, to do this. Uh, so we will need uh, uh, to uh, pattern match uh, nil against uh, this one. Uh, and uh, in the case of uh, types, uh, we might uh, want uh, to do this uh, chaining uh, as a insight uh, pattern match, not just uh, a return a conditional uh, matching results, which uh, I will describe a little bit later. Uh, but uh, in ge general, uh, uh, nil uh, uh, will be matched uh, against arc2. Yeah, it, it will be matched against arc2. And uh, yeah, a type of nil uh, uh, will be matched against this one. So K will be matched against Z and uh, yeah, and A will be bound already to int. So uh, we just uh, will uh, uh, get uh, len as uh, s uh, k where k is uh, bound to that. So yeah, it it will work. Uh, it will work uh, uh, like this. Uh, also, if uh, we will have uh, a, a little bit longer expression, then uh, it will be impossible to do without uh, chaining. Uh, so if uh, we uh, see that, then. Uh, in uh, the dependently typed uh, languages, uh, uh, we can do only uh, type checking. Uh, so we need uh, to uh, specify uh, types of uh, uh, variables or symbols and uh, to uh, specify the values uh, to uh, show that uh, uh, or in, in contrary, here we have uh, an expression and independently type languages, we will need to specify it type uh, uh, in order to, for it to be type checked. Uh, also, the order will be different. We will first specify type and then uh, specify the expression itself. Uh, but uh, in meta, we can uh, form queries uh, uh, where we can uh, uh, use variables uh, in place of uh, the type uh, uh, itself or uh, some components of uh, the type. And uh, actually, uh, since in the dependently typed languages, uh, types are propositions uh, and uh, providing an instance of uh, this type uh, uh, is uh, providing a proof of this proposition. So uh, this is a sort of uh, reasoning. Uh, but uh, we will uh, talk a bit a little bit later. It seems that um, I am too slow. Uh, okay, another thing that uh, uh, in Meta we also have a special uh, class or um, sort of symbols are grounded symbols. Uh, in uh, OpenCore Classic, uh, actually all built-in types of atoms uh, are grounded types. If we uh, take uh, number node or plus link uh, or concept node, uh, uh, they have uh, some uh, implementation behind them uh, in a grounded way. Uh, there is a grounded uh, predicate node as well and uh, ground schema node, uh, uh, which uh, allow us uh, for introducing uh, uh, custom grounded uh, nodes, uh, but uh, only for code. Uh, we introduced uh, grounded objects uh, uh, some time ago, but it's not a st standard uh, uh, 
component of open clock. In uh, Hyperon uh, Meta, all grounded symbols are added uh, using uh, the same uh, mechanism. So uh, symbols are either pure symbols, uh, which uh, we just uh, introduced uh, uh, in uh, the program uh, itself, uh, or they are uh, grounded. And uh, uh, th th there is an API, uh, for example, uh, to Python, uh, which allows introducing uh, grounded symbols uh, like uh, uh, floating point numbers, and uh, uh, we can uh, introduce uh, grounded uh, types uh, as well. So if we introduce a regular expression describing a class of symbols or uh, if we wrap up some uh, external objects of a certain type uh, we can uh, introduce uh, uh, a class of symbols uh, which we will which will have uh, also a grounded type so uh, um, summarizing a little bit uh, uh, what uh, I've been uh, talking uh, uh, for now, uh, atom space for Hyperon uh, is uh, just a container for symbolic expressions. Uh, uh, there are there can be different uh, implementations uh, for these containers. Uh, uh, they should be isomorphic, uh, uh, and uh, they should. Uh, uh, Satisfy a certain API, like uh, they can, they should support variables, grounded symbols. Uh, uh, they uh, should support uh, types as uh, restrictions on uh, allowed expression, and uh, most importantly, they should uh, support uh, static uh, unification or pattern matching. Uh, there are also ideas uh, on the extension of uh, this uh, API with uh, folding and unfolding, but uh, it's uh, beyond on my talk. Uh, so in order to make these uh, expressions uh, leave, uh, not uh, just uh, remain in atom space, but uh, to do something uh, useful, uh, we need uh, to introduce uh, one more concept, uh, it's uh, equalities. Uh, so uh, let's uh, consider motivation from functional programming. Uh, let's first consider uh, equal sign as just an ordinary symbol. So there is no additional semantics uh, uh, for this yet. And uh, let's uh, just uh, write down uh, function uh, definition as an ordinary expression. Uh, it uh, looks uh, like a function uh, in a uh, functional language, uh, but uh, uh, let it be just an expression. We can pattern match uh, against uh, this expression. We can uh, uh, form uh, such a pattern and uh, it will be matched uh, against this expression and uh, uh, we will uh, uh, get that uh, that is uh, plus to two. Uh, if we consider another example with uh, sum of uh, nets, uh, then we can uh, once again pattern match uh, some expression and ask uh, uh, to what uh, value or to what expressions should uh, that be bound in order to uh, pattern match uh, this expression against. Uh, uh, entries in our knowledge base or against uh, expressions uh, in our program. And uh, it uh, will really be uh, bound uh, to the desired uh, answer. Uh, in this example, it uh, works uh, because um, uh, it doesn't require, uh, uh, well, it, it does require further uh, interpretation. So we can see that uh, this is not uh, the final result. Uh, this is also not the final result, uh, but uh, it's uh, quite uh, uh, obvious that uh, if we chain uh, such uh, equality queries, then we actually uh, will get an evaluation of expressions uh, in uh, uh, functional uh, programming language styles. 
Uh, another motivation uh, uh, comes from uh, homotopy type theory. Uh, in it, uh, types are spaces. Uh, so uh, they have sort of uh, points uh, uh, as objects. And uh, uh, between uh, these points, there are paths, uh, which are formed uh, by, uh, by equalities. So, uh, the, uh, they distinguish uh, uh, judgmental uh, uh, equality and propositional equality. So propositional equalities uh, uh, are uh, such path. Well, uh, and uh, well, uh, we can uh, go further. And uh, 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 there are homotopies between paths. It's uh, quite uh, interesting from. Uh, the point of view that actually uh, propositions are types, uh, as uh, I mentioned, and uh, we can consider uh, proofs as uh, paths uh, uh, between uh, different propositions and so on. Uh, so I uh, showed one example uh, from uh, dependent uh, types and uh, uh, there is an equality. So uh, as uh, you can see, we defined uh, uh, an instance of uh, some type and uh, we uh, say that uh, yeah, it uh, should be equal to this one. So we provide uh, this path here actually, although it's a uh, uh, extremely simplified example. So it maybe not interesting, but I just wanted to show uh, here that uh, we also use equalities uh, uh, in these uh, settings uh, to provide uh, proofs uh, for some uh, for, for some propositions. Okay, so uh, in uh, meta, uh, we have uh, uh, equality matching as a basic uh, step, step of uh, uh, meta programs uh, interpretation. So imagine that uh, we have uh, some uh, simple pro program. We can uh, define a truth value as a dependent uh, type uh, from float to type. Uh, once again, uh, there is uh, no magic uh, uh, behind uh, these dependent types. It's uh, just an uh, restriction on uh, expressions which we can form with types. Uh, uh, we can define entities, type, uh, and uh, so on. Uh, and uh, then uh, we may want uh, to evaluate uh, uh, this expression. So evaluation uh, starts with forming a, a quality matching query. So uh, we ask our uh, knowledge base uh, if uh, we uh, could match this uh, expression uh, we, uh, if we if we put this expression in this query uh, will we be able uh, to find an appropriate match and uh, indeed uh, it uh, can be seen that uh, uh, here we have uh, equal Sign it here. We have and, uh, uh, but uh, here one problem: we don't, uh, we cannot uh, match uh, uh, this expression against this expression directly. So we need uh, to construct another path between these two expressions. So uh, we have to resort uh, to uh, conditional matching. So we say that uh, uh, we can match these two expressions if uh, these two expressions and these two expressions uh, can be unified as well. And uh, if they can be unified, then uh, uh, the result of uh, uh, this evaluation uh, will be a truth value of uh, mul multiplication of uh, uh, these uh, two values. Uh, well, actually, it uh, is not uh, necessarily uh, the best way to do things. Uh, 
uh, because uh, in our uh, form uh, prototype, we actually do a, a recursive evaluation rather than this conditional matching. So uh, we first uh, uh, try to construct paths uh, for sub-expressions uh, in a, a call by value manner. So we construct uh, uh, first queries uh, uh, to find out uh, uh, to which uh, this uh, sub-expression uh, can be e equal to. And uh, we will first uh, find out that uh, it uh, can be replaced with uh, uh, this expression. And uh, this one can be replaced with this one. And uh, after this, uh, this uh, whole expression with these replacements uh, can be matched uh, against this one. Uh, and uh, finally, we will get that uh, that uh, will be equal to TV multiply uh, out of uh, nine by out of seven. And uh, then uh, what uh, we need is uh, uh, to deal with uh, grounded symbols. Uh, if uh, this multiplication is defined as a grounded symbol. And uh, the whole uh, interpretation uh, step uh, uh, or process uh, consists uh, in uh, the following rules. If uh, we have uh, uh, non-functional grounded symbols, then we interpret them to themselves. If uh, uh, we have uh, uh, functional grounded symbols, uh, we first uh, evaluate the arguments uh, and then apply uh, grounded uh, uh, functions, grounded uh, code uh, uh, to the values of these arguments and uh, as a result. And for pure symbols, we construct uh, equality queries. So uh, while uh, grounded symbols are uh, evaluated uh, using the uh, underneath code uh, uh, for pure symbols, uh, we try to construct the grounded queries. If these queries are unsuccessful, then uh, this expression uh, is evaluated to them uh, to itself. Uh, so we don't uh, write an exception, a error, but uh, uh, we just say that uh, this expression is evaluated to the, itself. So if you have uh, some random a symbol, it will be evaluated to itself. If uh, we have uh, this expression, it will actually be evaluated to itself as well. So uh, when we start to evaluate uh, such uh, an expression, uh, we will get this one as we have already uh, seen for it. Uh, uh, this is the interpreter. A job. So it is done uh, not uh, in the pattern matcher, but uh, in the interpreter. Uh, when it uh, receives uh, the result of uh, equality query for uh, expression, it uh, uh, constructs the next equality query for the resulting expression. And uh, if uh, the equality query for the resulting expression is unsuccessful, it is uh, just returned. So uh, here we will uh, have uh, this result. Uh, match uh, is itself a grounded symbol. I didn't uh, I mention it, so we can just uh, directly execute uh, a pattern match uh, uh, for, for the given atom space, but uh, actually we can write uh, match expressions in atomies itself, in meta itself. So uh, when we write uh, down this uh, expression, and uh, evaluate it by the interpreter. It will not just uh, perform one uh, call, one uh, query to the pattern matcher, but it will chain them because uh, it's not uh, just a pattern match because it's interpreter. So uh, because it's a grounded uh, symbol, uh, uh, an equality query for it will not be constructed. So it will be uh, executed uh, directly. And uh, in, in this case, uh, uh, as you can see, uh, we can form uh, such uh, queries, uh, which uh, will basically uh, solve uh, some problems for us. Uh, so uh, in this case, uh, uh, we 
uh, can ask uh, what uh, should be added uh, uh, to uh, one to get two. And uh, uh, in case of uh, pure symbolic definition of nets and sum, sum uh, we will uh, get an, a proper result. Of course, if uh, uh, we would like to do this uh, not for pure symbols, but uh, uh, for uh, grounded symbols, then uh, we will uh, need a uh, uh, solver for them. So uh, if uh, uh, it uh, would be a plus and int uh, and uh, they would be grounded uh, symbols, uh, then uh, it would not be possible to do uh, without uh, additional support from them. Okay, so we can uh, do reasoning with types uh, in meta using uh, the very same mechanism. Mm. Uh, I will talk, I will say a few words uh, about this a little bit later, but uh, uh, basically we don't uh, insist uh, on the uh, typical uh, dependently typed languages interpretation of uh, uh, inhabitant types as uh, true. Uh, but uh, we rather can uh, uh, have uh, equalities, explicit equalities for them. Uh, so we can adjust, uh, uh, we can say that uh, human uh, Socrates is true. And uh, then uh, if we try to uh, evaluate uh, mortal Socrates, then uh, uh, it will be too simple in this case. Uh, uh, it will construct uh, a an equality query, uh, it doesn't matter if it types or other symbols. So it will just construct an equality query, uh, which uh, will be uh, pattern matched uh, against uh, this one. So uh, we will uh, bind X to Socrates and uh, the result of this uh, query will be uh, human Socrates and we will construct the next uh, equality query human Socrates equals to that and uh, uh, human Socrates will be uh, equal to true. So this uh, will be evaluated uh, to true in this case, but uh, uh, it's uh, not too interesting. Uh, uh, it uh, looks uh, too much like uh, just a functional uh, programming. Also, I would like uh, to say that uh, we could uh, uh, use variables here and construct much more interesting queries. Uh, but uh, the bad point is that it uh, doesn't have uh, proofs. So we will get just the result that uh, uh, mortal Socrates is true, but without proof. Uh, but uh, it's not a problem uh, also to uh, add uh, some uh, witnesses uh, to uh, these uh, types, uh, like uh, it is done uh, in uh, other dependent typed languages. And uh, uh, we can uh, uh, just uh, search for a proof using uh, the very same uh, uh, pattern, uh, chained pattern matching mechanism. Uh, so uh, in this case, uh, uh, maybe it's uh, not, uh, a little bit too long uh, example taken into account that I have already run out of time. Uh, so uh, in this case, uh, we will uh, be able to find uh, that uh, uh, the proof is uh, human is mortal, Socrates is human and as, a, uh, as an expression. Uh, it uh, uh, has some uh, pitfalls, but uh, in any case, uh, it, it can work. So uh, basically, uh, we can find, uh, we can construct proofs, not just to uh, verify proofs, but we can uh, construct proofs with uh, uh, this uh, chained uh, pattern matching uh, in uh, meta inter uh, interpreter. And uh, yeah, we can uh, actually add the uh, equalities uh, uh, for types uh, like here. We can uh, have uh, both uh, uh, witnesses uh, or 
uh, type instances uh, as witnesses, uh, like in uh, normal dependently type languages. And uh, we also can have uh, explicit uh, equalities. Uh, okay, so there is some uh, difference uh, between uh, meta and uh, uh, typical uh, dependency type languages. Uh, here I uh, use uh, uh, syntax uh, more similar to uh, one uh, used uh, in, uh, say, Idris, so it's Haskell-like syntax. Uh, uh, so the difference uh, will not be in syntax, but uh, uh, it will be conceptual. Uh, so basically, let's uh, start uh, defining uh, net type. So net is type. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, that as uh, its uh, constructor, we can uh, we have as uh, its, uh, its constructor similar to here, but uh, we don't have a special uh, uh, syntax to say that uh, it is type and these are its constructors. Uh, what's an interesting is uh, that uh, when we define a function, uh, then uh, uh, it has uh, the very same type as uh, Constructor. So, what is the difference between function and the constructor? In the meta, we don't uh, have uh, this uh, difference uh, uh, in an uh, explicit way. So, uh, when uh, we have just this code and uh, uh, we uh, try to write down this expression, then it will just re reduce to itself. Uh, while uh, in uh, dependently typed languages, uh, uh, it will say that uh, plus uh, is undefined, so it uh, doesn't have a body, it's not a constructor, so we need to define it. Uh, what uh, I would like to point out is that uh, uh, humans can uh, uh, construct expressions as expressions, so uh, plus uh, is... Uh, the very same uh, constructor of a, an expression as uh, S or Z. So uh, a small child uh, can use uh, plus or minus without uh, uh, being able uh, to uh, say uh, sum up uh, 10 and uh, 20, but being able to uh, make an addition of one and two. So uh, functions uh, can be specially defined uh, uh, and so on. So what we, we want uh, here is uh, to be able to gradually uh, define uh, uh, some stuff. And uh, uh, later we can add uh, some equalities. So uh, functions differ from uh, type constructors uh, just uh, uh, because uh, they have additionally defined equalities. Uh, there are also some uh, uh, pitfalls here uh, because uh, when we have uh, uh, an explicit separation between uh, constructors and functions and functions are total, uh, we can uh, do some stuff which, which is difficult uh, to do when uh, this separation uh, is uh, more blurry. Okay, so in any case, we are interested in a possibility uh, to incrementally add new expressions, new constructors. Uh, we would like to be able to add that, them at runtime without any problem. We can add uh, equalities uh, for uh, what we consider it as constructors before, and these equalities will uh, turn these uh, symbols, which we consider it as constructors, into functions. Uh, so we uh, all symbols are by default uh, sort of constructors. Uh, and uh, that's why we need uh, to explicitly uh, define variables, because uh, uh, here, if uh, something is not defined, uh, uh, it is considered as a variable, which uh, uh, should have some type which uh, should uh, uh, be equal to something or which uh, is a uh, uh, free variable or uh, etc. Uh, okay, so there is some conceptual difference which uh, we need uh, for 
knowledge-based systems, not just uh, programming. Uh, we can, uh, uh, what else uh, is different? We can uh, go further and uh, uh, define uh, paths in a uh, universe of types. Uh, so uh, we can just say that uh, uh, true is an instance of type. Uh, we, 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 we don't uh, have limitations on this. Uh, we can define and as a narrow type from uh, two arguments of type true to true, to, to, to type, and we can say that the uh, end true true is true. Or uh, alternatively, we can uh, define a TV as such, and uh, uh, we can uh, actually uh, have both of them because uh, we don't uh, insist on uh, uh, totality, so we don't uh, necessarily need uh, uh, to define uh, and from uh, TV uh, and true simultaneously and so on. Uh, so uh, we can uh, say that uh, we have equalities uh, between uh, types and uh, they are not necessarily uh, reduced uh, to uh, just mere propositional equality, like uh, everything is is true, true or false, is uh, is an uh, uh, empty set or inhabitant uh, set. So uh, we can, uh, in this sense, we uh, can uh, implement uh, homotopical notions uh, more freely in uh, comparison to dependent type languages. Uh, we can add uh, equalities uh, on uh, equalities uh, as well. So uh, this is a valid uh, expression. So because uh, actually uh, equal sign uh, has uh, uh, this uh, type uh, secretly, uh, the overall uh, expression will have type uh, type and we can uh, define instances of these types. Uh, if we want, we can say that uh, a raffle is true if uh, we wish, uh, uh, and so on. We can, uh, I don't know for what reason, but we can uh, say that uh, one equality is equal to another equality. And uh, we can uh, even add uh, some meta rules, which, uh, uh, for example, say that uh, if we have uh, some symbol of type type, uh, then if we try to evaluate this symbol, then if we find an instance of this symbol, then the result of evaluation will be true. Uh, so it, uh, is not it is not necessary to hard code this uh, in our uh, uh, language. Uh, we can uh, just uh, define this uh, in uh, meta. Uh, meta also has uh, non-determinism. Uh, uh, which is uh, somewhat uh, mm, questionable uh, uh, feature, but uh, uh, I personally find it uh, very nice uh, because uh, uh, we have been discussing uh, probabilistic programming uh, for OpenCock uh, for a long time, and uh, uh, basically such non-determinism uh, uh, is at the core of uh, uh, probabilistic uh, programming languages uh, because uh, uh, it uh, just adds uh, probability distributions uh, over non-determinism. Uh, so pattern matching can return mu multiple results uh, in the OpenCock classic and uh, uh, in uh, Meta as well. And uh, if uh, it can return uh, multiple results, uh, uh, we can just uh, get non-determinism, I would say nearly for free, but it's uh, not true because uh, uh, of course uh, there are difficult problems so like uh, exploding number of uh, uh, future results. So if we start uh, chaining non-deterministic uh, uh, queries, uh, uh, it uh, easily uh, overpopulates our uh, uh, in, interpreter memory and so on. So, uh, of course, uh, it uh, will not uh, work. It will not solve uh, hard problems uh, out of the box, uh, uh, but uh, it's a, a good feature as a, a very core element of more complex uh, 
uh, stuff like uh, uh, reasoning, uh, searching, uh, probabilistic programming, evolutionary programming, and so on. So last thing I would uh, like uh, to say is about uh, uh, grounded symbols. So they actually play a huge role in meta. It's not uh, just uh, a more uniform way uh, to introduce uh, uh, types of atoms uh, as an open clock, like number not, uh, word not, uh, or whatever, uh, uh, together with uh, grounded predicate nodes, grounded uh, schema nodes, and so on. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, it's a uh, uh, co-element to implement uh, many things like uh, uh, we have uh, a grounded uh, symbol uh, referring to the atom space uh, itself from very beginning uh, all, uh, all also it's not just one atom space uh, we have uh, a long uh, long term memory uh, which uh, stores uh, program itself and it is essential for uh, self-reflection, uh, self-referential stuff. We have uh, short-term memory atom space uh, in which uh, interpreter keeps uh, uh, its uh, interpretation targets, uh, which uh, are evaluated uh, uh, in parallel because uh, we have uh, non-determinism uh, uh, <laughs> in any case, and uh, we, we can... Uh, uh, just have multiple uh, uh, targets uh, for interpretation and uh, accessing this uh, atom space with this uh, int interpretation targets uh, can uh, provide both inference control or something uh, like uh, open psi uh, goal mechanisms uh, and so on. Uh, introduction of new symbols at runtime uh, is uh, inevitably uh, based on uh, grounded symbols. Uh, efficient number crunching if we need it uh, uh, for whatever we want, uh, matrix multiplication or so on. And in general, symbolic some symbolic integration, uh, which uh, uh, should be a part of uh, my speech, but uh, we don't have, uh, I, I, I even uh, didn't uh, hope to talk about it much. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, we sometimes will be able to compile some uh, inference uh, traces uh, uh, into an executable code and turn uh, uh, reasoning uh, into skills, uh, into crystallized skills uh, like uh, reflexes and so on, uh, but uh, we don't have uh, anything uh, concrete on this now. So I'm very sorry. I, I think that uh, we don't have uh, time for discussion, but uh, any discussion is welcome uh, online later. Thanks. No, no, we can. We are entering the Alexaverse. Hey, Alexei, Moshe here. Um, thanks you for uh, the talk. So, um, I was just wondering with the um, if, if if you ever hook this up to like a, a robot arm in a real or virtual environment, how does that play with non-determinism? If non-determinism is implemented using backtracking and like one of the branches wiggles the finger this way and one of them wiggles it that way it's, or do you have any kind of side so we need a, we need a quantum computer to rewrite the multiverse yeah. ah well that, that that's one solution <laughs> yeah. um, are there any others well uh yeah it's uh, an interesting question uh i believe uh non-determinism in this uh, sense uh, uh, should be limited uh, to reasoning uh, at, for considering uh, multiple uh, uh, options, uh, multiple actions, uh, 
uh, in uh, imagination, uh, but uh, when it uh, comes down to certain uh, decisions, uh, they are unfortunately uh, should be deterministic. <laughs> Okay, but that that distinction is so, so you're, that distinction then is um, is outside of the um, the type system proper. That's a distinction in the minds of the human programmers that are wiring. No, this no, thing up. I, I don't think so. So, I mean, but the, does the type system prevent you from um, using non-determinism um, over things that have side effects and? Um, if it doesn't right now, is there a plan to do that, or is that just something that the human programmer will have to? I mean, care you'd of? have to, you'd have to make a type or a label for things for things that have side effects and can't be made non-deterministic. But uh, but the non-determinism. <laughs> but the non if the non-determinism is um a language level feature it's not something that's defined in terms of the language um how, you're, then you're going to need to change how non-determinism works could you explain briefly just in like uh, two seconds two sentences what you mean by non-determinism we can't hear let's until i do that until i have Well, let's let Alexa answer Moshe's question first. I'm happy. Well, uh, regarding uh, non-determinism uh, in uh, type systems, uh, uh, well, it's mute, please. Well, it's uh, maybe a question uh, for for right formalization of. Uh, uh, meta language, uh, which is uh, kind of uh, not uh, precisely done, uh, but uh, uh, first of all, uh, we can allow uh, non-determinism even uh, for types, uh, whatever it means mathematically. Uh, also, I would like to say that uh, actually types are themselves non-deterministic in the sense uh, of uh, uh, wh when you provide a type uh, as a symbol, yeah, uh, you can mean that uh, it uh, uh, can correspond to any of its instances. So when you are reasoning about types, you are reasoning uh, about uh, all possibilities uh, at once. Uh, so uh, we can uh, consider sampling uh, from types uh, as a normal process, uh, if you wish. Um, but, but yeah, I, I guess if if we consider the simple case Moshe is asking about. So if we, I mean, if if we have an atom that that's grounded in move the robot arm up, right? Then then we need a way to tell the interpreter that once you've moved the robot arm up, you can't backtrack that and un undo the fact that you have moved the robot yeah, arm exactly. up. I, I, don't, I don't see a problem with explicitly encoding that in the, the formal language that, that's being used the, the question is is really then how how is that how is that constraint or, or label used in the type checking and uh, in, inheritance mechanisms and everything which which i guess is what alexei meant when he said that that depended on how the how the language is being formulated in in meta or are constructed like I, I don't I don't know if that's a a basic interpreter feature or if that's an aspect of some formal language that's built that's built within within the interpreter. Yeah, I would say the select. So indeed, I agree that uh, this uh, say collapse of uh, the wave function uh, uh, should be coded uh, in method. right. But in a, there's that. There, there is a difference between something you can backtrack on and something you can't 
you can't backtrack home without backtrack, qu quantum multi. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you, 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 you're not. Okay, well, so there's a punch motion in the face mode. Yeah, right? you can't backtrack that. <laughs> but they, but the, it's the side of like persists. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, but uh, I mean, uh, I, I removed this uh, slide. Uh, you you can just uh, have uh, uh, a formulation of uh, optimization problems as non-deterministic programming. So, like uh, uh, you just uh, sample uh, all. Uh, uh, possible uh, solutions uh, and uh, condition them uh, uh, on a desired uh, outcome. So it will be a choice uh, you want to make. Uh, the question is how efficient uh, this uh, sampling uh, or inference be, but uh, I don't see a pro conceptual problem here. Uh, the, the question is just one of clarity regarding where non-determinism is used and where determinism is, is assumed and sort of at, at what at what level is that is that specified in, 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 in the in the framework basically I mean it's clear you it's clear you can specify that. Okay, sorry once again for <laughs> Uh, not uh, leaving time for questions, but uh, maybe we can move on for to the next talk. Yeah, I think I think we we, we have time for more questions if there are any, because I think what's next is Matt and Matt's what Matt's going to talk about is a little bit less involved and briefer than this. So there's a there there. There, there is more time if, if there are more questions. I think this is what Alexei has just presented is also quite complex and in, in, involved. And in I mean, it, it really is a it's a summary of a lot of design thinking and, and mathematical thinking in, that's sort of packed packed into this language design. So I'm I, quite curious for deeper feedback on this. But I think if that were my first time seeing it, I would need to spend several hours like reading it and thinking about it and then and then formulating questions. So I, I will be happy to have folks look look this over afterwards and, and come back with various questions on, on it. I, I think uh, as a meta, comment on, on meta here. I mean, in, in, <laughs> I had, had to be said, right? Yeah. In, the, in the long time I've been working in AGI, I had actively resisted the urge to design new programming languages. I mean, since in, in, uh, in 1993, 94, when I first discovered Haskell, I started trying to implement what I would now think of as probabilistic depend, dependently typed languages in Haskell and just gave a bunch of stack overflows and, and, and problems. But I, you know, on reflection, I realized like many times in the history of AI, people have trouble building AGI and they're like, if I had the right language, it would be easier. And then 20 years later, they've done a lot of language research. and. Uh, I mean, Moshe, you remember me saying that to you in like 2001 or yeah. three or something, right? Yeah. So now, 20 years later, I've finally reached the point where I wanted to bite the bullet and, and partake in designing, a, designing an AI, AI language. And I think coming at it now, we have a lot of stuff we've been experimenting with in OpenCog system. And it's a pretty it's pretty clear there's a number of things that we've wanted to do that will be a lot easier in this language than, than they ha they have been and that that may not be apparent from the exposition but if you think about it more then it, it becomes a little, a little clearer so i mean meta reasoning is one thing sort of re reasoning about reasoning which takes the form of sort of analyzing 
analyzing the history of your inference process and figuring out how to choose your inference steps better. But also, Alexei had a paper a couple of years ago on learning new PLM inference formulas, and you want to learn new inference rules. So if you if you get into meta reasoning on that level, this the current OpenCog framework is awkward for that the way it's implemented. The meta framework would be very nice for a reasoning system that was engaged in learning new inference rules and formulas as well as learning new inference control heuristics and similar issues are there in in automated program learning. I mean when you're doing automated program learning the ease of learning a program depends greatly on what language you have assumed. I mean if you, look, if you build merge operation in your language you can you, you can learn a merge sort program relatively easily and then you can, if you want to get recursion, you decide you have fold or Y combinator. Or what 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 are you, what are you using? So you you come to the conclusion. The problem you really have is one of sort of co-evolving or co-learning the representation language and the programs in that representation language. And to some extent, that distinction is a bit arbitrary. But then again, meta should be a very nice framework for that sort of learning, where you're learning programs and learning the primitives in which the programs are expressed in a sort of cooperative way. And the, the other thing that was more the work of Alexei Vitaly and, and his team is they did a bunch of work using neural net models trained in, in, in Torch and referring to them with nodes in OpenCog atom space and sort of building a mapping between the Torch computation graph and the relation between the grounded, grounded uh, schema nodes in, inside OpenCog. But get, getting that sort of interoperation between deep neural models, including compositionally structured ones, and then at corresponding atoms in, inside atom space. Again, this was just coming out awkward in terms of the particular combination of languages and tools in OpenCog. And I think this, this will be much cleaner to do in, in meta language framework. So the, the, I mean, that language presented as a language design has to be a sort of clean set of abstract mechanisms. But the reason why I think it's a good idea to put work into building new interpreters and languages is because we have this whole bunch of specific things that we have been playing with with the, with the previous OpenCog system. And not, not seeing that we couldn't do them with the previous OpenCog, nor that you couldn't optimize the OpenCog classic incrementally to do the things we want. I think, I th I think, you, I think you could. I just think it's going to be dramatically easier in terms of both development time to make to implement things and development time to make the system scale up to the degree that we want. I think I think it's going to be going to be easier if we take take this direction and make it a custom language. So I think Adam Adam Vandervoort had some questions as he says in chat. So let's uh, let's go to Adam's question. Can you hear me all right? Um, so well, one question uh, I had actually before this talk was um, how would it efficiently do something like uh, integer multiplication? And if it can do something, if it cannot do something like that efficiently, um, how can it leverage uh, other tools or um, other like black boxes that can do that can be used as a calculator or as a as a solver or um, whatever to do the the low level calculation. Yeah, I mean the yeah, plan. The plan. <laughs> the plan is clearly not in practice to use PNO arithmetic to do to do every, 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 everything. So yeah, in a in a sense, integer arithmetic and floating point math and so on will, will be done via black boxes where you, you have a formal model of what, what algebra they're doing, but then the, the multiplication operator can be grounded in terms of some ex external code that's doing fast, fast multiplication. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, I would like uh, to add that uh, uh, it's not the whole story because uh, 
for these grounded operations, we can uh, still have uh, some uh, declarative knowledge, uh, uh, like uh, associativity or whatever. Uh, so, uh, uh, as I mentioned uh, at the very end, uh, uh, it, it would be also nice uh, in future to be uh, able to uh, specialize in terms of uh, photomoral torchian projections. Uh, uh, some uh, uh, meta uh, interpretation processes of a particular parts of metagraph or program uh, into uh, some another code. So uh, code in another language, it's uh, the sort of compilation or su super compilation. Uh, and uh, uh, in this case, we will have both uh, quite a complete uh, picture of uh, of what uh, this uh, uh, grounded uh, code is doing or compiled code is doing. Uh, and uh, it will be fast, uh, but uh, of course we don't uh, have uh, uh, such a tool now, but uh, in principle, uh, we can uh, just uh, have uh, grounded uh, uh, types uh, like uh, integers, uh, grounded operations over them, and uh, also have uh, some formal specification, some declarative knowledge uh, for reasoning about them. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it would, it would be, it would actually be a feasible but useless research project to super, <laughs> super compile the meta PO arithmetic code for multiplication and super compile that to get and get efficient code for, for, for multiplying. I mean, we, we did much more complicated things than that with the, with the Java supercompiler dec decades ago. But there, there are other cases. I mean, that, that's useless because multiplication is straightforward and you might as well just, just, just refer to C code or Rust code for multiplying, right? But there, there, there's going to be other cases where it's actually not useless to have something learned in meta and have a supercompiler sort of pa package it up and, and make it more more efficient and it should that should be should be quite interesting to uh, explore and yeah I mean Alexa and I have both had a bunch of interaction with the teams in Russia doing super compilation for some time and they're still going with a uh, refile version six and super compilation uh, actually so that there is a whole body of knowledge there that could be ported nicely into the the meta universe when the when the time comes but Probably won't be our first approach to implementing uh, integer and floating point multiplication. No. Yeah, I would like to add uh, one thing that uh, it uh, should not necessarily be super compilation. It uh, could be a neural network that uh, uh, approximates uh, some uh, uh, chaining into forward uh, calculations on uh, neural levels. Uh, uh, to, to a certain extent. So uh, it uh, once again can be uh, done uh, uh, to a certain extent right now. Uh, and uh, we, we, maybe we will end up with uh, uh, training uh, deep neural skills uh, uh, based uh, on uh, uh, the as, uh, e examples provided uh, by uh, this uh, meta interpretation. A uh, slower process. Yeah, I mean, I just I saw a paper by someone recently. They figured out they can do matrix multiplication faster by nearest neighbor matching. So I mean, uh -huh. you're, you're like caching the results of every possible multiplication and then doing approximate multi matrix multiplications. So, I mean, that, there's a lot. There's a lot. What size matrix? Pretty big. Yeah. What? It's, an, it's there's there's a lot of ways to optimize things actually. Yeah. Okay. Compu big computers uh, let you get away with a lot.
Okay, so other questions? Uh, there is uh, rice. Yeah, let, let me use my microphone, which works. And try, try again. Hi, Sam Alexander here. I have a technical question, which is if an expression is undefined, then I understand that it returns itself if it's evaluated. Now, my question is, can you have a, an expression which has an undefined expression as a sub-expression, but is itself nevertheless defined? Uh, well, if uh, it's uh, not a grounded uh, uh, function uh, which uh, expects uh, uh, not uh, just an, ex uh, an expression uh, with a certain uh, derived type, uh, but uh, uh, it uh, expects uh, the type uh, value of its type itself, then uh, yes, it's possible uh, in principle. Sure, it's just, just like uh, the following phrase of this sentence is meaningless. Gobble, 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 gobble. Or, mean, the, the, whole thing, the whole thing has a meaning, but that subset doesn't. Or, or like, I know gobble, 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 which is false. Even though gobble, 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 gobble itself is undefined. Well, you may not know. I know gobble, 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 gobble. Yeah. Uh, well, gabba, gabba, gabba is quite different than gobble, gobble, gobble. gobble. I mean, there's really no comparison. Uh, quick question. Yeah. Quick question on the interpreter. Uh, so you have this running as an interpreter so far, or is it just? Um... We do have a we have a we have a partial implementation of the interpreter, which is being built in in Rust by uh, Vitaly Bogdanov, another another of Alexei's colleagues. We we expect to have. He's just now adding the type types actually, but okay. we expect to have something to have fun with by the uh, by by the end of the year. But there's still some more basic implementation to do. So for, for each instantiation of the interpreter, each time you run, so suppose you have two interpreters running on your computer. Um, when you add, uh, when you assert an expression to your knowledge base, for lack of a better term, uh, the, is each interpreter looking at the same thing or is each interpreter, does each interpreter have their own isolated knowledge base at this point? Well, uh... Uh, it's um, more the question uh, to the di distributed uh, or shared uh, uh, yeah. atom space, and uh, uh, I believe uh, it is uh, possible uh, uh, to do this uh, in principle right now using, uh, say, uh, classic uh, atom space uh, as a backend because uh, it supports uh, uh, now, uh, but. Uh, uh, I would say that uh, it's not a question uh, for the interpreter, <laughs> but uh, for way. the atom okay. space. You could, have, you could have each interpreter use its own local atom space, or, or they could, they could sure. intersect on, 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 the, on the shared atom space. And, I mean, what, what's so how being... How is he designed it so far? That's my only how is he designed, or how is he playing with it right now? I mean, the way... The, how is it going? It, it, it's, it's, it's implemented now so that the prototype meta interpreter interacts with a, a good old classic open cog atom space by, okay. by a certain a certain API. If you had if you were running two meta interpreters now on the same machine, yeah, they could both talk to that same classic atom space if, if they if they wanted to. We just haven't since basically. It's one guy developing the interpreter at the moment. He has had no reason to run multiple interpreters in the same atom space, okay. unless he just got bored. Right. Yeah. Adam, did you have another question? Yeah. Um, so I understand that uh, at the moment um, you're trying to lift as much as possible into the language to, well, make it more meta and uh, more flexible. So your uh, match statements um, can also be defined in the language itself. And uh, the types are like quite close to um, being fully um, matched in the language itself, if I understood it correctly. Um, 
and I have a, a couple of questions like is a self-hosting interpreter one one of the things you're uh, you're looking into and the second one is um, if if you have all these statements uh, in in meta or like grounded and constructed in um, meta how do you uh, import and match uh, statements and black boxes from other languages within that? And will that be a core feature of the meta language to, to make this uh, bridge between the, the perfect self-hosting meta world and uh, the rest of the um, software ecosystem? Hmm. I, I'm not sure. I precisely understood uh, questions. Uh, so basically, if we are talking about uh, uh, metasexual uh, interpreters, uh, it's uh, not a goal. And uh, actually, uh, I'm not uh, precisely sure if uh, such uh, interpreters uh, are a sort of a hack like uh, uh, you can have uh, an interpreter uh, in a schema in just uh, calling a val. Uh, so uh, it's uh, not uh, really uh, what you want. Um, and uh, in any case, we have uh, some uh, metalinguistic uh, symbols we refer to external pattern matching uh, capabilities implemented in the atom space. So I'm not uh, uh, quite sure if I need uh, to think about it more to what extent uh, uh, we want, uh, if I understood your question correctly, uh, we want uh, to be able to implement uh, meta in meta, uh, what uh, exercise, uh, what will this exercise give us? Uh, regarding uh, uh, interoperability with different languages, uh, uh, it's actually quite uh, cool that uh, in the OpenCock Classic, uh, uh, we have uh, these uh, capabilities to uh, embed uh, uh, code from other languages to uh, atom space, and uh, this uh, feature may be uh, is not uh, completely used to full extent. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, in meta, it uh, will be even more uh, used and it's uh, really a, a sort of basic uh, feature for neural symbolic or just uh, symbolic sub-symbolic uh, integration because many are running examples uh, are uh, related uh, to, to this. Uh, so maybe yes, although once again, <laughs> I'm not sure that I completely understand your question, but yes, it's uh, one of uh, the main features. Yes, that, that indeed answered my question. Thank you. Um, well, one follow-up maybe though, um, if, you're, uh, if you're looking into this uh, interoperability, um, can, can, can we expect this in the language itself or will this something that um, you define, for example, in the other language where you, where you interoperate, for example, from Rust, implement certain traits that uh, make it uh, available and well-behaved in the meta language or, um, yeah, in contrast to what you would normally do, uh, have uh, statements in meta or um, a library in meta that's, that allows for the interoperability. Well, this uh, works uh, in both ways. Uh, so uh, we have uh, APIs in uh, other languages like uh, uh, Rust, C++, Python, uh, so uh, we can uh, embed uh, meta code uh, in them. Uh, and uh, uh, we have uh, 
uh, a library of uh, grounded uh, types uh, and symbols uh, uh, which uh, are implemented in other languages uh, and uh, can be uh, used in Meta. Cool, thanks. All right, I All think right. we should uh, move on to the next uh, speaker then, who is face-to-face uh, -face here in the uh, Palo Alto uh, Singularity Base Camp. So this is a continuing, continuing with the theme of uh, OpenCog Hyperon-related stuff. Matt Eclay is gonna talk a bit about the some new design approaches to creating a distributed open cog atom space. So I mean the conceptual slash engineering problem being solved here is if you have a very large knowledge metagraph, say a graph, hypergraph metagraph, a big big collection of nodes and links and a bunch of linkages, too big to fit in RAM on your machine and needing a lot of processing from a whole lot of different processors. Like how, how do we want to keep this, how do we want to store this large metagraph across many machines in a way that lets you collaboratively do processing across, across many machines? And of course, when, when we first started with OpenCog, or the, in 2008, let alone when the first code that became OpenCog was written in 2001, like there was, there was no Neo4j, there, there was no T-graph, like we, we didn't have a whole industry of, of graph databases. And we also have a persistent solution for OpenCog now, which uses Postgres database written by Linus Vepstas, which has this sort of hub and spokes architecture where you can have a Postgres based atom space and then a bunch of smaller atom spaces accessing the Postgres pers persistent store. But when we dig in detail into the requirements of what we really want for the next stage of development, which is trying to actually use OpenCog Hyperon to really build general thinking machines. When we when we look at what our requirements are there, it seems neither existing tools like a Neo4j or a DGraph will do what we want, nor is the current Postgres or RocksDB backing stores for OpenCog Classic quite what we want. And so we, we went through a fairly lengthy design and thinking process to try to figure out what, what really can, can work here. And uh, Andre Senna, who leads Singularity Net's Brazil office now, who actually wrote the first version of OpenCog's Atom Space in 2001, the Atom Space for Novamente Cognition Engine. So Senna was the one who first uh, inflicted the first version of the current Atom Space on us. So it seemed, seemed uh, appropriate that he, he is, is the one to sort of uh, mastermind the, the design for the distributed portion of the OpenCog Hyperon uh, knowledge system. And I'm, I'm sort of uh, filibustering here while, while Matt tries to get his, uh, his laptop connected to the projector. <laughs> he, I, think he, I think he's got it. Thanks to, <laughs> thanks to uh, Gabriel Axel, our... Uh, Neuroscience slash HR slash uh, IT expert. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah, take, take, so this is largely Senna's design thinking, but it's 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 building on a lot of uh, a lot of uh, discussions among many of us in Singularity Net and OpenCog community. Uh, Matt Matt is going to. Uh, present and Senna from our Brazil office is uh, lurking in the background and can help answer any super in-depth uh, technical questions regarding parts of the design he, he understands best. So yeah, 
take it away, Dr. Eclair. That rhymes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, this is actually primarily uh, Senna's work, and they, uh, it's, uh, and in a certain sense, it's it's not the same sort of complexity, but in, it's brilliant in in certain ways in its simplicity. So, I I. That I was I muted when I said that. No, 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 no. You were you were fine. So, so we've been you know uh, Ben and uh, well Alexei talked a lot about Meta, which is um, a replacement, a proposed replacement for Atom Space or Atom. Really, for for Atom Atomies. Which is a weird amalgam of scheme with Atom Space API right. goals. And it's and, and it's meant as an interface to the knowledge base, which is called the Atom Space. And um, it's the our open cog hypergraph knowledge base. Um, there are a few main reasons we have the atom space. It, it allows us to represent a whole bunch of different AI algorithms in a common framework, even though they, the algorithms can have very different uh, representations, APIs, completely different dynamical formalisms. But they, if that, the, the, the thinking behind the atom space is to allow all of these uh, different AI algorithms, um, whether it be um, reasoning algorithms, evolutionary algorithms, and so on, to work on the same data um, sets. Um, and that really enables easier matching, calling of algorithms, um, uh, leads to better meta-learning. Um, it recognizes patterns and rule combinations and solving complex problems. Um, and um, I could go into the actual architecture of the atom space, but that's not the point here. So what's also been discovered, uh, discussed is our, our kind of next generation of, of OpenCog, which we've uh, labeled Hyperon. Um, and underlying this are some uh, conceptual ideas based upon, uh, and you, you heard Alexei talk about uh, types in computer languages. Um, and a lot of this is predicated on the idea of, of some new math foundational mathematics called homotopy type theory, um, based on the, some recent uh, connections between homotopy theory and mathematics and, and type theory in, in more the computer science domain. So you can think of it as a new foundation. Um, it's an alternative uh, to some classical set theory in mathematics. Coupled with this has been a long time need for a distributed atom space um, in OpenCog. Um, if you were to go to the OpenCog um, wiki, you would see it's littered with past attempts at solving this issue. So I, 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 this combination of, of homotopy type theory um, and the meta language, um, I think really prepares us as the time, as the time to, to follow through on this. So the question um, comes up, how to implement a distributed atom space? So the atom space is not a simple database, um, but the, we've investigated using various graph databases in the past um, because 
so we don't have to deal with creating our own, uh, rolling our own, so to speak, uh, distributed persistence architecture. Um, so in the er er earlier this, yeah, just a few months ago, we hired an expert uh, in GraphDB, uh, Matthew McNeely, to investigate the possibility of using GraphDB uh, for this. Um, we had previously looked at some other approaches in, like such as Neo4j. So McNeely made a few recommendations, um, which are up on um, the screen here, um, that most so dgraph Neo4j define predicates pretty straightforwardly, subject, predicate, object, there was no support for hypograph properties directly. Um, and what's called for is there is a distributed uh, key value store as well as a distributed cache. He pointed out he think that he thought two candidates that should be considered were both MongoDB and, and Redis. So these are just a few of the prop, uh, good, pro, uh, nice properties of MongoDB, um, distributed documented order oriented DB. We'll come back to that. Flexible sharp, sharding, a lot of development in the past, open source. Similarly, Redis has a number of advantages as well. Again, open source having been under development for a number of years. He made some additional recommendations. Um, I, I'm, I wanna really kind of fast forward more to what Senna saw in, in looking at this, which is to actually use both MongoDB and Redis as the backend database and, and you might ask why so if you if you look at the two databases the the indices used in both of those are uh completely different and this allows for different types of queries to take place so mongodb is based on a structured document index which is very efficient at matching subgraphs and subgraph patterns uh, Redis, on the other hand, uses a key value store, which is better for graph traversal. So some obvious comments here. That means we were duplicating everything. We are having two, sep two, two databases that have to be maintained with the same information. Uh, which is an obvious kind of the classical computer science problem of you uh, no free lunch. You trade one problem for another. You, you're duplicating space, but your uh, your time efficiency is improved remarkably. Right? Uh, knowledge store will obviously take longer because you have to store everything twice, um, but retrieval will be faster. So some so tying together with what Alexei just presented. Um, so here's an, some simple examples of meta expressions as MongoDB documents. Possesses Sam Balloon has a head of possesses and arguments Sam and Balloon. Um, we can take this further to another level possesses Sam blue balloon. Again, you have the head possesses argument Sam. And then the second argument is has head blue and argument balloon. So there are a few issues here. Um, expressions may overlap. Um, so we might need to store several copies of the same information. Um, MongoDBs have a special field ID, which is used as a unique identifier. 
Um, and we're going to make use of that ID to make references to other documents. Um, so here's kind of more the the, the typing. Um, so we're right. We can set object as a type color as a type, balloon as an object, um, blue as a color. Um, and so we can have some kind of root level or zero airy documents um, represented. So for example, so we're, we're starting off with say ID one, type is unspecified, is it's a root. Uh, and the name is type. And we do the same thing for color. ID two, um, type one, uh, it's, a, it's a root, the name is color, and, and so on uh, for object. Um, then we can now also create documents relating to symbols. So um, here we have uh, the name possesses. Uh, we can also create a, a document for Sam, ID five, um, another root. Uh, blue is uh, now it's ID two or color. Um, and balloon is uh, type or type two, balloon is type three. So if you uh, went back, um, I think there was the types there. Um, questions so far? Did you explore web ontology stuff, triple scores, RDF, owl languages? Because this has all been around for ages and ages. This is the whole semantic web thing. This is reinvention of that. Yes. None of this rings a bell. Oh, it does for me. Not, uh, not that I'm saying it doesn't need reinvented. The whole thing is a garbage heap and needs to be completely swept away and reinvented. So you're, you're doing golf work. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I'm pretty sure we did. Um, I, I said as so this is as I say this is I, I'm basically um, yeah is is Andre here yes Matt I'm here because this is mainly Andre's work so is he on you have to check on the online chat possibly I'm not sure I mean uh, it's we're after you and the uh, Neo Four J or triple store variants. I think that. Oh no, he's not. Oh, he's oh no, that's too. Yeah, so... No, not not that I'm endorsing any of those. So yeah, right, no, I mean. It's terrible. Yeah. They're, but, they just said something but, terrible. Is it terrible? But, but what? So they just said that the, your yeah, video is not showing up, which doesn't make sense too. because it's saying it's sharing. <laughs> but um. Who's saying it's not showing it's someone up? Someone in the chat. I I find uh, I go for a when it's in the machine. The camera oh, isn't working. Yeah. Yeah, guys, the uh, the camera is not coming through. Basically. So jump in there and do this work for you. Don't worry about that. Just. Shouldn't worry about that. No, I mean I'm I'm almost certain we we've, we've looked at that. Well, I didn't mean to derail things. I mean, just to ignore the question. <laughs> so Zedebi said, um, just never mind, it just continue, it's fine. Sure, okay, yeah. Was it the camera or is it the screen sharing that's not working? She could hear you, I think, so maybe she can answer. Right. Oh, uh, so you need to see Matt's face, but you can see the screen, right, Ivy? Okay, great. Yeah, it's just your 
You. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me Vince's see. camera's here, here, on here. a different laptop, here, 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 right? right? It's interesting. Yeah. What, what could could can you flip Ben's laptop to face this way? It'll it'll, it'll be on. Yeah. Yeah, that's the laptop with the webcam. Right. Can you see us now? Can you see Matt now? Great. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, this camera not showing up. Yeah, I mean, we I know we've looked at Al quite a bit, but but I'm not. I'm trying to think in this context. So, Bolden. great. Get out of there. Excellent. And I don't know where Andre is. So. So I'm not sure, should I just go on and we can come back to that for? Uh, just that it, these storage of these predicate objects, subject things is something that people have done a lot of work on. Not right. very good work. I, uh, right, but the, my opinion, uh, opinion but. <laughs> I think it was determined early on if that just wasn't enough. Yeah, I think that's yeah. I mean, be, see the what if you for retrieval we want to match graph patterns as well as actually filling in variables. Yeah, yeah. They, I mean, they have a whole language for this. It's called sparse language. But uh, like I said, it, it's not very good. So maybe the takeaway is if you guys manage to do a good job of it, maybe you can go replace all of their technology. That's the bonus. The curiosity I have though, what I mean, if you're joining MongoDB and what was it? Redis, Redis. Why not also have, I mean, other things too. What, why do you just stop there? Well, it's because, I mean, at a certain point, you and I'm sure Andre uh, will be able to address some of these questions at, at, at the end. Um, but you're basically. Pardon? The return on investment is not, not there. Well, and also you're, you're doing these two sorts of searching, of, of trying to match the, the, the patterns in, in two different, different ways in the hypergraph. So you're matching the pattern of the, the graphs and the subgraphs, as well as the actual variable values and the graph traversal at the so each bottom query level. Does both queries? Um, it, it can do both. So queries should be flexible to do both of those. Um, perhaps that makes it a little bit clearer. I don't know. I mean, it seems like the they're uh, accomplishing two different things. If you want a macroscopic or microscopic view, you know, you're getting two different versions of it. And that's why that, I think that's the idea of having two different databases for those two different views, rather than strictly the subgraph pattern matching or strictly the graph traversal. Um, by combining those, you're getting the advantage. Yeah, obviously, as I said, there is space duplication, um, but you're getting the retrieval and the matching uh, of this two kind of step process, because it really is a two step process where you typically need to match both the pattern as well as uh, matching at the child level, the, the variable. Um, so, so two possible approaches um, for overcoming um, the, sorry, I have to back up here a bit. If I go back. Uh, 
Oops, did I miss? I kind of got. I, there was, I thought there was a slide maybe I missed. Okay. I um, thought there was something. It had to do with um, overlap, and I, I couldn't find that. But so a couple, oh, maybe that's coming. Uh, a couple ways to generate the ID, uh, unique identifier for these different. Um, uh, documents is, you know, using some sort of hash like MD5 or, or SHA, um, which includes all the, the fields and subfields in that document as we went through it, um, and includes the prior IDs of the, the and ideas of the embed, embedded documents. Uh, this is more efficient, but it can lead to collisions. Of course, if the collisions don't happen that often, it's going to be be fine. Uh, the less uh, recommended route would be a unique identifi identifier uh, to keep a translation table. But again, if as long as the collisions are at a low frequency, uh, that would be better. Um, <clears throat> so as, as we go through um, the interpreter, um, creates uh, a set of lookup tables uh, that can be back-ended by key value database like Redis. Um, some things we need to keep in mind is that all documents that, that mention directly a given document ID, um, we need to keep at a minimum, at a minimum all documents that mentioned by a, by a given document in its key fields. Um, documents that mention directly or indirectly a given document ID or and then recursively mentioned by a given document and, and all the documents in their uh, key fields. So this is an example of what some tables um, could look like. And I guess we'd have to go back to see how that matches. So um, for table, uh, I thought I, I'll, I, I, I'm just flummoxed. Mm -hmm. Looking for visual. Trying to. So uh, we, I guess there was this uh, this example, and I'm trying. Um, so I, I'm trying to remember. It possesses Sam blue balloon. Pardon. Wasn't it before? Okay. There's so. Um, key one, four, key two, five, eight. It goes with ID nine. And then um, I 
six, seven goes with ID eight. So uh, the, if you can see that works there, key one is six, because key one six is blue, key one seven is balloon, and uh, that's ID eight, and that's the lookup table. Six and seven are connected with ID eight and so on. And you could go through the different tables and so on. Um, <clears throat> we can also create relationship representations. So these are arrow type expressions or links between um, atoms. And so in a hypergraph, you can have an atom can be both uh, a node as well as a link. So you can have links between nodes and links between links and links between nodes and links. Um, so in a relationship, um, so you can have relationships has color, object can have a, a color. So that can be specified as the relation type has color. Um, we also then introduce variables um, and um, so that can be again a type variable uh, with a symbol uh, and then we have the equals symbol um, and a variable X which has a type and a symbol. So um, in that example, um, a, a variable um, has a symbol can, which can be a particular key. Um, yeah. Um, so a some comments about um, some caching strategies, and, and this is going to lead, and I, I'm probably didn't do this well, but um, lead to some of the concluding remarks. And this has to do with locality um, quite a bit and, and, and context. So, um, the, the good cash hierarchy and load balance policies would need to be driven by contextual locality. Um, it's going to have to be coupled with the underlying um, database caching and load balancing policies. Uh, and we need to consider caching and load balancing in order to explore them popular uh, properly. Uh, and, and use contextual based hints of information to keep closer to the application. Um, the point is that even in this approach, we're gonna have to customize our knowledge bases according to the application we need to run. Um, it's, it's not a, a one size fits all, it's uh, basically that you get, um, you can use context to to um, to help with traversing and pattern queries. Um, I guess I'll leave it there and um, leave it to Andre if if he's here to answer the questions more deeply because he's really the, the one who developed this. Yes, Matt, I'm here. No, this is a, an exploration. Um, this is our proposal for how we want to, and it's, so we, we really want to do a proof of concept of this. Um, it's not been developed um, and there's still some, some exploration and ideas that need to be fleshed out.
how do you want to see the lights? Like, is it is it so big or uh, what's, what's your current like um, space or how big is the stuff that you need to have in, in that? Or are, are there like what, what, what lens issues for the, for the having it dis distributed or is it like the blockchain thing? Or? So essentially, a longer term, we, yeah, I mean, there are um, quite a few issues, especially when it comes to um, matching and retrieving a lot of the, the complex subgraphs. Um, The at a certain level, we want to eventually be able to distribute over separate machines, uh, especially for some of our newer applications. Um, again, the the expert on the internals would be Andre, but I mean, I can definitely answer those larger scale. Uh, questions. What kind of data is it that, and, and where does it come from? Like, for example, does this database have data about, say, chemical reactions or pharmaceuticals? So, so, Mike Duncan, right, you use the bioatom space. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the idea, the biggest idea is that you want to have an indefinitely large one. I think just with the stuff that I was doing with the original atom space, putting in um, like a gene ontology and a bunch of um, uh, gene and protein interaction networks, um, that's at the level of that's millions of atoms. Um, I mean, when you start adding all their interactions and stuff, um, I mean, that's sort of practicable now, but um, I think. The linguistic example, I think, where it really gets big is if you start representing each individual text and then start working with that, then that's, you know, you can get indefinitely large, basically. So, for, I mean, because this is like what Linus was working on, like doing yes. from a corpus, with, like trying to, you know, if you, and then, um, um, so Unsupervised learning of a grammar corpus. Yeah. A truly enormous corpus. So that's where you know we know one machine, one machine and all that one. It's where you need a distributed system. So you want to be scalable like Yes, yes. Yes. For ADI, I think that's the idea of Right. Question. So, is it necessary? I mean, maybe I can't even make a problem understand, but is it necessary to use uh, natural language like human language? Or, are we, like, are you trying to get something that's user friendly? Or are you trying to get something that's friendly for the machine to use? So, what I'm suggesting is perhaps that the, the model doesn't need to think in English, it can use its own language. Right. No, I mean, it, it does need, it's not for our use. Okay. Um, so, so Adam Ease, the original Adam Ease was not designed as a human for human language. Um, it, and, and Meta is basically the replacement for that. It is kind of, it's the, um, the computer language. It's for machines. Okay. So, but you're trying to make this Meta version a bit more human interpretable than the previous one. What's the, it's kind of a... Um, and it, it's not so, I wouldn't say that it's, it has to do with human interpretability. It has to do essentially with, um, uh, proving it, it basically the mathematics underneath it is much, um, and so it, 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 it bridges that, that 
gap between mathematics and kind of the underlying computer representations. Um, and that's kind of what's neat about that homotopy type theory. So it uses these types. You notice that Alexei commented in the meta that no proofs were involved there at a certain level. It all became uh, through uh, type matching. Yeah. If that makes sense. Um, what, what you should some of the timers is that if we're going to achieve genuine AGI, this is all studying stones. Because once we get a genuine AGI, we can just tell the genuine AGI, hey, we have a suboptimal thing where we duct taped together Redis and MongoDB. Please replace it for us. And then they would say, okay, here you go, I we just replaced it. Here's a much better thing. And by the way, I made a human readable just because yes. I'm that. <laughs> sure. I mean, and, and I think your analogy of duct taping them is is great. Um, but I mean, I think if you think about it in a certain sense, the duct taping is not a bad thing. Just because you're doing one thing one way and another thing another way, you're kind of saying, wait, I. Yes, I'm a fan of duct taping. You can always tell someone is a practical engineer by how much duct taping. <laughs> You've seen the famous meme, the physicists like perfectly balance the fork on the cup. The engineers just duct tape it on. There's, a, there's Andre. He says, Oh, okay. Uh, so, oh, that's the problem. So, he couldn't hear the questions through this mic. So through not, this mic, not, so I can repeat them. So you want to start with some of the questions early on, or <laughs> I mean, the original one was why isn't a triple store adequate for what we're trying to do? Basically. Yeah, it is. So not necessarily not adequate. I think he was more so saying, "Why aren't you including it?" Just to repeat that. I mean, you kind of look, it looks like you, you're using predicate, you know, object, uh, subject notation somewhere, right? And it, uh, but maybe it was like a parenthesis with subject, object, verb type of thing. So the comment was that at certain level, we're still actually using, correct me if I'm wrong in this paraphrase, um, predicate uh, object, um, triple, 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 triples. triples. Did you hear that, Andre? He's asking if we are using right. triples. Yeah, we good memory. I thought I was the only one who couldn't remember all the acronyms. <laughs> No, he didn't hear that question. So, where's the? I guess I get need to get closer. Pardon? Okay, so the question is Is OpenCog aware that there is a gargantuan body of literature about? Uh, I, I said body of literature. I, I don't want to look at it. High quality. <laughs> there's a lot of a lot of people doing whole careers studying the problems of storing, querying, and otherwise database and triple, by which I mean subject, object, predicate, triple. 
I guess the question is, are they familiar with semantic web? Yes. Yeah. Um, then we're, yes. I mean, we are. But... Understanding because right now it's just you know, it's just markup. What it doesn't, Google doesn't understand. And otherwise, that um, database <laughs> triples. Uh, I'll just leave it. I didn't get a verb in there, but. I'm guessing if they looked at MongoDB, Neo4j, they, they saw. Oh, right. So, I mean. I mean, we did look, I mean, you know, we brought in, as I said, we brought in this um, Matt McNeely, who was, I mean, that's his life is GraphDB. Um, and he was not able, as I know at Sparkle, I'm trying to remember is, is like I, I've seen that. So. Sparkle is the query language for uh, for our yes. Yes. This is this, yeah. This is a my specific domain, so I'm kind of. Um, well, it, it's, it's kind of an ugly language, and it's it very is, difficult yeah. to use. It it's very high learning curve. But well, it's pretty similar. Right? Presumably, the people who designed it didn't do that intentionally. Presumably, it's because the problem is just inherently difficult. So I just, I typed it again. Or it was just an early iteration of the idea. There's, there's also, never caught on. There's also a historic sort of accident, mistake, uh, I don't know, Titanic sinking in the ocean, which is that at the time when all this stuff was like getting very popular, everybody thought XML was the future. So all this stuff is, Thoroughly implemented with XML baked in deep in the roots. JSON wasn't invented back then. And as we all know, XML kind of didn't end up being the future. And really? Semantic <laughs> people had egg on their face because of that. So I'm not seeing. Oh, wait, is he? Did you want to ask the other question? Well, I, try, I tried typing it in, but is he, is he, is he there? he's not, he didn't respond. And there he is. Right. Uh, we can't hear it uh, well on the mic on the audio. Uh, can can somebody please um, uh, use a mic? So he can you hear me? We try and talk. Yes. Okay, so uh, it's not like we don't want to use other. Oh, Andre is talking. Are, am I muted? Is it's something similar? Is your sound on? Uh, 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 okay, interesting. Hold on a second. Okay, can, can, can oh, you hear me? Sound on. Yeah. Hey yeah, okay, guys, can, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Exit. If he's talking, but we're not hearing anything. One second. Exit full screen. How do we do that? Escape. Escape. Try. 
Uh, we have questions. Yeah. Okay. Can Can you hear me now? Yes. How on earth do I get out of full screen? I could stop the share. How about that? Okay. Okay. And then maybe um, that would be better, right? So let's do the MacBook Pro speakers. Um, somebody asked a question. Where were the speakers? No, no, those are the speakers. But where was the? Okay. <laughs> So, okay, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Okay. So, uh, what was it's it? It's not. It's not like we don't want to use or don't think about using other types of DB engines. It's just that uh, for the current requirements we have so far, we need to find out one or two or, or a couple of database engines that provide indexing mechanisms that uh, are good enough for, for answering the, the pattern matching queries, okay? So far we find out or we think that MongoDB and Redis indexing features are enough for, uh, for us to implement the pattern matching algorithms we need. So that, that's why we are doing the, the proof of concept actually, but it's perfectly possible that we find out that they are not enough or that's some requirement that we just can't fulfill with Mongo and Redis. And in, in this situation, we would of course, uh, consider using other DB engines. But uh, as far as I can tell for now, all the requirements we have so far will be fulfilled with those two DB engines we have chosen. Did, did that answer your question? Why isn't the triple source doing that for the office? I just can hear Oh, you. well, so a, a triple, triple, a triple store. Could be enough. We have to build a lot of stuff on top of that triple store, which which would be a lot of work. I mean, so we we carefully evaluated DGRAC, which is more than more than just a triple store, and it just when you dig into DGRAC in detail, and we, I mean, we hired a consultant who has been spending his life building stuff in DGRAC for the last couple of years, and what what our hired DGRAC expert found was standard graph queries were very efficiently implementable in dgraph's graph query language. When we took the pattern matching queries that were important to us to do for open cog processes that we got by writing out a bunch of particular use cases, these queries would be very expensive to do if you implement them a simple way in dgraph's graph query language. And so then, the inbuilt graph indexing would be good enough. You'd have to build a bunch of custom indexes in, in DGraph. Then the way DGraph does predicate-based sharding would not work effectively given the type of knowledge in our metagraph. So you would have to do a bunch of special reasoning to add a whole bunch of new predicates to your atom space to feed DGraph's predicate-based sharding the kind of predicates that, that, that it wanted. So then it, it just came out that would be way more work than, than is, is, is worth it. And so if you're, if you're trying to use a pure triple store, I mean, of course, you could use a triple store to do, to do anything, but you, you, you would have to build a lot of complex custom indexing and sharding mechanisms on top of that to get a reasonable efficiency in the context of the of the queries that we have. And I guess in order to see that about any given distributed database, you need to take the actual queries that we care about that we've encountered in, in various applications, like using OpenCog and neural nets together to analyze traffic or doing bioinformatics data analysis. I mean, you, you have to take the actual queries that we care about and 
you know, try to write them out as queries in the languages, in the query languages associated with the different databases. And then what, what we found is it becomes insanely inefficient in the case of a raw triple store or, or, or D graph, right? And it's uh, not that you can't do it. it. It's just, if it's incredibly slow and awkward, then it, then it's not worth it. And I mean, my, actually, I, I know almost nothing about this domain except my, 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 my role here has been hiring experts in different sorts of distributed graph databases and knowledge databases, throwing requirements at them and having them come back and say, well, actually, I don't want to try to do this using this D graph or Neo4j or this fancy thing because it will be a lot of work and end up insanely inefficient, right? So. Well, no it, it's it's not, it's not like big dna data searching no. which of course needs needs its own uh, no. needs its 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 own uh special special kind of engine but we it's we have a large knowledge metagraph mm -hmm. and you're doing initially static pattern matching against it. But for example, one what one requirement that's annoying for many graph engines is you may you may have a pattern with multiple variables, but one of the variables may match against a whole subgraph rather than an individual node. Right. So standard graph matching engines don't like it when a variable in your query could be matched against a subgraph which could have various different sizes. And of course you could write a script to do that, right? But then how how fast? How fast does that does that script op operate? Right. So that that was that was one example, which is is painful to deal with. But then just hypergraphs versus graphs bollocks many graph engines also. So I mean, you, you I mean, you you have a link a link spanning among multiple different nodes. Again, you can you can transform a hypergraph into a into a graph and deal with it that way. But what you find is many of the graph databases are optimized for traversal queries. Like how do you find a route from here to here that has various properties? And most of our queries are not naturally turned into, turned into tra traversal queries. So that's a... Uh, at least for me, like there, there, there's this difference between like, like logical formulas, right? Terms, et cetera, and there, there's a huge amount of research in term indexing and formula indexing. And, Children, mm -hmm. the reason. And then there are all these serious graph data, like I would expect, like proteins and DNAs and all these biological data. I would expect that the sort of indexing methods for, for these two. Well, yeah, because with DNA, quite, with quite DNA quite data, which I've worked with a lot, you, you have particular kinds of queries oh. and you know exactly what, like you're doing BLAST, right? I mean, you're doing this dynamic, this. Yeah this dynamic programming approximate se sequence matching with edit distance. And you're doing that one thing over and over and over again. So of, of course you wanna optimize your data store for that one exact query. And the, really the, the biggest challenge with, with what we're trying to do is if you, you're trying to make a general intelligence, it's supposed to do anything, right? <laughs> so I mean, the, the, way, the way that you would optimize a distributed atom space for say natural language processing versus for automated reasoning versus for bio data analysis. I mean, it, it, it is un unlikely to be identical, right? So when, when, I mean, what we need is a framework where you can make a, a basic distributed atom space and, and then, then you're gonna need to customize it for, the, for different particular ap applications, right? But uh, it seemed the graph query engines out there were specialized for graph queries in a way that did not really optimize them for the hypergraph or, or metagraph queries we, we we wanted to do. So then you're you're just down to more more more, more basic distributed uh, tuple stores or document databases or, or or something. I mean, it's at a very high level. That's analogous to when we were looking at implementing the meta language that that Alexei talked about. At first, I thought let's implement that in Idris or Haskell or something because these have funky type systems. But then actually those type systems have enough restrictions. You can't really use them at an implement, 
implementation level as the basis for the for the meta type system. So we ended up implementing meta in Rust, which and you're not you're not you don't care about the Rust type system, right? You 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 just you just uh, you you can't use the base language type system, so you might as well just choose a nice, efficient, rapid development type language to implement things. And, and it's sort of the same thing with the distributed out of space. Like the, the, you can't really leverage the special graph database lookup thing, so you might as well just use some some nice, robust, distributed graph stores. Yeah, but L L Linus has yeah, been know, waiting to say talking. something. But let, let's let's make sure you're you're by a microphone that will let you get to the larger mm -hmm. online audience. And, Two, one. Not is. I know. I just wanted to add, you know, some very short remarks, and that this was how the development of the Atom space was originally driven: was users coming in, trying to use it for various in various different ways, finding out what fell short, what couldn't be done, and then adding those pieces that needed, you know, that needed to work better, that needed to be improved, and that's how we ended up to a large degree with hypergraphs and so on. Now, discussion and feedback from users sort of tapered off with this whole COVID thing. So I haven't been hearing a lot and I haven't heard Ben's latest thoughts, right? I'm, I'm still very much of this kind of like, let's work with the system that already has been proven in field trials in lots of ways. And I keep trying to pitch you there. The basics of making it distributed is not only there, but there's little demo applets we don't have anybody using it in a large distributed setting. So I don't really know what the bottlenecks are, what the challenges are, where things may not work, but I'm, I'm, I'm still very excited in, in, in taking it to the next level as it were. But like all good software development, uh, the nature of software development is, is if you start from scratch, you will end up years behind. So I'm, I'm very much urging Stick with the stuff that is known and works and move that forward. Yeah, I mean, so, so start from scratch has a number. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> start from scratch has a few different possible meanings, right? So what, what Linus is correctly pointing out is the, the current OpenCock version distinct from the in-development Hyperon Hyper version I mean, has has its own distributed processing infrastructure. It's had Postgres DB for a while. And there's a Rocks DB persistent persistent backend, and there's it's five a, times faster, ten times faster than the Postgres backend. And then yeah, the new Rocks DB interface is lets you do distributed atom space matching and, and retrieval five times no, no, faster. It's a single user. It's it's on the local file system. That's what huh? it is. Distributed part is with Cloud Server. I just wanted to add, so as far as starting from scratch, the approach Sana is advocating and, and Matt was describing is using MongoDB and, and Redis. So in, in a sense, in a sense, it's starting from scratch and that it's not the same as as what exists in OpenCog, but that it's not trying to build a whole distributed Metagraph system from from nothing, right? Which which would would take, and I mean, you see, Neo4j has been around a while and has eaten many tens of millions of dollars of of venture money to build a graph database, which has many nice features and also some significant limitations, right? So I mean, it's it's clear like building that infrastructure is is a huge amount of work. So if we want to avoid, we can look at what's there. I, I have, and the Senna has also, but you, right, you I've gotten no feedback from nobody came back and said, this is not allowed. Did you see Senna's talk that, or Matt's talk that he just gave? I was in the other room doing other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. I want to hear that feedback. I'm assuming it's because of COVID. Put you on the spot. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, are there more questions on Matt's talk? Matt, 
¿no? Then we will move on to more uh, confusing and baffling things. All right. uh, yeah, I, I was uh, first just confused by means me, me confusing myself by figuring out how to share my screen. Okay. Does Adam have a question? Yeah, I was just going to say that I, I am kind of confused with the two databases. Um, in not from a technical perspective, what uh, was it makes perfect sense if you store things in different ways that has different performance characteristics. And well, yeah, you're you combine the the memory requirements and you get the minimum of the both uh, performance requirements, right? In theory. Um, but, but from a software engineering perspective, I, I I don't get that. I think building on top of a single database is a dependency and portability nightmare. And building on top of two databases, I can't even start to imagine what that's like, especially for a new system that has many other unproven aspects. Um, so, um, yeah. I mean, that's, that's why we wanted to use DGRAPH, but our in-depth research showed that, that it, it wouldn't work. So, I mean, I, I agree if there was a way to make it work efficiently, using one existing database didn't involve rebuilding a bunch of the code inside that one database that would that would be well so that, so that, that, that would be better be and i mean then a suggestion to use mongo to store the content and redis to store the indexes i mean it really was motivated by not finding one database it seemed like it would be effective yeah. for both, both I, purposes I, I and it's I think it's clear that using two databases, while more of a pain than using one, is still much better than trying to build build your own distributed Metagraph database uh, from scratch or or on top of like Badger or some raw raw triple store, or at least that is how it, how it seems at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, step step one is always making your requirements less stupid, right? And I think if if you do need two databases to solve the problem, then maybe what needs to be solved needs to be moved or needs to be like read that like well I, I um I just want to say like it what is the impact on development? Uh, because from a technical perspective, that makes sense. But from a development perspective, yeah, that I, I understand what you said, and I, I do hear your arguments, but it, it doesn't address the, the basic we went, issue of the- We went through, in the context of DGRAPH, we went through, fairly carefully what you would have to modify in DGRAPH to make it make it work work for our purposes. And it would just, it would take a bunch of time for a team of programmers to, to modify DGRAPH suitably. But it seemed like if you did that, that would be a very, a very pretty way to do things, right? I mean, then you'd be making a, you'd be making a Metagraph oriented uh, DGRAPH. So in, in a way, in a way, that would be a very elegant way to do things. It wouldn't involve totally starting from scratch, but might involve uh, a couple of years of work for a, a strong team of distributed database developers. Because I mean, just like just updating their sharding took a year for a few of their developers on, on DGRAPH. This kind of development is is just a, just just a, a, a pain. But I think the requirements were 
fairly solid on and that they, they come out of a whole lot of experimenting with these different AI methods in the existing version of, of OpenCog, right? Like they're not, they're not purely uh, theoretically, speculatively cooked up requirements. Like we know what sort of pattern matching queries we, we, we want to do. I mean, of course, we could come up with a whole different AI paradigm that better matches the current array of distributed databases. But I, I would rather not let the available array of distributed databases drive how we think about AGI, right? right. Uh, they couldn't hear you. L Linus was just noting that yes, he has read the gargantuan body of literature studying other databases which fed into the open cog atom space and, and persistence design over, over a long period of time. But yeah, I think uh, as my own talk is next and I already have way too many slides to get through in the time allotted, I, I, I will move, move on to my own talk next. And Good luck. So if I can figure out how to share my screen, let's let's see how that goes. Yes, here we go. Woohoo. All right, so I I posted a paper uh, on Archive sometime late last year called the the general theory of general intelligence, a pragmatic patternist perspective. And I actually recorded a bunch of videos where I walked through a deck corresponding to that paper, which turned out to be like six or seven hours all total or something. So I hadn't intended it to take that long, but there, there was just, just a bunch of, a bunch of material. So, I mean, that's, and that, that is still a, a summary, which refers to a lot of other things internally, but I mean, that's, I think that's just the way it goes. Like if someone was trying to give a talk on how to build a jet aircraft, if you really want to go into all the parts, it, it's it's going to take a long time, right? So what what I want to do here is attempt in 45 minutes or so to sort of zip through some of the highlights of of that paper and, and presentation and giving a little bit different spin based on some of the some of the development since, since then, like with the, the meta in, interpreter and, and, and so forth. But I'm, I'm definitely skipping over a lot of stuff. And if, if you look at the paper with this title on Archive or the longer series of talks, then you, then you, will, you, will, see, you will see the rest of it, right? And so yeah, this, this is the paper, which is like, 70 pages, but maybe 15 of them are, are, are pictures. Um, and this comes out of a long, uh, long series of work I've, I've been pursuing for a number of, of decades. So I mean, at, at some point, the ideas in this paper are going to turn into my next book on, on AGI. And many of the ideas being presented here were inspired by the Hyperon design as uh, Alexei and Matt talked about, just trying to think through the math and conceptual foundations of, of AGI to make sure we're gonna rebuild stuff, that, that we're rebuilding the right, the right thing. So let me, I'm gonna briefly start with high level philosophy of what the hell I'm doing and why, although the majority of this presentation will be on more technical and, and Math, mathy type stuff. So the some of the conclusions I came to when I first started my quest for building AGI when I when I was a, a teenager, like way way back in the in the dark ages. I mean, uh, I thought it was interesting to look at a mind as a system of patterns. I mean, I don't think that's the only way to look at it. You can, if you look at philosophy, like 
Charles S. Peirce had the categorical system. You have first, which is raw experience. Second is reaction. And third is relationship. You can go further. Fourth is synergy. So what Peirce called thirdness is, is related to pattern. So that's not the only level you can think about minds on. I think it's a very interesting level to think about minds at if you're looking at, at, at building a mind, right? I mean, thinking about consciousness and, and experience is also interesting. I'm not sure how much you have to think of it to do, to do, to do the building. So if, at a certain level, you can think about a mind as a system for recognizing patterns in itself and the world. Among those patterns are patterns regarding which procedures are likely to lead to which results in, in, in which, which context. And those, those are not the only patterns that are interesting. They're, they're among, among the patterns that are interesting, right? And you can, you can look at the mind of an intelligent system as the fuzzy set of patterns in that system. Then there's emergent patterns between the system and, and, its, and its environment. You can look at how to formally define what a pattern is. I mean, the the crux of it is a pattern in something is a representation of that something as something simpler. I mean, you then you then need to have some language for representing things and some way to measure to measure simplicity. And of course, a pattern is a set of things that occur together. Well, that's that is one mode of simplification. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at image compression, though, you could say. Uh, program that compresses the image represents a pattern in that image and boiling that down to co-occurrence is a bit indirect right but simplification in the sense of algorithmic well, information more theory was how to boil that down to a set of co-occurrences or rather how to start with co-occurrences and turn it into that i think you if you, I don't want to if you look at algorithmic information theory not all compressing programs could be built out of, of co-occurrences i don't think mm -hmm. right? I don't want to but this the, this will be a whole, this will be a whole other discussion. Yeah. So intelligence intelligence can be partially thought of as the ability to achieve complex goals in in, in complex in, in, in environments. I mean, uh, I think uh, there's other ways to think about intelligence. I'll talk a bit about complex self-organizing systems and open-ended intelligence. But I think achieving complex goals in complex environments is certainly a significant part of the story. And if, if we can't do that, we're not gonna be making anything remotely similar to, to human level intelligence. So taking this perspective of minds as self-organizing pattern system leads you to ask questions like how are patterns represented in, in, in a certain system? What kinds of patterns can be simply represented? What kinds are most simply learned? What are the processes that are recognizing or creating or creating patterns? So the, these are the sort of questions you, you want to you want to look at, and the, you can also, inspired by this, you can look at what are some of the key processes underlying the self-organizing pattern systems that are our current real-world general intelligences, right? And you have evolutionary processes broadly conceived, which is basically combining existing patterns and mutating them to form new ones. You have self-organization and sort of self-maintenance self in, in, a, in a system, which uh, Varela and Macharana used the term autopoiesis to refer to. And there, there's an interesting, interesting, interesting literature on that. There's a basic rule of association, which uh, sort of Peirce, the philosopher, called the the one law of mind that uh, uh, the tendency to take habits, patterns that's been there, will tend to continue. So, associated things will tend to tend to glom together. And this this interestingly plays a role in foundations of physics too. If you look up Smolin's precedence principle, the the tendency to take habits is used as a way of deriving Schrodinger equation, which is is sort of cool. But then you you have then emergent networks in in a mind. So if a mind is a set of patterns associated with an intelligent system, then that set of patterns has a sort of network organization in itself. And you have some patterns that emerge from other patterns. You have some patterns that are associated with other patterns. These are hierarchical and heterarchical networks of, of patterns. And of course, a cognitive system can recognize, can model itself as a pattern in its environment and its actions, which gives you the, the self-structure. And the, this is all Philosophy, I've written about this in a bunch of a bunch of books a long time ago. I'm not going to dig into that philosophy in great detail here for time reasons in the, in the long version of this talk, but I think it's it's important to keep keep all that in mind, right? I mean, the work on building AGI gets really technical. On, on, on the other hand, 
ultimately what we're looking at is building minds that can really understand them, themselves in, in, in the world. I mean, of course, there's technical problems to deal with on the way there, but if you're, if you're not keeping the philosophy of what you're trying to do in mind, you're going to end up building a technical system that does, does the wrong thing, right? And the, you may end up doing that anyway, but keeping the, keeping the overall perspective and end goal in mind at least can, can militate against that. So one, one line of thinking that I've been really working on for a few decades, but that, that I've used recently in some of the theory work I've been doing is just combinatory models of computation. I mean, there's, there's many, many computational models, which are all in some sense equivalent in all of your uni universal strength capability. One, one way to think about computation is in terms of sort of distributed agent systems where you have two different agents that can combine to form another agent. And then you have a sort of a sort of a agent agent soup, right? And I had a, a paper which you could also find on ArcSide, which is about simplicity theory, where I sort of uh, explore the properties of computational model that's that's a sort of chemical type computation model, sort of sort of chemical reaction network. And you can you can, of course, you can make a universal Turing computational model from a bunch of chemicals that combine to form other chemicals, depending on depending on what they're doing. And I, I use this as a formulation of, of pattern theory. So there's a bunch of math given in these papers on how to how to how to define what is a pattern in in, in something else. But pretty much the, it comes down to to simplification, right? So if if the the degree to which the pair yz is a pattern in x relative to some simplicity measures. It, I mean, it's basically if combining y and z is a simpler way to produce x than just saying x, right? So I mean, in the case of image compression, say, if you have a big picture, and then you have a formula that compresses it, I mean, if the compression program plus the compressed version of the image altogether is simpler than the big image, then then you then you would say that you that you've simplified it, right? And a synonym for that is factorization, where you factor it into simpler parts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, say, you're basically saying x equals y times z, right? Where uh, yeah, times no, is a combinatory that's, operation. Those are the two. Factors. So that that's it's precisely factorization. Then to measure to measure whether the factorization actually simplified. Then you need a measure of the complexity x, y, and z, and a measure of the complexity of the combination operation itself, right? And the and the sigma is the measure of, of the x, y, and z. The h there is the measure of the combination operation, the combination of, 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 of x and y, right? And so based on something like that, you can sort of formalize the notion of a, hi a hierarchy in the mind where you can say, well, this h and s are a pattern in y, y v and w or pattern in x and so forth and you, you can make a hierarchy where basically y is a child of x means y is part of a pattern in x so which is why it's a sub pattern hierarchy so you can you can formalize the hierarchy in mind that way and you know hierarchies are a big deal in, in ai now right with the deep neural nets and so forth and but actually the the idea that mind in some form is hierarchical has nothing to do with neural networks or with vision with vision in particular it's really just about for minds operating in the real world with limited resources, building up complex patterns by iteratively composing simpler patterns is a very convenient heuristic, right? I mean, mathematically, the vast majority of patterns cannot be built up compositionally from simpler patterns. If you just look at algorithmic information theory, like the number of compressing programs is much larger than the number of hierarchically decomposable compressing programs. On the other hand, the ones that we are able to find are the ones that are hierarchically hierarchically decomposable because because we are mammals i mean ma animals do this they look at their environment they say oh i've seen this before this is food therefore i'll eat it or they'll say oh i see this before this is danger i'll run away they i mean it may be more fundamental than mammals it may have to do with how the physical universe is right like we got uh, we got quarks and atoms and molecules and compounds yeah, yeah. and cells that there's hierarchy based in like before Baked in before mammals evolved, right? So uh, absolutely, I wanted yeah. to avoid that abstraction. I mean, whether so, whether whether it would be true that intelligent organisms in any possible physical universe 
tended to hierarchical decomposition is, isn't obvious, but we can solve AGI in this physical universe first, right? So, so you can look at some interesting math if you assume you have combinatory operations that are associative, which not all of them in actual chemistry are, right? But if, if you assume you have combinational operators that are associative, then your sub pattern hierarchy becomes more tractable because you can say like if, if X is a pattern in Y and Y is a pattern in Z, then X is roughly a pattern in Z, right? And if you combinatory operations are not associative, then you cannot say that. So and I think this, I think a human like mine needs to deal with both cases, right? But one thing you know is if you look at vision and audition, these patterns are represented by matrix transformations, which are associative. So you know that like if, if X is a pattern in Y, Y is a pattern in Z, then X is a pattern in Z. And that, that simplifies a lot of things and ma makes life easier. If you're in a domain where your combinatory operations are non-associative, you can still think, but, but your hierarchy doesn't, doesn't get you as, as, far as, as far as you wanted, right? So I think the, the idea that hierarchies are useful largely comes down to the idea that associative combinatory operations are useful because then, then you can build you can build pattern hierarchies out of them which is which is is convenient so there's some preliminaries about mind as pattern which are going to come back come back later in this talk now another preliminary to to go through is what the hell is intelligence i'm, I'm not going to fully answer that question but i'm going to briefly allude to a couple of perspectives on it that will be useful for later, more particular things I, I want to talk about. So a fashionable way to think about intelligence now is as various forms of expected re reward maximization. Right? So uh, Shane Legg, who uh, worked for me in the late 90s and early aughts and later went on to co-found Google DeepMind. I mean, his, his, uh, his PhD thesis defined and fleshed out some mathematical properties of what he called universal intelligence, which basically, roughly speaking, it's how well can you achieve arbitrary computable reward functions in arbitrary computable environments where you, you do a weighted average by simplicity, where simplicity is defined as minimum program, minimum program length with some assumed universal Turing machine, right? And so this, this ties in with Hoder's design that AI AIXI. Now, in more recent papers, like by uh, Leke and Hutter from 2015 or 16, the idea that you could make an agent that's optimally intelligent by this method seems quite quite problematic. But the definition of intelligence is still interesting in, in its own way. But it's also, it's certainly a definition according to which humans are very, very stupid, right? Like, we're, I can't run a maze in 750 dimensions. Okay, very very what well. What your reward is you get to live another day? Well, it depends on your environment. This is arbitra over arbitrary computable environments. So being able to live another day in an arbitrary computable environment is quite hard. Right? Okay, so, right. <laughs> What's that? I'm very stupid compared to what? Well, compared to AIXITL. Yeah, right. But of course, that, that takes a essentially infinite amount of computing power, which is an, I mean, another, of course, this definition is just what are the results? It's not what can you get with your limited expenditure of energy, which would be a different way of defining it. And I, I had a paper on that in 2006 or something where you, you looked at a definition like this is normalized by resource utilization. So well, like, the problem with this thing is there's this word called reward and it's who's setting the reward? Allah. <laughs> Or in real life. Wait, you're, not, you're not allowed to say that. Hold on. Life, <laughs> remove, say remove that from the YouTube record. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a lot. Live another day is the standard autopoiesis. Yeah. Uh -oh. Sorry, I'm done. I mean, I, I think, I think this definition is is problematic, but I still think there's something to be to be gained from it. I mean, so you can. You you can you can look, you can look at all sorts of things that an an AGI could try to optimize, and then you could say, well, okay, are we Pareto optimizing among these ten different poorly defined things? We maybe are, but that's a really that's a really hard problem. So we're doing that in a very very heuristic sense, right? Because in practice, over the course of my life, I'm pretty sure there is no reward function I've been trying to optimize on any defined time scale, right? Like I've been. Maybe I'm just an especially disorganized person, but I, I don't I don't see 
except for a small set of very autistic people. I, I don't see many people who really expected reward maximizing over their over their life in in in, in practice. It is valuable to be able to define a goal and pursue that goal systematically during part of your life, right? So, I mean, trying to get expected reward where you have learned or set a reward over a certain time, if you can't do that, you're probably screwed, right? But on the, on the other hand, if you look at human intelligence, you can't really say there's one well-defined reward. You could say we're trying to achieve survival, but I mean, there's there's suicide bombers. There's there's all sorts of things that would that would would go, you go against that. We're clearly not trying to maximize reproduction. Or birth control wouldn't be a thing, right? So I mean, it's uh, th this leads on to David Weinbaum, aka Weaver's version of open intelligence, and his, his PhD thesis on this topic from Free University of Brussels is quite interesting. He gave some talks on this at the AGI conference in in Berlin some some years ago, and I mean. I have pointed out in some things I, I wrote years ago that in the end, I'd rather be talking about, oh, that's not quite right. Yeah, I guess it is. So in the end, I, it should be SOCADs, but yeah. In the end, I'd rather be talking about self-organizing complex adaptive systems and about AGI. I mean, to say AGI systems are artificial is a little weird. They're evolving in the natural course of human society. and. Uh, they're not completely general and neither are humans completely general and the uh, intelligence, we don't know how to define. So why are we talking about AGI at all instead of just complex self-organizing adaptive systems? But I mean, the term AGI, I introduced to make a point relative to AI when the field was veering toward, toward narrow AI. So in, in that context, it makes sense to look at and it's reminiscent of the G factor in, in psychology, which is doesn't require you to be maximally intelligent over all computable environments to have a high IQ. But if you start thinking about an intelligent system as just a self-organizing complex adaptive system that's recognizing patterns in, in itself and its environment, then Weaver ends up with two primary sort of drivers of the dynamics of an open-ended intelligence. One is individuation, which is pretty much survival. It's like just keep the boundaries around the system there so that it is still a system right it may be evolving and developing and growing in various ways but it's continuously being a system rather than diffusing into the broader universe the other is self-transcendence the drive of, of a system to rebuild itself into something fundamentally going beyond what, what it was before that its previous self couldn't comprehend and i mean he ties this into deleuze and a whole bunch of continental philosophy but i mean if you if you look at it, the, these two goals are somewhat contradictory, right? Like, and they're contradictory in most of our lives also. Like we, we want to remain ourselves and we want to grow, we want to grow beyond ourselves. And I, I had a, a blog post that I posted last month or two months ago that I won't have time to get into in this talk, which was on paraconsistent motivations where I was basically saying like, what makes human-like general intelligence is interesting if we look at us as having two top level goals of individuation and self-transcendence, these contradict each other, right? So then, then we can view our top level goal as a contradiction to be reasoned about in a paraconsistent rather than a consistent logic. And it, that's sort of what, what we're doing. We're, we're not consistent and, and coherent and we don't necessarily need our AGI systems to be either. So this, this leads you in directions quite other than maximizing a computable reward function, which can still be formalized doing different, using different sorts of math. But now, yep. Are there, are there really inconsistent though? One comes before the other. You can't. I think they're. I think they're in. I think they're inconsistent because when I, when I leap into something that's beyond myself, there's an irreducible uncertainty there, and I might lose myself there. To, to me, it's just like. It's like risk versus reward in financial trading. I mean, they're not totally inconsistent. Of course, you try to balance them and get a high sharp ratio. Yeah, you but you, if you maximize time. profit, you're going to minimize volatility. And the, I mean, I mean, it's a, if you maximize profit, right, you're going to maximize volatility, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so high, high. You can, you can't have both. 
high reward and low risk, right? And so that's uh, 500 years ago, the way to self transcend yourself would be to go to heaven. The only way you go to heaven is to die, right? But who wants to kill themselves? <laughs> well, you can't, if you kill yourself, you go to hell. So you, you, you haven't mastered the system yet, right? And that, 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 you're starting to see the problem. Right? Yeah, well, yeah. so self transcendence thing is tricky. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if you look at, say, brain-computer interfacing as an example, like, uh, I, I love to stick this phone on my head, it's my favorite, I sit around all day doing this, but, I mean, once we can, once we can plug chips into our head, you will have the ability to go beyond yourself in a, in a radical way, and there, one plus, right? yeah. there, there will be, a, but there will be a risk when you jack into the matrix that you're losing something that was valuable to you. And that, then you could say, I'm going to roll back. But what if you don't want to roll back, right? Because, because you're too tripped out to want to roll back. But if your previous self could control you, they would want you to roll back, right? I was thinking meeting one and then moving on to the next. But you were saying having them together. Well, because if you, look, if you look at development of a human child, it's like that, right? I mean, a child is self-transcending month by month, year by year, and they're trying to retain themselves. And that contradiction leads to many traumas during, during all of our development, right? I mean, pu puberty is a lot of contradiction in, in, in that regard. Like you, you, are, you want to go beyond yourself, but you want to maintain yourself and it, it's tormenting, right? But, but yeah, let, let me go on to some math here because that's it. So what, what I want to talk about now, given all that background is some thinking I've been doing during the last year about how to take a variety of different cognitive algorithms, which colleagues and I have been sort of playing with in an open cog context and formulate them all in a common sort of mathematical and algorithmic framework. And this, this gets back to a sort of foundational question in engineering AGI systems or designing them. So like, if you set aside approaches like artificial life or computational neuroscience and assume that you're taking a sort of cognitive slash computer science approach to, to AGI, then there's a lot of approaches which have sort of one algorithm to rule them all. And then there are those of us who have been pursuing sort of hybrid approaches, right? Where, where we're taking multiple different algorithms and having them somehow co cooperate together. And I mean, the simplicity of one algorithm to rule them all is obvious. There's only one thing to reason about it and, and make, make efficient. The, the issue with that is for every known algorithm, there's only some problems that really fit well into that framework. And so, I mean, if you look at deep neural nets as, as currently pursued, I mean, the they're very bad at abstract reasoning and they're bad at fundamental creativity. They're good at, at perception. They're good at some kinds of movement. They're bad at long-term planning. If, if you look at logical reasoning systems as, as, as they exist now, they're, be they're better at, they're better at long-term planning and they're better at many kinds of ab abstraction, but they're, they're not very good at, at prediction or pattern recognition in, in huge quantitative data sets. And, we don't know the extent to which any of those limitations are fundamental, right? Like pe many people are trying to make neural nets reason and clearly you could make a logic engine perceive if logical algorithms are or pixels and the inference control is, is efficient enough. Right? I mean, it, but in practice, it seems each algorithm has its own areas of, of strength, which leads you to a hybrid approach. And I've, solution for you, but we'll do that some yeah, time. I've been pursuing the hybrid approach but it also annoys me due to its inelegance. And so what I've been trying to do is restore the elegance by presenting the various algorithms in the hybrid approach as variations on the same sort of mathematical meta algorithm, which is, which is what, I'm, what I'm gonna describe here. So we, we can look at something I call a discrete decision system, which is just a very, Trivial thing. I mean, it, it's it's ba it's basically dynamic programming, right? Except you don't. It can be approximate stochastic d dynamic programming. I mean, you have a you have a state at each state you're in. You, you can take an action, and there's there's some local reward that that you can get based on based on each state transition that 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 you you effect. And so this, I mean, actually, Marcus Sutter's 
AIXI takes this framework also. It, it just needs infinite computing power to, to, to do what it does. So I mean, you, you can take simple versions of this and if you don't care about computing resources, you can get them to be arbitrarily intelligent. Or if you have a more constrained problem domain, like finding the shortest path to a graph or something, this is basically like Dijkstra's algorithm or, or edit distance, right? Just a terminology question, that slide you were just on, do you consider that slide to be reinforcement learning in a word? Well, reinforcement learning is an approximation to dynamic programming, right? I so mean, you don't consider this to be reinforcement learning? Well, as a terminology thing, I would consider reinforcement learning to be one algorithmic approach to to maximizing reward here. Like you wouldn't normally consider dynamic programming as reinforcement learning. I, like I, I just by solving know, Bellman's I don't know equation. Well, it pre, like, it pre exists. Like I know because reinforcement learning was derived as an approximation to solving Bellman's equation in dynamic programming. So what's the difference between this slide and reinforcement learning? Because reinforcement learning is one category of algorithms for for optimizing reward here. So when you say reinforcement learning, you're talking about the agents. I see. So when I say reinforcement learning, I'm talking about the whole paradigm. So I, I think it's just a miscommunication. Well, I mean, if you look in Sutton and Bardo's book on, on reinforcement learning, I mean, they don't consider every, like Dijkstra's algorithm is not reinforcement learning, but yet it, but yet it follows this format to find the shortest route to a graph, right? So. I mean, not 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 every algorithm for maximizing reward in, the, in a system like this is is, is reinforcement learning. Well, Dijkstra's algorithm can be framed as reinforcement learning, although that is highly arbitrary. Oh, sure. Well, okay. And. Well, because in this framework, it doesn't mean that the algorithm is reinforcement learning. Not that. Uh, we have two well, even if you're optimizing, like Dijkstra's algorithm for the shortest path in the graph, it's optimizing, it's minimizing path oh, length. Yeah, it's it's just not normally, it's terminologically, you don't normally refer to Dijkstra's algorithm as reinforcement learning. It's just a graph algorithm. It's not like reinforcement in there anymore. No. Reward maximization doesn't require reinforcement. Reinforcement learning is a certain incremental algorithm for doing it. Like you could take Bellman's equation and iterate toward it as a, as a, to find the fixed point of Bellman's equation. That's not really reinforcement learning. It's just finding a fixed point by numerical analysis. I mean, and whenever you have a reward function, you can do, you know, simple things, hill climbing, which you would call hill climbing. I mean, reinforcement learning. Anyway, that, that is a, anyway, this problem setup is the same as the problem setup commonly used, used in, re, in, re, in reinforcement learning. I just, I guess, having worked with dynamic programming before the field of reinforcement learning became popular, I'm not used to calling an algorithm for solving a pro, every algorithm for doing approximate stochastic dynamic programming is not usually called reinforcement learning. Right? When you're a hammer, everything's a nail, Ben. Well, but I'm not a hammer. So yeah, so there, 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 there we go. Yeah. So you can, as I, I go over in the this general theory of general intelligence paper in, in detail, so you can then formulate a whole bunch of cognitive algorithms in, in this in this way if you want to. So I mean spreading attention through through a network. Can be viewed as a as a greedy decision like this, where, where where basically when you're spreading attention from one node to another, the attention allocation system has to decide like is it more worth my while to spread attention here or or, or to spread over there because spreading spreading everywhere is, is 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 too expensive. But the the formalism I then work with is mandatory operation based function optimization. So, and this is all very simple and obvious. But what you're doing is you're you're viewing the process of optimizing this, where the actions you take are basically choosing to evaluate the, the, this, this or that point in, 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 the, in the function's domain. So you can, you can view optimizing a function as an iterated series of actions taken with the environment, where the environment is just the function where when you, when you throw an X at it, it, thro it throws an F, F of X back at you, right? So, I mean, the, this is, again, it's, it's the same wiring diagram you, you, would, you would look at for any reinforcement learning based, based agent. But in this case, 
the actions that I want to look at are actions of choosing what arguments to evaluate. The environment is the objective function. And if you're trying to maximize the function, then the reward is like, how, how big is the objective function value, value that you've gotten, right? So you can, you can view function optimization as a, as a sort of iterated acting and, and getting response and, and calculating reward, reward process. And then, then it follows, follows this same, same sort of uh, format. So you can, I see I'm, I'm not gonna have enough time, but you, you, can, you can formulate any, the iterated process of choosing which X to feed to the F you're trying to evaluate to get F of X and you're, you're exploring the domain of the function you're trying to optimize. I mean, this is an iterated decision process, just like, just like looking for food, food in, in an environment or, or, or anything else. And you can also look at that as a, a probabilistic programming problem. So yeah, the piece I, I didn't mention here. So if you, if, if you're trying to optimize a function f of x and the domain of the function has combinatory operations on it, right? Then, then there's interesting heuristics you can, you can follow. So if you know what f of y and f of z is and you know something about the algebra, can you guess something about f of the combination of, of, of y and z to get x? So if, if the combinatory operations that you have to combine elements in the domain of the function relate in some nice way to the objective function you're trying to optimize itself, then there's a set of interesting heuristics that you could, that you could follow. And it, it seemed to me that the algorithms we're working at in OpenCog sort of all had that form. You're trying to, which is obvious in hindsight, right? You're, you're trying to optimize some function. The domain thing you're feeding into the function has some combinational op operations on them. And then your heuristics for choosing which objective functions to evaluate next, which, which values to evaluate next in the objective function, your heuristic for choosing what to evaluate next has to do with combining things that have already been evaluated to get to get new things. And you can you can formalize all that nicely. And what you you can formalize this as a sort of probabilistic programming and that combining things is is a way of, of making a is a way of making a program, right? So you're you're just looking at in the end you're trying to form a distribution over which combinations of things are most likely to give an output that will give a high objective fu objective function value. So then you can look at this combinatorial operation-based function optimization as a kind of probabilistic programming. And of course, as always in AGI, everything becomes turtles all the way down, right? Like the, the process of the process of figuring out how to combine things to get the next next X to feed into the f of x you're trying to optimize, the process of figuring out how to combine things could be done by a whole decision decision system in it in it in itself, right? And so, the way I started to think about what we're doing with OpenCog is I'm trying to implement these combinatorial, these combination-based iterated function optimization problems over over a metagraph, right? Because there's nothing in there's nothing in what I went over before that was about metagraphs. So that, that could be on any, any type of case. Uh, metagraph, basically it's like a hyper hypergraph. But like a hy hypergraph is uh, like a graph, but you can have links as multiple nodes. A metagraph just means you can do whatever the hell you want. So you can have a link pointing to links, you can have a link pointing to, pointing to a subgraph. And that, that term didn't seem to have been introduced when I started using hypergraph to describe OpenCog. So I was talking about like generalized hypergraphs because the standard math definition of a hypergraph, you can't have a link pointing to a link or to a subgraph. No? But that's all just words. It doesn't matter. Huh? Those are the jigsaw puzzle pieces. Yeah, it's well, no, the jigsaw, jigsaw puzzle pieces are the germs, right? But, well, but, it's the one link yeah, between yeah, the half-assembled yeah, jigsaw yeah. puzzle and still so I'm 
the line of thinking I've been pursuing is to look at cognitive processes as transformations of a knowledge metagraph that are guided by this sort of combination operation driven sort of iterated function op function optimization. And why it is metagraph is another question. Linus had a great blog post on why hypergraphs some number of years ago, which pretty much pretty much gives the best formulation of that that argument that, that I've seen. But I mean the and you wrote something more recently about that also, I, I think. I mean, I think that basically though, if, if you look at the knowledge you need to represent, to represent the knowledge that a human like mine needs to deal with using the kinds of cognitive algorithms we know about, these pretty much all have a concise representation in a generalized hypergraph or a metagraph. And if you try to represent them as a relational table or a graph, the representation just becomes large, large and awkward, right? So I mean, it's not, it's not like it's the only representation. I mean, of course, you can represent everything using bits or first order predicate logic or, or any, any, any number of, of formalisms, but it's, it's about finding a representation that will concisely represent what, what you want to represent in a way that can be, you know, transparently and relatively simply manipulated to do the kinds of manipulations that, that you want to do. Then the metagraphs, aka generalized hypergraphs, seem strong in, 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 the, in that regard. And that that part of the open cog vision hasn't changed at, at, at all. The what I've been trying to evolve is a more standardized way to formulate the various cognitive processes in, involved. So th these are your puzzle pieces, actually. So that's uh, so that I, I had a which is all on our side, which was, uh, what should I call it? Uh, folding and unfolding on metagraphs, basically. So there, and I'm gonna go through this part fairly rapidly, but yeah, you can, you look, you formalize a metagraph as a type, type directed edge where you have a potentially ordered set of edges. They don't all have to be ordered. We have two there that are unordered. And you can, we're working with typed metagraphs. You don't have to, you could make the type a connectivity pattern, but in practice, it seems convenient to work with type metagraphs. So then, then you have a certain type, you can have a type associated with the edge or you can have a type associated with, with, with each target, right? And then, then you get into how are the types defined? Well, in meta, the language Alexei described earlier, you have a small number of built-in types and the rest of the types are defined in the, in the metagraph already, right? Which is, 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 is how it has to be, right? And then you can, you can look at sort of processing flows here. You can partition the targets into inputs and outputs and, and, and other parts. And then, then you, can, you can weave them all together and you can look at sort of meta paths through it. So to, to get a directed metagraph from a metagraph, you take, you take an edge and you say, well, what's the input? What's, what's the output? It's sort of looking at the edge, edge as an arrow. The same edge can be looked at an arrow in multiple different ways for different processes, which is fine. You can then add a, a path going, going through, through the metagraph. And what I, what I work out in a paper on folding and folding in metagraphs, I, I do a sort of a initial algebra model of type metagraphs. So you can, you, you look at just a few basic constructors, which then suffice to, con to construct all directed, all directed type metagraphs. Quick technical question. Mm -hmm. In a metagraph, can an edge point to itself? Yes. Edge can point to itself, and uh, so you you can introduce a few basic combination operations, which are generators for the set of of metagraphs. If you're just looking at undirected ones, then a simpler set of, of generators suffices. You can then look at this as a topology. You can make a topology on directed type metagraphs, where the the open sets are 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 metagraphs, and you can extend this to to forests of metagraphs and so forth, and you can. You can build algebra here. Every topology induces a hating algebra. So the hating algebra on meta paths through metagraphs is nice and leads you directly to an intuitionistic logic on the on the paths within the within the metagraph, which is is cool, right? Because now what we're doing in PLN now is sort of we're layering PLN rules as one thing you can do within the graph. So using the, the open God graph is sort of plumbing for PLN inference. Whereas what we're looking at here is the logic that's implicit in the paths to the metagraph, which is 
in Alexei's terms, that's sort of a way of grounding the logic operations, right? Like you can ground the PLN rules and truth value formulas. You can ground them in the paths through the, through the metagraph itself, which is as, as meta as meta can get, right? So that's a, and so the next step that I started looking at is fold operations on, 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 on metagraph. So if, uh, if you've done bringing half our scheme has fold too. It's more commonly used in Haskell. In various functional languages, you're familiar with folding and unfolding, which just to be confusing, people call catamorphism and anamorphism instead, because fold and unfold wasn't wasn't baffling enough. But there's there's variations of these fold and unfold operations, which are also interesting. So a histomorphism is fold, but each step in the fold operation, you have a sort of running memory of everything that's been folded so far. And future morphism is, is reverse. It's a memory carrying unfold. And then you can uh, you can do those together, fold, fold, and then and then unfold or unfold and then fold. And there's a bunch of nice theory papers from the functional programming literature showing that you can basically implement any computable process by unfolding and and and, and then folding if it's suitably defined. And of course. Carrying memory through can make things much more efficient than not, than not carrying memory through. So, chronomorphism is a hylomorphism, basically an unfold then fold that carries memory through, right? And that, what I started to look at is, under what assumptions could I formulate the variety of cognitive processes we want to do in OpenCog as metagraph chronomorphisms, basically? And the idea being, if you know like one plumbing operation that will do most of the work for your cognitive operations, then what you need to do when designing the interpreter for a language like meta is make sure that metagraph chronomorphisms are very fast. And that then, then you know that all your cognitive algorithms will, will be reasonably fast because you, you have a, a common sort of fast pl plumbing operation. As long as there's no non-determinism. There can be non-determinism, but, that, but that, that's, that's another point, yeah. So if you look at the paper of folding and folding in metagraphs, basically I go, I go through and just give abstract definitions of what all these different folds and unfolds are, are on, on metagraphs with a, the funny plus and the, the operations on the, on the, on the left-hand side, operations on, on, on the, on the left-hand side are, are uh, the, Initial algebra operations for com for combining the uh, sub metagraphs in, into into bigger into bigger metagraphs, and on the right hand side, there are operations for combining the, the thing that's being folded over over the metagraph. But that so I will skip over that crap for due to due to lack of time. But you can you can define all these fancy types of morphisms on metagraphs, which is a little bit complicated, but not that complicated. And you can connect that with the topology and you can see that these morphisms are then continuous on the, on the topology of, of metapaths, which is, is, is pretty nice. And then, then we find, then, then we finally get to the fun part. And I, I, I realized if you haven't poked around in this corner of math before, I'm not gonna be able to actually explain this in the next five or, five or 10 minutes. So I, I'm gonna point you to cool stuff that if you're really curious, you'll have to go and, and just do the background reading. I mean, in, in the longer, in the six hour version of this lecture I gave, I tried a little harder to explain it. And I went over some simpler examples of Gawa connections. I probably didn't do a very good job there, there either. I mean, it's just, you got to you got to read the read the textbook material and back lectures. Right here. Yeah, so there's a literature in functional programming universe on using Galois connections to sort of make it easier to derive algorithms, right? And a a Galois connection is basically it's a correspondence between two different two different pre-orders. And I mean, the de definition is, is extremely sim simple and boring. And the, the example of division and multiplication 
makes it fairly clear. I mean, uh, you, can, you can say z times y is less than x, or you can see z is less than x divided by y. And I mean, this, ex this example illustrates the, the adjunction between those two orders. It also illustrates the property that like multiplying is easier than dividing, right? I mean, so the, this illustrates the methodology of find the Galois connection between two orders involving two operations where one of the operations is expensive and annoying to do and the other is cheap and easy to do. And then this is one recipe for driving algorithms to do the, to do the expensive and, and, and annoying thing, right? And so this, this, this goes back to functional programming papers from Bird and DeMore and so on like 20 or 25 years ago or something, but it's now, it's getting sort of sim simplified and getting more, more practical in, in, in recent years. I mean, the, this theory was there when I first started playing with Haskell in, in the early 90s, but now it's getting boiled down more and more to actual uh, Im implementable stuff. And uh, yeah, I see in the in the chat in the Zoom room, Adam Vandervoort has posted a nice paper for an intro to, to Galois connections, which is, is, is good. So what I'm looking at here is taking these combinatory operation-based function optimization processes and spelling them out as, as Galois connections. So you can then use the programming with Galois connections approach to sort of derive simple and efficient algorithms for carrying out these combination and, and function optimization processes. So there's pretty much the methodology followed here is it's kind of trivial because if, if you look in the, the book by, I think it was Moulin Oliveira on programming with Galois connections, they take two examples of algorithms and they express them in terms of Galois connections and find efficient algorithms in terms of simple algorithms using that. So they, they take a greedy algorithm and they take dynamic programming, right? So I thought that was very nice. And then what I decided to do is let's reduce all AI algorithms we use to either a greedy algorithm or approximate stochastic dynamic programming, right? And as pointed out, I mean, reinforcement learning algorithms are just heuristics for approximating approximating the correct solution to a dynamic programming problem. And you can, in, in, in the end, in the end, you can view pretty much all the AI algorithms we're looking at as approximate stochastic dynamic programming or greedy search, right? And I mean, I'm not necessarily going to make a strong claim like that's true for every possible AI algorithm. Of course it isn't. It, it happened to be true for all the ones that we're actually working with in, in, in OpenCog though. And so, as an example, evolutionary learning is greedy optimization on the population level. I mean, the, the population is shifting itself little by little in, in the direction of, of higher average or maximal fitness or whatever, whatever, whatever your, your approach is. So it's different than greedy optimization on the individual level, but it's greedy on the population level. And that, that fact is used in like a bunch of the, the theory of genetic algorithms with infinite population size and so on. So that, that's not, not a wholly, wholly new operation. I mean, uh, uh, observation, right? But in Mu and Oliveira, they go through some math and I'm, I'm not even gonna try to unpack the notation here because I'm running out of time, but they, they basically, they, they introduce an operation called shrinkage, which takes a little bit of focus to, to, wrap, to wrap your brain around. And if you want to understand this, I say you should, you could, you should look, at the, look at the paper on Galois connections that Adam recommended in the chat, and then look at the paper programming with Galois connections by Mu and Oliveira. And then if you go back to this, it will, it will, it will make sense. But they, they introduced this sort of relational algebra, including a, a shrinking operation, and then Using that, they they show that greedy optimization is basically reducible to folding, right? And that pretty much makes sense 
conceptually, I mean, you're greedy, greedy optimization, you're just looking for one thing and then you're, you're moving to the next possible guess if it's better than the previous one. So that folding is just folding some function step by step by step over, over all the elements in your, your data structure or, 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 or graph. So it's not that shocking that greedy optimization should be should be implemented that way. I mean, you, you need you need a history based fold that keeps a record of what your objective function evaluations have been so far as, as, as you're going. But since you can implement greedy optimization as folding and you can implement a bunch of AI algorithms like evolution as greedy, greedy algorithm on a population level or attention allocation is just greedy spreading. You're spreading from this node to whatever nearby nodes seem best to spread to, then you're spreading from there to which ones seem best to spread to. You can you can then boil those you algorithms down. You don't pick much of a history. You just pick your, your best choice. Yeah, right yeah, now. yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, need, you, need, you need to know what the previous evaluation was, yeah. The, this is subtler theorem, which is how to deal with dynamic programming using connections. And we have on the on the right side here is uh, those pointy brackets mean the least fixed point. So this is a basically what this equation says is is that uh, if you want to find if you want to solve the the Bellman equation of dynamic programming, which which says you're finding the the fixed point of of a, of a certain equation relating the the rewards of, of of all the of all the nodes in the network, you can solve that Bellman equation by iterating through that through that decision graph, which is, which is the standard dynamic programming algorithm, right? So when you sort through all the goofy relational algebra terminology. What this is basically saying is that the standard dynamic iterative dynamic programming algorithm solves the Bellman equation. So I mean, it's saying that 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 Dijkstra's algorithm can find the shortest path by step step by step, seeing if adding this new link is is the right thing right thing to do or not. But of course, by by lifting by lifting that to this this more abstract level where you you see that. That funny semi semicircular thing on the left hand side is a fold, and the pointy things on the right hand side are are fixed points. So what this is doing when you sort through all the notation is is it saying if you fold things properly, then that's equivalent to finding finding the finding the fixed the fixed point. And that what that says is that you can approx it says that you can solve the optimization problem in a in the discrete decision system by incrementally going through and choosing options and then and then backtracking and so that that's uh, what's interesting then if you want to apply this in the AGI context is you can take various uh, okay hold on let's see oh yeah so you can take various cognitive algorithms like reasoning and evolutionary program learning, and you can express them as folds and, and unfolds this way. So one theorem I point out, which is pretty shallow once everything's been formulated in a paper on, called Patterns of Cognition that I posted late last year. If you have a cognitive operation-based function optimization process where the combination of operations are all mutually associative, right? Then, then you can follow through these pet these Siren Fumu and Olivera, and that decision process become becomes a chronomorphism. So basically if to recall that the COFO decision process is you have a function you're trying to optimize and in the domain of that function you have combinatorial operations where you Combine elements to for, to form new new elements, right? And and if those operations are associative, then you can approximate the iterative process of like choosing which 
elements of the domain to have evaluated by the function and then looking at combinations of things already evaluated to choose which new things to evaluate. You can boil that down to a fold operation if the operations are associative. And it's, it's not too mysterious, right? Like associative means X times Y times Z is the same as X times Y times Z, right? And so that, so if you don't have that, folding becomes hard because for fold, you're like folding over X, then Y, then Z. And fold, fold doesn't make a commitment about what order you're grouping those in, right? So if you, if you want to fold over X, then Y, then Z to do something, it had better be the case that it doesn't matter whether you're first grouping X and Y and then doing Z or first doing X and then, and then grouping, grouping Y and Z, right? But this, this seems fundamentally related to the power of hierarchy, right? Like if the power of hierarchy is really the power of associative operations, let you build a sub pattern of hierarchy, the, then here the power of uh, these Galois connections applied to dynamic programming, it, 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 it's really the power of working with associative operations for combining guesses in, into, new, into new guesses. But what does it mean for multiple operations to be mutually associative? Well, if, if, if you have a, an algebra with multiple, with multiple operations, which is a recognizing an abstract algebra, then you can put the parentheses wherever you want. But for example, that doesn't apply for like plus and times. In no. So it, it no. seems like it's a very strong condition. Yeah. <laughs> well, hang on. Okay, just mention, making sure I understand. Uh, yeah, I mean, plus, plus and times applied to real numbers are associated. Well, they're individual, but not mutually. What do you mean mutually? Two times three is uh, two no, times but three you, times four is going to be the same no matter what order I multiply. No, but but four. parentheses two plus, two plus three, three all quantity times four is not the same as two plus parentheses yeah. three times four. Sure, plus and times aren't associated with, with each other. It, right, exactly. Mutual. Or any one not operation mutual. they're right. associated. <laughs> but but fold normally apply the conventional definition of fold says you apply fold to a list of things in the order in which that list well but you can fold over trees or graphs or other things it doesn't have to be a list right yeah because what we're doing here is folding over metagraph so yeah, if you're folding over metagraphs I, I don't know exactly what your definition was yeah. for that yeah. but in conventional fold there's no requirement that the thing being folded no no you can you can fold, you can fold over anything the, the, the question is what's the requirement for turning say a fixed point algorithm into a fold. So that, I mean, that, 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 that's where, that's where the, the requirement comes in. I mean, you're trying to turn a certain, you're trying to turn algorithms that are not defined in terms of fold in, 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 into fold, up, fold operations. But the, there are other... Well, it's a head scratcher because associativity is a very strong imposition. Well, so matrix multiplication is associative, yeah. Uh, which is what's involved with the perception. So. Yeah, it's only like a operation at a time. I mean, that's that's. Um, you don't often need it. You, you you could have that case. So, yeah, I mean, you often only need one operation. Yeah. Famously, rotations in three D aren't associated. Yeah. I mean, the, the other issue here is in reality, your metagraph is changing all the time. So if you, the equivalence between, say, a fixed point algorithm for doing something or a, a fold algorithm for doing something, the equivalence sort of assumes the knowledge stays the same while you're doing the folding process, right? So if, if we think about this in terms of, of logic, a, a, as an example, and I mean, this would tie in with your work in answer set programming on this actually. So think, think about you have a huge bunch of logic equations, right? And they all have overlapping variables. So, and suppose they're uns, uncertain, lo, uncertain logic equations with some probabilistic or fuzzy truth values. I mean, one, one, one way to solve that set of logic equations is just 
treat as a humongous set of simultaneous equations, and then you know try to find a, a fixed point that satisfies all, all, all these different all these different equations, and then you can just apply some some iterative optimization algorithm to it, right? So you can you can treat that large set of inter defined logic equations just a, like you would a set of simultaneous nonlinear equations and you can you can try to try to solve it using an optimization algorithm of, of some sort which has nothing to do with 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 the lot lot with forward backward chaining or something right the the other thing you could do with a large set of logic equations or one other thing you could do you could you you could try to find things that sets of variable values that fulfill that set of logic equations by doing forward or backward chaining inference, which is what we do in, in open open cog now, right? And with 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 PLN. And what this equivalence was basically saying is trying to find values that fulfill a large set of logical equations by some sort of fixed point iteration versus trying to find it via a backward chaining process which is which is basically what the dynamic programming switch algorithm is doing that those will come to the same thing and what one thing that breaks that in an agi context is that while you're in the context of trying to solve the equations new interim data is being put in in, in your in your knowledge base which directs the thinking in in, in different ways right so if you're trying to solve a fixed point by an iterated algorithm versus doing backward chaining using a fold operation, if in the interim you're putting the knowledge you gain in the interim in your knowledge base, and that's then used in your ongoing processing, then then the then the equivalence fails, right? And I mean, I think that's. A, well, I mean, I, I don't want to distract your talk too much, but the, the only point with the answer set programming thing is is that they do neither backward nor forward chaining they do this sat solver yeah yeah exactly and these days they're so damn fast that my proposal was simply that you can explore every possibility so if you want to do probability you just run this thing it'll do these crisp true values very fast for you try every possibility and just see which probabilities end up dominating yeah so it's more of a tactical solution to how to, how to do probabilistic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's. I mean, it's not general. It's just. I mean, in, in theory, it's general, but in, in practice, yeah. If you if you have logic equations with a bunch of nested quantifiers or something, then by the time you normalize them nicely, the answer set programming is not fast anymore. But if you have just propositional logic, then it's fast. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, there, there's a corner where it's not fast, but. <clears throat> Most common cases, it's blindingly fast, and no one can just take that, you know, take advantage of that. So yeah, I've smart stuff with it. pointed in the pointed in the direction of some of this stuff I wrote about in in papers last year. It's been too fast to actually indicate how I'm talking about that. Hope, hope to have gotten some people interested in in being in and and reading stuff. The, the high level concept is to use a bunch of this, take a bunch of the math that's being pursued in the functional programming community, such as for driving algorithms using Galois connections, apply that to AI algorithms that are operating on, on top of metagraphs. And then what you, I believe, can get out of that is fairly simple, compact representations of a variety of different AI, AI algorithms in terms of a small set of operations. And one of the conclusions I came to is you can get a long way with chronomorphisms and metamorphisms. Like you, you, can, get, you can get a long way with folds that, and unfolds that retain memory defined over a metagraph. So that if, if you could if you have a language, say a meta interpreter, which uh, Vitaly and Alexei are now building, if you have a language in which doing chronomorphisms and metamorphisms over a large metagraph is reasonably simple to code and reasonably fast to run, then it seems like you're gonna get a system in which 
a lot of the important cognitive algorithms are sort of fast and and tractable. So it's not it's not quite one algorithm to rule them all. But if it, if it if it's sort of one meta algorithmic framework to rule most of it, then then that may may be enough. I mean, if we look at what happened with deep neural nets in the last five to 10 years, a lot of ideas that, you know, I was teaching when I was uh, teaching neural nets in the nineties, a lot of these old familiar ideas, same basic concepts with various adjustments and improvements implemented at far larger scale gave much more interesting results right now with a sort of hybrid AGI approach we've been taking with OpenCog, it will be interesting to see if we have an infrastructure that lets us deploy it at a much larger scale then will modest variations of the ideas we've, we've been pursuing already give us far more, impressive, far more impressive results. And that's sort of what I'm trying to, to work toward here. And toward that end, I mean, so we saw talks earlier on two key architectural pieces, right? Like the, the meta language that, of which Alexei has has led the design for and that Vitaly is, is prototyping now. I mean, that's intended as a language in which we can make compact, efficient versions of these various algorithms. So for example, it should be very, you should be able to concisely strip metagraph chronomorphisms of various types and have them, have them run fast, including run fast when you when you want to fold across stuff some of which lives in in the distributed atom store right and so you, you need to you need to fish them out to dynamically to, to to fold over them and then the the talk that matt gave summarizing senna's work is sort of about what could be a practical strategy to make a distributed knowledge base to to support these processes in, in meta language, basically. So that's that's very computer science-y. And in the last few minutes of the talk, I want to bring it back more to uh, to the, the human world, right? So I think using this sort of framework, you could you could define many, many kinds of kinds of intelligences, right? And human-like intelligence is one particular little corner of mind space. I mean, you could, there's a lot of intelligences that are nothing like human-like intelligence. And ultimately, the outcome of the singularity may be creating minds that are in very little like very little like humans, any more than we're similar to bacteria or something, right? But, but it, it seems like the next step should be trying to build AGIs that have some decent resemblance to, to, to human-like minds, if only because that's the kind of mind we understand best. We can debug them best and understand what what the, what the hell they're doing. So, then you're you're pushed to ask like, what is the nature of the prior distribution over mind space, which is imposed by the requirement to be somewhat, somewhat human-like, right? And the conclusion I came to a while ago was we could think about what I call the embodied communication prior. And I know Joshua Mendio, who's Great guy and a friend. He's giving a talk later at this conference. He, he had a paper a few years ago on the consciousness prior, and there was a decent paper, and it's a good a good way of thinking and fairly philosophically similar to this. But I, I think I prefer this way of formulating it because I mean I could talk all day about the philosophy of consciousness, but I think that's it's a different issue. And I think if you look at the requirement of achieving goals in an environment where multimodal communication with other similarly embodied agents is important. I mean, I think the requirements of that drive an awful lot of, of, of human intelligence. Like we're, we're embodied agents in this 3D world with one time dimension, but we're trying to achieve goals together with other similarly embodied agents like shared together in the, in the same world. And that that drives an awful lot. So, I mean, that, that drives. I mean, that means you need to communicate linguistically in, in some form, but, but because we don't have, because we don't have empathy. But it means, yeah, it means or at least not reliably. It means you need to be able to point at things because we have this 
the shared world. It means you want to be able to show people how to do stuff by, by acting it out. It means you want to be able to depict stuff that you saw, but the other guy isn't right there to look at. And this leads directly to the key kinds of memory that cognitive psychologists have known. Like we have semantic memory that ties to linguistic communication. We have procedural memory that ties to indicating and, de and demonstrating things. We have sensory and ep ep episodic memory that, that relate to things that are easy, easy to demonstrate. So, I mean, you can, you can tell a whole story, which I've done in some prior writings, that goes from being a goal achiever that needs to communicate with other similar bodies in a shared world to the types of communication you have to do, to the types of memory you want to have to support that, that kind of communication. And then when you have these types of memory, well, you need a kind of learning corresponding with, with each type of memory. So then the task of designing a human like mind comes down to how do you implement the types of memory corresponding to the types of communication we need to do to solve problems together? And how do you implement types of learning corresponding to these types of memory? And then how do you make the types of learning corresponding to these different types of memory cooperate with each other to help each other out when they get stuck, which comes back to what I called cognitive synergy. And so the approach that I'm advocating is we use a distributed metagraph to represent all these types of memory in a common sort of infrastructural framework where there may be different node and link types in, in the metagraph corresponding to the different type of memory, but then there's ways to convert and map between them also. And now the different learning algorithms that are well fitted for these different types of memory, if we can represent these different learning algorithms in terms of a, a common set of underlying metagraph Oper operations like, like histomorphisms and future morphisms and so on, then it becomes perhaps tractable to have an efficient infrastructure for, for, for doing all this. And I mean, this almost surely is not the only way to create a human-like general intelligence. I mean, neur neural nets are also interesting. What, what I would say, my, my gut feel on the neural net approach is current deep neural nets resemble aspects of visual and auditory cortex. I mean, some things resemble fun certain functions of hippocampus. There's hundreds of different networks in, in the human brain with different sorts of architecture and operation. I would imagine if you got a hundred different artificial neural networks with appropriate architecture and somehow co-trained them to the right set of tasks, I see no reason you couldn't get a human-like general intelligence. I mean, the the mode of coordination among these neural networks could be quite subtle. Like in the human brain, you have astrocytes and glia, you have extracellular charge diffusion, like through the extracellular matrix in, in, in the brain, which helps with, with synchronization. I mean, the Hodgkin-Huxley equation that governs a neuron has fast and slow dynamics. Spiking is only about the fast dynamics, but synchronization largely has to do with the slow dynamics. So, I mean, the, there's a lot of stuff in the brain that isn't like almost all of it, that isn't touched by current formal neural net models, but yet by gradually glomming on more and more neural nets and paying more and more attention to how coordination and synchronization of modules works. I see no reason you couldn't build an AGI that way. My feeling is this way has a number of advantages. I mean, one way is I think it makes better use of the computers we now have, have available, which are very little, they're very little like like the human brain, but they can carry out, you know, functional programming operations far better than, than, than the human, human brain can. Another advantage is, has to do with something we're seeing all the time in the commercial application of deep neural nets now is you have to bend over backwards to make neural nets transparent and explainable and understand what the fuck they're doing, right? And with, if you have an approach that has a transparent, explicit knowledge representation built into it, at least as one of the options, right? I mean, then you don't have to work as hard to make your logical network explainable, transparent and comprehensible. Of course, you can have a high, highly incomprehensible tangled logic formulas too, but there, there's, there's more of a clear path toward making things explainable and comprehensible. Right now, AIs that are incomprehensible and unexplainable even to themselves are only a minor problem. I mean, they give us racist, biased, sexist neural networks, which is, is bad. If you actually get toward AGI, 
then it becomes a much worse problem, right? Because you potentially have a superhuman thinking machine where you have no idea what the fuck it's doing and it has no idea what the fuck it's doing, but somehow it's carrying out quite complex, intelligent operations in some in some context, right? And I, so I think- it's Racist and sexist. Yeah, and, 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 and maybe anti-humanist or, or a lot of other things, right? So yeah, so I think getting to AGI in a way that has explanation and reflection and self-comprehension as part of the package from the beginning has other advantages beyond just suiting our computer hardware better. It will have AI ethics advantages uh, on, 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 on going, right? So the, something I mentioned along the way there, which again, there's, a, there's papers I, I wrote you can look at, the notion of cognitive synergy of having of different AI algorithms, for example, corresponding to different types of, of memory store, helping each other out when they get stuck rather than making each other's stuckness uh, co compounded. I mean, you can formalize this using various category theory commutation diagrams, which, which I've done in some, some papers before. I think that's in, in, interest, interesting to do. You can look at it in a language, in a linguistic context in terms of morphisms between logical representations of language and things like image grammars or, or action grammars. And you want to have morphisms between, say, the grammars of perception, the grammar of action, and the grammar of logic, and, and the grammar of language. And you can, you would like to set things up so there's nice, if approximate, morphisms between the, the representations using these different domains are represented in the same knowledge well, knowledge I, I claim that it's another grammar that connects all those grammars together. So just a, a connecting grammar. It's grammars all the way down. Sure, it, it, can, it can be. I mean, yeah. Yeah, so some of these more cognitive science-y parts I wrote, we, Cassio Nolan, I wrote about in this book, which is published in 2014 or something. I mean, it honestly seems like ancient history by now, but but there's a lot of things that we put in there that haven't bothered to write in, in more recent stuff. But I think the the paper General Theory of General Intelligence, which is was posted late last year, has some has some 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 link, links into here. And uh, in the longer version of this talk and paper, I go into each of the aspects like this in this wiring diagram. And I try to explain how each of these boils down to these comic combinatory operation-based function optimization processes. So I, I go through some effort to show how each recognized aspect of human-like cognition can apparently be boiled down into cognitive operations that, that are then analyzed in, the, in this Galois, Galois connection framework. And that, that's just a multi-hour story rather than, the, than an, an hour, hour, and hour and a half, hour and a half story, right? So, but you can, uh, you can look at this as a bunch of different discrete decision systems mo modularized in a way that's conditioned by, by human em embodiment. And then each of these discrete decision systems can, can be sort of a approximately modeled as fold or unfold operations in, term in terms of metagraphs. And that, that leads us to OpenCog Hyperon design, which is, is conceptually the same as, as OpenCog design, right? I mean, it's conceptually just just uh, OpenCog. We just decide, and instead of using versions like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, I decide to name them after obscure elementary particles again, just because it's simpler than ran, random numbers. Right? So, so this hyperon is a obscure elementary particle that happens to have hyper in it, like hypergraph. So, I think that. The next version after Hyperon will be OpenCog Tachyon, which will be a quantum computer going back in time. Right? But, uh, but uh, for 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 now, for now it's uh, it's Hyperon. I would say we, meaning my team in SingularityNet, is making avid use of the prior OpenCog version, which we we're thinking of as OpenCog Classic, which Linus is still actively developing now. So we, we're using that inside the Grace Humanoid Robot, which I'll be showing off showing off tomorrow and for a bunch of bio AI, AI work. And, and actually the talk that Neil and Hedra gave this morning about temporal reasoning 
for agents playing Minecraft is being done using the existing working ver version of, of, of OpenCog. So we're still, we're still doing a bunch with the existing OpenCog version. We, after a lot of hand-wringing, came to the decision to re-implement re a lot of OpenCog stuff from uh, scratch, which I haven't yet convinced Linus is, is, is a good idea, but may, maybe in the next couple of days he'll he'll be he'll be convinced. But but you missed Alexei's talk, unfortunately. Which uh, but scheduled me for these other talks. I didn't schedule for that. Oh. You scheduled yourself. I, I I had nothing to do with it. Huh? Yeah, Anton. Yeah, that's a Siberian it's mad small. mind. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean Alexei's talk is is on video, and Alexei is always there to to argue with. So. The, um, he was supposed to be here, but the U.S. Embassy in Russia is indefinitely delaying visa processing. So, so the Russian contingent, including Anton Alexei and Sergey and so on, could, couldn't come, basically, which it was, it was a drag. But then, I mean, the basic decision to, re, to implement a different version of OpenCog started with the language. Like, we really felt like we wanted a, a custom language rather than using scheme to manipulate atomies. And we felt like a lot of stuff that is now baked into the pattern matcher, which Linus here wrote, which is an amazing piece of software. A lot of stuff that's currently baked into the pattern matcher, we didn't necessarily want baked into the pattern matcher. So the design we wanted to follow is make a static pattern matcher that just does static pattern matching. It still has to have bells and whistles. Like you have to be able to match a single term against a whole subgraph or something, but you, you want a pure static pattern matcher and you want to run against a distributed atom space. But then a lot of the programmatic logic now done in the pattern matcher, we want to do in the custom language that's wrapping up calls to the, st to the static pattern matcher. And rearranging things that way led us to the meta language design that Alexei talked about earlier. Then, then when we start to think about what do we want the distributed atom space to be, to support the kinds of static pattern matching we want to do. That's what led to the distributed atom space design using Mongo and Redis that Matt talked about. Now, when we start to think about the in RAM atom space cache, we're still thinking about that. The tentative conclusion we came to is we may not want an individual atom object. We may want the, the elementary object to be an expression. And so if Atoms are still there conceptually in the semantics, but it's not clear that having an individual atom object stored in your atom table is gonna be sufficiently performant. It may be that you wanna store an expression, which in the current atom space is just a whole rooted, rooted dag or, or tree, right? If the individual expression is your elementary object, then your pattern matching still has to look inside those expressions sometimes, right? right? But, if you're making an atmosphere where the expressions are the individual objects, then that's a big change from from the current the current atom space. Well, I mean, the, the danger here is right. There's a lot of stuff that's in there is cropped that was that people insist on to have backwards compatibility. And say, yeah. If you remove that, you'll break my code, and I will kill you. Including a lot of uh, including a lot of us us same people who are are working on this new version. Yeah. Right, and, and so yeah. There's, there's this thing of like you know. It's, it's, I have to sort of very carefully remove stuff without breaking backwards compatibility. And well, that's why new versions of with, things get built, right? I mean, that's why new yeah. versions of things get built. But the flip side is, whenever you go watch new versions of things, complex things get built, is it often takes years before they catch up because each one yeah. of those little bugs that was fixed in the old version gets rediscovered. I mean, if if it takes <laughs> if it takes years and we come up with something. That is good for building AGI. Well, then I'm, Firefox. Firefox I'm okay if building. Five years to reinvent. Yeah. Right. I mean, our our. So we should have a working pre-alpha version of Meta Interpreter, roughly by the end of the year. But I mean, the I think. I mean, I don't think we will have anything useful for practical applications in Hyperon before 2023. So, I mean, I mean, it is, it is, it is time, even given there's great people working on it, which is why we're using the classic version of OpenCog for practical ap applications now, right? I'm, I mean, the, yeah, it, it is, it's a, it, classic 
to be more hyper on like well, we, we should we sh about old features. Yeah, we should we should somebody sh complains. So we know. should talk about that. Yeah. So that the high level architecture, this is an old diagram where it says Adamese, we can call it meta, which we were previously calling Adamese too. But you have this interpreter, the local cache atom space is basically what's now called the atom space, right? It's an atom space living in RAM. Then you need a distributed atom space. And then, you know, as we saw an aspect of meta is that it's an easy language to create sort of custom subtype systems in. So you will end up with a type system that's designed for interfacing with external neural net libraries, a type system that's designed for automated program learning, a type system that's designed for probabilistic reasoning. And these are all designed inside the, the meta language. Then you can have custom type checkers and equality and inheritance checkers within each of these sub languages scripted within, within meta, which have to be quite efficient. And that, that, that's where you would get a reasonably efficient way to do your various AI algorithms, but then each of these AI algorithms you see on the left here, if these are implemented in terms of Metagraph fold and unfold operations, then if Metagraph fold and unfold are implemented efficiently in Meta in a way that lets them still be efficient in these subtype systems that, that were introduced, I mean, then, then then you may have something that's a couple of orders magnitude more efficient than, 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 what, than what we're doing now. And I mean, in OpenCog now you have types and the types are cognitive content, which is as it should be, but you don't have efficient type checkers, right? Now you, you could in the current OpenCog implement an efficient type checker for an efficient type system and just have it, have the pattern matcher invoke it when everything it was doing was within that type system, but it's not really the way things are organized. And that, that's the way things are explicitly organized in, in meta is the type system plays more of a prominent role. And if you define a DSL, which is a subtype system, and all the expressions that you're dealing with are within that subtype system, then the plugin, which does efficient equality and inheritance within that type system is automatically invoked and, and can, be, can be quite fast, right? And so that's uh, initially like type checkers and, inherit and type inference systems for a subtype system are implemented by, by us, like for example, in, in Rust, which is being used for, for meta implementation. I mean, Aspirationally, as you move toward AGI, an AI algorithm can learn its own type system and then learn its derive inferentially using Galois connections, its own efficient type checker and, and type inference algorithm specialized for that subtype system, right? I mean, that, and that's, that's further and further toward, toward AGI, right? So this- uh, well, I think you wanna be careful. There's two different types of types. There's Sort of the types that you need at, at a low level just to get the basic software. Yeah, which, which are built into meta, right? Yeah. Just sort of have to be built in. And then there's another type system, which is the abstract one that you're dealing with when you're learning these. Right, which the system has to be able to learn its own type yeah. subsystems itself. Though. Yeah. And calling them both types is, 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 leads to confusion. It may. It's, yeah. I mean, I, I would say we, we do not yet have a comprehension friendly description of, of, of the meta language. I, I mean, I mean, we, we've been just struggling toward articulating in a way we can understand ourselves. But yeah, I mean, of course, in type theory, essentially everything is a type, right? So, but, but, but that doesn't, but that, I mean, people in programming languages, people are used to built in types versus derived types. And I mean, there's core Haskell and then there's other stuff built on top of that. So I, I think, I think we will have a core meta and then other stuff that built on top of it. But yeah, th these slides, since Alexei talked about meta, I won't say too much about it, but the high level goal was to have a gradually typed approach where different cognitive processes are realized using different type systems. And there's a Curry Howard correspondence between gradual types and paraconsistent logic, which is basically because if you have something and you haven't decided what type it is yet, you, can, you have to reason about it as if it has any possible type. So that, that means basically the idea that it is this given type is both true and not true until, until you have concluded more, more fully what it is. So there's to reason about, about expressions whose type is not yet resolved. One way to do that is you map that into 
paraconsistent logics and the intuitionistic negation plays an interesting role in, in, in reasoning, reasoning about these. So paraconsistent intuitionistic logic turns out to be the natural way to reason about a system like meta where you have multiple type systems and you have gradual typing where some things can be not typed or, or only only very very crudely crudely typed so we're yeah i think we've gone over most of this distributed m space I've, I've already talked about i think i talk a bit about in the longer paper on applications of this to ai ethics i've gone on too long i'm not going to go over this long time here but if you again it I mentioned already the issues of transparency in age, in neural neural net systems. I mean, getting rid of racial and gender bias is a very very elementary plumbing level of AGI ethics, right? I mean, ultimately, if you look at ethical theories, the most advanced stage of ethics is considered to be reflective ethics, where a system is really able to reflect on everything that's going on in its mind and why it's doing what it's doing. And, and you know, this in human, human life, this has to do with when you have an emotional reactive response to something in the moment, understanding why you're having that response and, the, and then rationally and deliberatively modulating that response ba based on your overall understanding and goals, right? But to, to be able to do that, you need a high level of reflection. and. This is hard for humans to come by. Like we have to work for a long time to reflect on our own emotional reactions and, and, and motivations. On, 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 the, on the other hand, you could architect an AGI system for which reflection on what it's doing and why and what its motivations are and why it's having a reaction is easier than for humans and is, is, is built in because that was one of the design principles or whereas it wasn't one of the design principles for, 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 the, for the human mind, right? So I think there can be large AGI ethics advantages to having a system with reflection and self-modeling and self-abstraction built built in sort of at the at the un under underlying level of the system. And the, th this ties into some of the broader aspects of AGI that I've been looking at within 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 singularity net. I mean if you look at what AGI systems are applied to now in the main world, I mean the the core Core vertical markets for AI at the moment are selling, killing, spying, and, and crooked gambling, right? I mean, ab advertising like Google and Facebook, uh, military espionage, and then Wall Street, which is a well honed AI and statistical reasoning engine for extracting money from the 99% to the 0.01%, right? So you're not going to need to add deep fakes. You forgot to define selling. Selling is, of course, delusional propaganda. Yeah, we can define all these. Yes, I mean, I mean, uh, <laughs> Well, uh, I'm, I'm yeah, a better human being if you have a. I mean, porn could be added in here, but it, it's with deep fakes. But it's it's being so so far it doesn't compete with these in terms of of, of the amount of money spent, right? So if you if you if you want to palliate against these factors, and again on the AGI ethics theme, like work toward beneficial AGI, I mean. A lot of this is stuff that has nothing to do with the specific AGI design, which is sort of you want the evolving AGIs to be democratically governed. You want a diverse group of humans to be contributing to it. You want the infrastructure to be decentralized so it can't be easily taken over by any elite group. You want, you want the AI to be primarily applied in compassionate and beneficial applications rather than nasty applications. And all these things, they have to do, for example, with Singularity Net, which is a blockchain-based project trying to make a decentralized infrastructure for AGI. But I think there are subtler, there are, are subtler sort of dependencies between the AGI architecture and these broader ethical points, which is why I brought it up here. And I, I think, I think the core verticals of selling, killing, spying, and crooked gambling some of them lend themselves very well, especially the selling and gambling part to reinforcement learning approaches, right? I mean, I mean, the fact that we're now looking at expected reward maximization as the core paradigm for AI has a lot to do with Wall Street trading and has a lot to do with online marketing for which you have a clear, crisp measure of online reward that, that you reward that you're trying to you're trying to maximize, right? So there's 
I think these business interests that are hiring almost all AI, AI PhDs now and are driving funding in, into the field and are driving the construction of which toolkits are easy to use, which then drives what most people will bother to do. These are driven by selling and gambling and then the military and, and spying stuff. And that I think leads you to, A, it, it leads you to reinforcement learning approach because we're dealing with things where you just have really, really clear metrics that you want to optimize. Like how many people click on your website or how much money do you make? We're also being driven by these business interests and the AI paradigms that are relying on humongous amounts of data because these large tech companies have a differential advantage in pursuing AI approaches that leverage humongous amounts of data. If you have something that doesn't need a lot of data, all of a sudden Google and Facebook's advantage goes away. They have a big advantage to anything that, that needs a huge amount of data. So the fact that we're looking at AI approaches that need huge amounts of data and are focused on expected reward maximization is not a coincidence. Like the, these apparently technical foci are directly tied to the business interests of Wall Street and, and the advertising industry, right? And if you if if you're looking at if you're looking at trying to get decentralized democratic AI with diverse broad-based contributions and beneficial applications, I mean that that leads you to wanting AI that's reflective and has self-understanding. It also leads you to wanting AI that doesn't need humongous amounts of data to do anything and that that can run well on a broadly decentralized compute infrastructure rather than needing you know billion dollar server farms so I, I think that if you follow this through the hyperon type of architecture actually fits better with what's the ethically correct path forward because it's oriented toward reflection and self-understanding and by being focused on generalization from the outset, it's oriented toward not needing insanely large amounts of data to, to, to do anything. So that this approach to AGI I've been describing will be a much harder one for large selling, killing, spying and gambling organizations to monopolize, right? Which I think intentionally or unintentionally is part of the reason why with this sort of approach to AGI is not as well resourced, right? I mean, the, I, I don't think CEOs sat down and said, well, the types of AI that will help us make more money and get more hegemony are these AI algorithms. So let's make sure the AI field only pursues these types of AI. But I think that that is what is happening in, in, indirectly in the, in the AI world right now. And fortunately though, we're able to accumulate an awesome group of developers around this alternative approach to, to AGI. And we're, we're making in interesting headway now. And I think our progress on this has accelerated a bunch in the last six months or so. And I, th I think it's gonna accel accelerate to more and more uh, to the singularity and beyond. <laughs> Clearly, my, my attempt to boil down that talking to 45 minutes failed, but, that, but I, I did get it below six hours by cutting out a lot of content, right? So that, that was, that was some, somewhat, of, somewhat of an achievement. Folks here in Palo Alto are going to want to go eat dinner soon, but I, I think I should, I, should, I should take a few questions before doing that. I have many questions. <laughs> All right, I have many answers. Uh, they don't correspond to your questions, but that's, uh, that's, uh, are, are you do you have your microphone on that's my first question oh, sorry. I, 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 haven't, I don't connect to it. Let, well, maybe you should sit next to someone who has a microphone on because there's a lot there yeah, just just, just come over next to me then yeah because there, there's a lot more people paying attention to this online than in this room that's all okay. Okay, now talk, talk, okay. Talk, loud, talk loud so they can all hear Okay, you. so the first question, um, um, when you mentioned pattern is the, uh, pattern is the first uh, subject of, of general intelligence and, and that leads to simplification uh, or factorization. Well, how does simplification come from? I mean, it has to come from something the same, right? 
you need, well, yeah, this is sort of asking, I mean, saying that pattern is the crux of intelligence is really just a reformulation of Occam's razor, right? Because if, if a pattern in something is a representation of that thing as, as something simpler, right? Mm. Then that's a lot well, like- how, how do you know that representation is the same? Oh, well, yeah. So, yes. I mean, so, so it's, that it's is, true. It's true. Is a pattern. It, it, no, no, no. So, and if yeah. you, so one, one section of this talk mm. that I left out of this short version, but is in the, in the six because, hour version three, is, also you talk about that yeah, it's, it's about trying, that. we, okay. I start with the basic notion of distinction mm. from, and build up the notion of a mm. distinction graph mm. and then try to build up the notion of, of pattern from, from, mm. from there. So you can, yeah. So the, the problem with saying pattern is fundamental and a pattern is a representation as something simpler. Mm. I mean, then you need to say, what is a representation yes. and, 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 what is the same? and what is, S what is simpler, right? And yeah, yeah that yeah. and you can you can go through and build up a theory of that, starting from the basic notion of of difference, right? Yeah. Okay, so I, the I, the I, basic I, basic and this, if you look in Weaver's Weaver's thesis on open-ended intelligence, mm -hmm. he goes back to Gilles Deleuze, difference and repetition, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in continental philosophy, that book, Difference and Repetition, mm -hmm. tries to build up all of the universe from the notion of one thing being different than another, or one thing be a being a repeated version of another, right? Uh, I, and so I, you can start from those primitives and, and build up build up a whole theory, but it's a... Uh, well, I wanna, I wanna try a, a much simpler answer, right? Different animal, well, different human beings have different representations of the reality around them, but likewise different animals. But when an animal spots a dangerous situation, mm -hmm. Most animals agree on what that is, even mm -hmm. though their internal representations are different. Mm -hmm. And the reason some animals may get in trouble and sense danger and others mm -hmm. might not sense danger is because their representations differ. Right, but N so, Nietzsche, Nietzsche had a saying that to the coarser mind, more things will appear equal, right? I guess, so, and so, that's true. I, I mean, cla yeah, cla classifying things, classifying one thing as the representation of another I mean that still is a judgment, right? So we're like we're 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 saying say this image compression program generates this image, but is shorter. But then the image we looked at yesterday, we're judging that it's the same as the image that came out of the of the compression algorithm when when, when we ran it, right? And someone else might have more accurate eyes than us and say, well, no, those images are not are not exactly the same, and we might say they are exactly well, sure, the same. But, but, so, but yeah. that's the point: is different representations operationally. I mean, if you're trying to detect danger, most I mean, most algorithms are going to be equally good at doing that. Oh. I mean, you're, but you're you're right that there is there is an assumption of a primitive phenomenological operation of this thing is the same as that yes. thing, right? And you you need that, you have that primitive assumption. We can say it's a pattern, but I, I think it, there's a language issue. I mean, how, how, how do we describe that? So I will use the same expression as Weibo, uh, David Weibo, I, I mean, repetitions. I mean, yeah, I mean, repetitions. A, a pa pattern is not an objective thing, right? A pattern is relative to, to an observing mind and uh, yeah. each observing mind will assess simplicity mm -hmm. and will assess sameness uh, yes. in its own way sameness and, in, repetition, and in that so. right 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 and in that way that observing mind and we will cannot build its... prove repetition so no, I you think can't repetition it. is the the unit i mean repetition difference and repetition are both needed uh, yes, right? yes and this and goes repetition. back to deleuze's book difference and, and repetition some yeah. more basic topology. I mean, yeah. for pattern, we can uh, describe it into. Uh, you can boil it down into yeah, difference, can, in, yeah, into, yeah. Different, for, for, into difference and repetition. But for yeah. repetition, we cannot. If we want to explain it, only topology. So that's why I well, say repetition. If you read Deleuze's <laughs> book, he tries to boil down repetition. Oh, yeah. Re Repet. Uh, Gilles Deleuze attempts to boil down the notion of repetition into more primitive phenomenological operations, actually. Oh. What does it mean to say one thing is the same as another? Is a, You could go in that philosophical direction and try to try to decompose that. Uh, so who, who is the... Oh, it's a philosopher. I can, I can, we can send oh, you a link okay, on that. Okay, thank you very much. D difference, 
I, I, I don't know how to decompose difference into something simpler than difference. So that 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 that, 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 that might be the bottom, right? So. Maybe it's not a repetition, so, but uh, uh, identification. How about the time? I'm sorry. We can have another question. That's all right. I mean, if you have different and not, then you have same. So I guess I guess you just yeah, say I mean, there, difference and negation are primary. Of, I guess. Of, of, there's, there are yeah, yeah. Of course, they are practical ways. Similar. There are practical ways. I was talking about yeah. mutual yeah. information. That yeah. was done when things are similar. But I mean, boiling your yeah. concepts down to a set of semantic primitives is interesting, but it is sort of a philosophy undertaking. Right? Uh, yeah, it's, it's about yeah. philosophy. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yes. Metaphysics. Um, yeah, metaphysics. Uh, but no, by my information, or, I can compute that, right? I can, um, given a signal, I can but, tell you but what it if, is. if it's a, uh, it's about repetition, then yeah. it's about how to detect a repetition. So just as long as something can repeat, then we recognize a pattern, no matter what it is. So that's the what it leads to if we think of repetition and different. And if something is different, uh, as long as uh, as something it done it uh, it give different uh, response so that's another you want pattern as a big unit. If there's no repetition, there's no pattern. If yes. there's no pattern, you just have this uniform. Uh, I mean, so that means we don't. It doesn't have to be gray. It can be so pure down. undifferentiated cosmic bliss. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> why, why, why are you so depressive? <laughs> <laughs> Also, um, sort of cobalt of complexity is not like you abuse of mutual information, but like, yeah, isn't, but like you can the, the, the right way to speak the, about the, this. The, but like, yeah, yeah, the, this yeah. relates more closely to Kamagra of complexity than, than, to, than to mutual inf information. Oh. Or, or yeah. I, was, I was trotting that out as this is you know mutual, and there are theorems it's, it's connecting nice Shannon and Kamagra of information, this, yeah. which are much nastier than I thought they were when I looked in the details. Of, there's a lot of bad assumptions underlying it sometimes. But that, that, that all exists. Yeah. I, I just started that out as it's a yeah. practical thing that you can use and write algorithms. Right, right. But Kamagra complexity time depends time. on what's the reference Turing machine. And I mean, then, so yeah. it's still subjective. But, I mean, but you know that it doesn't matter if you can show it. doesn't matter in the limit. It's a constant. But we don't live in the limit. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you live uh, in the limit. I have a yeah. question, but I don't know the time, and maybe other people want to ask questions. So, yeah, if someone else has a question, do that and come back to you. Right? Did you want to go first? I have a little bit. There are more people online, so if you have them, I can answer that. Is someone asking a question online? Word maximization is dangerous. That's not a question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no online questions, so we can uh, we can have a face to face question. Uh, what is this being recorded? Because I'm going to have to listen yep. to that. Like, yep. Uh, so I was just playing with it, not pulling it up for you. Yeah. Um, two, it was about AIXI and the problems with rewards. So I was under the impression that from like the definition of reward from the von Neumann Morgenstein Morgenstern utility theorem, that like we we think of scalar rewards or vector rewards or other things, but reward a reward function could be like a million if statements and then you know return something. Uh, anyway. I guess I was asking why why is AIXI problematic? And I think I disagree with you about the statement that uh, reinforcement learning might not work, but only theoretically. I I really like to. Well, th th there's a lot of questions packed packed in Sorry. there. So, there, so the, <laughs> I mean a a AI talk. <laughs> so a AIXI is problematic first of all because it requires an infinitely powerful computer to right. run. So that that's that's one problem, but. The, the problem I was referring to is from a paper by Lakey and Hutter, which was 2016 or something? 2015. 2015, where basically they showed that there's no known optimality criterion for, for AI XI. So in, in earlier work, they had shown that AI XI was Pareto optimal in, in, in a sense. But now they showed that basically every algorithm is Pareto optimal in, in, in the same sense. So that there's nice optimality theorems for Salamanoff induction, but Salamanoff in, induction is a, is a predictor. It's not a reward maximizer. And when you try to port those theorems to, to AIXI as a reward maximizer, the optimality theorem goes away. So we don't know a strong sense anymore in which AIXI 
is actually the best way to the best way to do things. So that that that's that that's that's one issue with it. So then then it takes insanely amount of process, insanely large amount of processing power, and we have a theoretical reason at the moment to believe it's theoretically the best way to do things. So then why do we give a shit, right? So that 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 that, that would be the issue. Now the the other question about reinforcement learning. I mean, again, this sort of comes down to, there's two issues really. One is, is reward maximization the right way to think about general intelligence at all? So if you assume that it is, then, then the question is, are you defining reinforcement learning as any algorithm that does reward maximization? I mean, if you are, then of course, reinforcement learning is a way to do is the way to do reward maximization. If if you're not, then it's not clear that the collection of algorithms currently pursued in the reinforcement learning field is actually the best way to do expected reward maximization for the reward functions of, in, of interest. I mean, it might, it might be that logical reasoning is helpful. It might be that evolutionary learning is helpful. And those things are not what are commonly thought of as, as, as reinforcement learning. So that's, but again, you could ask, will the best way to do expected reward maximization, will that be some eventual evolution of the things being done in, in the reinforcement learning literature? Then maybe. So in, yeah, in, in Sutton's recent paper, reward is enough. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, he's not really arguing that current reinforcement learning algorithms in their precise form are enough to get the AGI. What he's arguing is that some as yet unspecified evolution of the reinforcement learning field will be enough to solve maximization of expected reward for reward functions that we care about. And that, I don't agree with that, but it's hard to argue about because we don't have those hypothetical radical improvements of, of policy search and so forth. Right? Yeah. Thank you very much. Are you arguing the most problems you care about can be formulated as expected reward optimization? Yeah, yeah, well, that, that's that's a different question. Like, can can the problems we care about be formally as expected reward optimization? Like, I think creating a beneficial singularity, I don't know how to formulate that as re as expected reward optimization. Expected right. reward for all what's the reward what's the reward i actually have yes. a <laughs> i actually have a paper i'm not going to review which yeah. responds to this silver is reward and not paper well if you go back to if you go back to open-ended intelligence and you look at individuation or self-transcendence right i mean individuation like survival can palpably be formulated as expe expected reward the notion of self-transcending and like fundamentally going beyond yourself in, in, in some way that let, yet feels like it keeps the spirit of what you are but is going beyond yourself in some radical way like formulating that as expected reward seems really bending over backwards and i don't know how to do it well, huh? like transforming into a new form where i have new dimensions of bliss that i can experience so you mean the transformation being the the motivation? Is that what you're, how you're saying it? Like the, that your reward function is aimed strictly at your self transcendence over individuation. But then you have to define that before it. I mean, so 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 I feel it's not the topology. I mean, maybe what? my reward and my current state is sort of upper bounded, and I'm going to transcend into a form where like is an even higher bound than the possible reward. So not like if if, if you really? say that collecting experiences is is your reward, which many people would. Totally. But the, the, the I think that, that the, of your if I suddenly have five hands. And, and the and the, 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 pro the problem you find with formalizing these human motivations is people then find ways to to hack the formalization, right? Like so, collecting experiences is your goal. Okay, fine. Welcome to Christian hell for all eternity. Right? <laughs> so I mean, there, there's a lot of yeah. So that I mean, but then if you give a qualitative description of the reward then then that's not going to drive reinforcement learning algorithms right i mean you got to you got to boil it down to a to a four i mean you could say loading point function i mean in, in 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 principle if we believe current physics is accurate each of our brains like boils down to some quantum equations right so then then 
I mean, the what I will qualitatively consider as acceptable self-transcendence should bow down to some humongous set of equations about possible neurodynamics in, in, in my head, right? But in in practice, like we're not we're not going to do that, right? So that's a, we have an, we have another question from the internet here, which is much easier. Well, the next version would next version of GPT three achieve AGI? No. So, all right, all right. Yeah, we're, we're 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 done with that. I mean, I think and if if you if you look at Gary Marcus's articles on the GPT three articles, I think he goes through in a pretty systematic way what why uh why that whole paradigm which actually doesn't understand anything in any meaningful sense is is not, is not going to lead to to AGI i mean they're quite they're quite interesting and we're using them in some commercial commercial applications but i think the the representations that these transformers are building internally do not really lend themselves to generalization like significantly beyond their training data. What they're doing is they're using so much of human knowledge and culture as training data that the lack of generalization doesn't stop them from doing cool things. I mean, just like face recognition, right? Like you, there's so many faces on Facebook or, or, or uh, WeChat and whatnot that you don't care about ger radical generalization. You just train a model that works for all 7 billion of those faces. and. I mean that the training data over represents the variety of faces, and I, I think the GPG three models, the GPT models, are getting to that point, right? They're they're trained on so much human text that over represents like commonly discussed things among humanity that it doesn't matter; they can't generalize. But from the standpoint of answering common sense stuff, but if they need to leap way beyond what their training data was, they totally can't do it. Like their internal knowledge representation. It's so much like a well-organized catalog of everything they've seen, but I, but I'm I'm a big fan of the naming naming conventions. So I'm, I'm you know I have a three-year-old kid who's obsessed with the with the transformers, and now we have we have Elon Musk has a fake robot named Optimus, and then Mi Microsoft has a huge neural model named Megatron, which is is an evil guy. I'm not sure why they named it Meg Megatron. They, if they knew the Transformers better, they would have named it Megatronis, which was the good version of Megatron. Right? You know, the but, uh, but I'm 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 thinking of how to how to persist the Transformer theme and the open cog naming, yeah, but the, we'll see what comes. Ah, it's so Megatron is enlightened. Oh, no, the Chinese version. Wu Dao. Wu Dao. Yeah. Means Chinese version of what of the language model? Yes, no, that's the transformer. Oh, oh, of all transformers. Oh, oh cool. All right. So yeah, maybe the Ch maybe the Chinese language version of Megatron will be enlightened. I mean, we've solved AI ethics. Yeah. yeah. Here's the funny thing about GPT-3 is that the more successful it is, the more of the internet will be filled with GPT-3 generated spam, and then the next version of GPT-3 will be trained on that. So it'll train on itself and defeat itself. Well, so Adam has hypothesized just because language models don't think doesn't mean you can't make AGI with it. Well, think is not well defined, right? But I, I guess my view would be the way knowledge is represented inside these language models is not suitable to directly drive generalization. I mean, I think the models, uh, the knowledge is represented at two fine grained of a of, of, of a level, right? And so I, I I think that that's why the various reasoning tasks that Gary Marcus tries to pose to the GPG three algorithms that that's that's why it can't carry them out, right? So I, I mean it's yeah it's representing things in a super fine grained way. And we, we see the same thing. We've trained a bunch of transformer networks for music prediction, just because a bunch of us are, are, are musicians in, in our spare time. And I mean, you, you can get transformers and other sorts of similar neural nets to like spit out amazing sounding gu guitar solos and so forth. But I mean, you're, there's no way one of these is going to invent a new genre of music. Like, like uh, it's, it's not going to invent 
heavy metal or jazz for the first time or something because it, it's just it's just clear they're recombining and regurgitating variations on on on, on, what, on what what you fed them right and I think uh, yeah, yeah, Yos it's, Yosef it's, yeah, saw yeah. something similar yeah, well, in the application of these algorithms is, in, in automated theorem it, it is right? more like algorithmic learning so the so we recently trained it on OEI if you come closer here the people online can hear you here yeah, I'm just saying that it, it has very little algorithmic learning uh, capability like for example if you train it on the online encyclopedia of integer sequences uh, which, which, which is all sorts of weird, weird mathematical <laughs> algorithms to it. Like it, it basically fails totally miserably. Like it cannot do basically anything. So, so, so it's it's suited for something like for 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 example learning language, right? Or translation. It's 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 very good for 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 some for some reasons, right? But it's it's not good for learning the GCD algorithm or for for like learning what are Fibonacci numbers. Or, yeah, it's simple. Which are relatively simple things, oh, yeah, one, yeah. One, one, one would think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I asked Joseph to say something because he, he's been involved with using in practice a bunch of advanced neural net models to guide automated theorem proving. And, and there are some ways in which it, in which it is useful, but it, it also, also makes clear the lack of semantic knowledge there causes these networks to be useless outside the domain on, on on which on which they are on which they are trained. Ooh, ooh, I can answer the next question. How many humans have invented a new genre? Mm -hmm. uh, how, how many humans have passed the Turing test? Yeah. <laughs> well. Yeah, I mean, we we are we are with systems like GPT three or much simpler kinds of AI systems. I mean, we're creating types of cognitive systems that are quite different than than anything that evolved and i mean you could also ask how many humans have played a grandmaster level of chess and very few have but that doesn't mean that doesn't mean deep blue is a general intelligence just just because most humans couldn't couldn't do it right i mean i think that the ability to generalize is fundamental right and and I mean that 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 if we go back to open-ended intelligence and individuation and self-transcendence, I mean, if you can't generalize, you can't individuate when the environment changes a lot, and you can't self-transcend either because you'll be stuck with the previous version of 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 yourself, right? So, I mean, I mean, you know, about the question, how many humans have invented a new genre? Ten years ago, I would have said the answer is very small, and then I had young kids. And after having young kids, I think the answer is actually very high. Just most of those genres are not marketable. I think uh, on that on that on that note, I will call this uh, overtime workshop to an end. But th thanks to everyone who is uh, who is stayed around till the end we, we, we got into some uh, amusing amusing discussions I think and uh, I mean there's endless number of deep points that have been raised throughout the day that have, have just barely been barely been touched on so I hope uh, yeah if folks dig into reading relative to the various things that have uh, have been talked about in in the workshop I mean there's a uh, an open cog email list which is not that heavily trafficked but if people have interesting questions and and pose them there i mean we those of us involved will will, will read and and uh, answer them so signing off uh, th thanks everyone <laughs>